And after all that, I was on mute. Well, good morning, and welcome to the March 21st, 2021 Community and Public Services Committee meeting. Um, I will now call the meeting to order and begin with roll call. So, Councillor Zadek. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Knack. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Nickel. Good morning. Good morning. And I am here as well. But I also see that we've got uh, some other councillors here. I see uh, Councillor Henderson. Good morning. Morning. And I see Councillor Esslinger. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, Councillor Banga. Good morning. Good morning. And Councillor Cartmel, friend to the committee. Good morning. This always has a romper room feel to it when we start these meetings. I should hold a little, a little near. Anyway, good, good morning. I hope it brings everyone some more. Good Tim, morning. that's polka dot door. Just for the record, it's not <laughs> rock. Songs and stories and so much more. Okay, so uh, may I get a motion to move the adoption of the agenda? So moved. Thank you. Um, if you got your machines fired up, uh, I don't know if the... Just to clarify, Mr. Chair, are we moving it with the addition of 7-1? Ah, yes, with the addition of 7-1. So moved, um, and please vote. And I think it was Councillor Nickel who moved that. And we're missing your vote, Mr. Chair. There we go. We got it. And we have and all the votes. Please display the vote. And that is carried unanimously. Okay. Uh, can we get approval of the, or, yeah, approval of the minutes? Uh, does anyone want to move the minutes from February sure. 25th to March 3rd? Sure, yes, I'll move the approval of the minutes from the February 25th, 2021 Community and Public Services Committee and the March 3rd, 2021 Community and Public Services Committee meeting. Okay. If there are no objections to those minutes, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the vote, please. And that is carried. Okay, so no protocol items, but I will respectfully acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory, traditional lands of uh, First Nations and Métis people. As treaty people, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, we share the responsibility for stewardship of this beautiful land and for each other. So let's uh, move on now for, to, um, Selection of items for debate. It is now open. Feel free to jump in. Okay, I'll uh, take uh, six one, six two, six three. Uh, I do not have the speakers list in front of me, so if somebody does, uh, maybe I, I see. Uh, uh, Phil's on there. Is Phil Strong on the speakers list there? Yeah, I've got it. Then I'll uh, select 6-8 uh, and that's what I'll select uh, for now. And if someone else has a speaker list in front of them, they can uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'll, happy, I'll be happy to read that in. Um, but first, uh, any other takers for items? Uh, yes, sorry, I can't click in. So um, uh, I do have a quick question on item 5.3. And uh, I don't think I heard Councillor Nickel. Did you say 6.5? Did I miss that one? Because we have speakers on You can on take that. that one, yeah. You can take that one, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I'll take that one then. And I think I did also see Laura from EFCL registered for 6.7. So we'll have that one too. Okay, and uh, no one else is going to grab it. Uh, I'll grab seven one and nine one. 
Uh, actually, do we need to grab nine one? Or uh, is that... I actually did. I did have a question. Sorry, I have a quick question on nine one. Anyways, okay. all right. And uh, I think there we go. Anyone wanted uh, six four? Just checking before we skip out of there. No. Okay. If not, if not, I'll move all other items. Okay. And uh, after that, then I'll uh, I'll read out the you know we'll we'll get the request to speak right in. Don't worry about that. Okay, so please vote on item selected for debate. We have all the votes. Okay, please display the vote. Okay, and that is unanimous. Mr. And, Chair, would you uh, like me to read out what has been passed? Yes, please. Thank you. This morning, committee has passed the following items without debate. Item 5.1, Edmonton Public School Board Pool Operating Cost Sharing, revised due date, April 14, 2021. 5.2, Weed Control Program, reduction in funding, revised due date, May 28, 2021. And the recommendations in the following reports have passed. Item 6.4, Peace Officer, Peace Officer Statistics 2020 Year-End Report. And 6.6, .6, Castle Downs Family YMCA Funding Agreement. Okay, thank you very much. And that, that covers, obviously, items that were not selected for debate as well. So uh, now to request to speak. Um, I'll just read it in since I've got it in front of me. Um, the recommendation is that Community and Public Services uh, Committee hear from the following speakers and panels when appropriate on 6-5 uh, bylaw 19580, amendments to the Fire Rescue Services Bylaw 15309, Narash Bardwaj uh, from uh, Bardia Cultural Society of Alberta. Now, this is just an addition to, uh, to names that were uh, previously approved. Um, and then on 6-7, Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues request to reallocate uh, council approved funds. We've got uh, Laura Cunningham uh, Chappelle from the Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues. On 6-8, vehicle for higher annual report 2021 update. We've got one, Olivia Burdick, two, Susan Burdick or Suzanne, please correct me when you have an opportunity. Uh, three, John Waterman. Four, Phil Strong from the Greater Edmonton Taxi Service. And five, Sylvain Bezina. And then, uh, that is it. That is it for the request to speak. So, um, I will move that. Please vote to hear from these speakers. Councillor Zadek? Yes. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has passed unanimously. So moving on to uh, time specific, um, there's been a recommendation that we hear on item six, seven first. Uh, there's been a request for that time specific should be pretty quick. Um, and then moving on to 6.5, uh, immediately thereafter, so that uh, those folks who've been waiting for a few meetings now to speak will get their opportunity. Um, and then of course, 7.1 time specific for 1.30 p.m. So. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I'll move we bring 6.7 forward. All right. Thank you very much. Any debate or other additions? No? Okay, please Sorry. vote. Mr. Chair, just to confirm, are we just um, voting to make 6-7 first item of business or would we also like to do 6-5 as second? Then I'll move 6-7 okay. and be first item 6-5 to be uh, second. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Nickel. We're doing it by the book. All right, please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. Yeah, 
and that is carried. Uh, any counselor in inquiries? I didn't uh, receive any notice of any, so not that I'm aware of. We've already done reports, dealt with in a different meeting, and request to reschedule reports. So we will now, um, if there's no further questions, move ahead to item 6.7. And uh, I'm not sure if there is a presentation, but there is the request to speak, so we will hear from our speaker. Mr. Chair, we do have a no few questions. introductory comments. Yeah, that would be great. Oh, just here we go. Yes, just so just to briefly introduce this item, I am here with Mr. Mr. Aiken. So just by way of background, in 2012, Council did approve $78,000 for the EFCL to conduct a pilot outdoor roof rink project to extend the outdoor uh, rink season for one of its member leagues. Several attempts were made, but the cost and effort of the pilot were significantly more than initial estimates, and the project was deemed not viable. So today, uh, EFCL is seeking City Council's permission to reallocate that $78,000 to two projects, both of which we in the administration do support. The first, first project is to hire a third party to undertake a desktop review of community league assets, reports, and enter the information into a database that will help the EFCL, will help the city, and will help leagues track the condition of their physical assets. Information from the database will then help to inform decisions on the need for repairs, refurbishment, and associated funding. And then the second, uh, the second is to pilot a grant subscription service that will provide EFCL again and community leagues with information on a greater variety of funding opportunities. The ability to explore these opportunities, uh, as everyone knows, is even more important now as leagues seek ways to make up for revenue losses over the past year when they have been unable to rent, their, rent out their facilities due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So with that, we'll conclude, and committee can hear from, from uh, the speaker. Thank you. Uh, please go ahead. The floor is yours. You have five minutes. Sure. Okay. You know how it goes. I know how it goes. Good morning. Thank you so much for allowing me to present this morning at uh, this time. So as... as um, uh, Mr. Smythe just explained the background to the project that 78,000 for the rink roof project was provided for the EFCL um, back in 2012. And, and over the course of since the summer, when the city came to the EFCL to really ask for how this funding was going to be used, um, it's given the EFCL an opportunity to consider you know, how best to use these funds given those COVID-19 realities, as well as how to do this in a way that ensures opportunity for all leagues to benefit from this funding. So the EFCL Board of Directors identified two significant areas of need, one being a way to understand the current state of the assets and amenities that leagues have across the city, as well as providing an opportunity for leagues to explore other funding opportunities uh, through the grant advance database. So the EFCL brought these two motions uh, as notice of motion at our fall general meeting in October to the community league members. There was good discussion on both of these potential motions and the EFCL board decided to continue to go forward with the motions at the winter general meeting on February 16th, where both motions were passed. So shortly after we had that October meeting, uh, the CLIP fund was reduced uh, from the City of Edmonton by 500000 And currently, right now, we are working alongside our counterparts in Calgary with the Federation of Calgary Communities as we advocate to the Minister of Culture, Multiculturalism and Status of Women as they are proposing an additional 25% cut to our Community Facility Enhancement Program Fund. Now, many of you are well aware that that CFEP fund is essential for league infrastructure and amenities builds um, and they leverage that fund with the CLIP funding in order to do those necessary repairs. So we've seen cuts or we're seeing cuts on several levels of government to the support of local community infrastructure and there has been no more of an important time now than for us to have an accurate understanding of the state of league amenities. So through this desktop review, we'll use the Stantec reports that were done back in 2010, um, and we'll compare them with the Community League Infrastructure Program upgrades that have been done over these past 11 years. 
Um, those Stantec reports were such a significant investment from the city of Edmonton, and we're so grateful for that baseline of data that we have. But 11 years later, we, you know, unfortunately, there has been no tracking to really understand the current state. And so this is why we find ourselves really needing to use this funding for this purpose. We've spoken with a few people in the industry who feel quite confident that with the data that currently exists, as well as with on-site visits over the summer, that we'll be able to have an accurate picture of the current situation uh, with this funding. So again, that's that 58000 of the um, total amount. The system that we're going to use to capture the information will be accessible to leagues and the city. And we want to support leagues through their board turnovers to have the ability to track and understand the work that has been done on their assets. The city is also interested in this information and we hope to continue our work together to ensure that the grants available are used to the fullest extent to ensure that they are safe, accessible spaces in community for public benefit. With a new tripartite agreement that's just in its final stages and following a year of really significant financial hardship for leagues, it's prudent that we have this accurate assessment of the condition of league facilities. Uh, the, the second piece that we wanted to um, use the funding for, as discussed, was the grant advance database. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, again, with the significant reductions in revenue for leagues through 2020 due to COVID, as well as from feedback that we received back in the winter of 2020, actually before COVID hit, um, you know, leagues are looking for greater opportunities and new ways to really um, access grants, access funding in more new and creative ways. And so this 23000 would be used as a... Um, mandatory sign up for leagues. It would cost each league $120 per year and the EFCL would work alongside them with the Grant Advance uh, database system uh, through providing workshops, providing tips, uh, providing uh, face, well, face-to-face -face, uh, support as needed for leagues as they look at sort of what their needs are for funding and figuring out what access they can have. So this database system is a Canadian database. It has a uh, good reputation from the organizations that we spoke with that have worked with this database, really around how easy it is to put together grants. The, the software is really uh, user-friendly. There are a lot of foundations out there that do provide funding, which is a bit of a challenge for our leagues as they are nonprofits, not uh, registered charities. But we do see this as a really great opportunity to start really connecting leagues with other uh, nonprofits or registered charities in their community to potentially uh, work together to apply for different grants, potential different funding opportunities. So we're really excited about this opportunity for both the infrastructure um, system and review that we'll be able to do, as well as uh, going forward with a database where we'll be able to really explore with leagues other opportunities for funding um, so that we can have more diverse sources of revenue going forward. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, this was request, uh, requested by Councillor Knack. So, Councillor Knack, do you have any questions? No questions. Thank you. Thanks for coming. So, we will now move to Councillor Nickel. Yeah, Laura, we've talked about inventory for a long time now over the last seven years. Uh, my only question to you is, um, are you sure $55,000 is, is enough? How many buildings does that get you? And what kind of inspections are you going to get against those Stantec baselines of 2010? Because, okay, like how many buildings are we talking about? Well, so we, we would be looking at not only the halls, but also the skate shacks and any any building that sits on licensed land at this point. So this, this to your point, Councillor Nichol, this won't be anything as in-depth as the Stantec reviews. Those were a significant investment. This is really an opportunity to get a, a second look 10 years later and to see what's been done. It's a cursory review. So it's not enough to give me an inventory report of the state of your boilers, your HVAC, and so on, like you did in 2010. That's right. It, it won't be that to that level of detail, no. But what we're hoping is that we'll be able to ensure that we could say this league at least updated their HVAC in 2013, and so that was done. So we can look at that Stantec report, we can check off that list, what was completed, and so that we know at least the states. So we can know a bigger picture across the, the league movement. Okay, there's this many roofs that look like they need repairs in the next 10 years. We can imagine that this might cost us this much money. So how do we then come 
come back to the city, to the province? How do we find new, different ways to advocate for more specific things that we're needing for our infrastructure? Okay, I, d I have no problem with 55,000 and that sort of thing. I just, just wondering if you're going to get really good value given the, the number of buildings you have to assess. That's my only concern I have, but um, okay, thank you. If thank you, Councilor Nichol. Uh, that was actually my question as well, so thank you. Um, all right, well, it looks like we have no more questions for our speaker. Um, I'll move the uh, recommendation then. All right. Um, just, I'll just make sure there's no questions for administration on this. Oh yeah, that's right. Sorry. Sorry, Aaron. Oh yeah, no, that's totally fine. Uh, Councillor Nack? Actually just one, and this, and this might sound odd, but I, I just want to double check. Um, you know, when you look at our overall budget, this is a very, very tiny amount. And so I'm actually wondering, wondering from a governance perspective, why this needed to come to council anyways. I it just, we have uh, EFCL is asking to reallocate this money it's not new money it just, it just feels like a bit of a not not the greatest use of all of our times so is there something that we should be flagging for the future that if organizations want to reallocate money that's already been authorized that you don't have to write a report which is not a great use of their time laura doesn't have to take half an hour off her time and we don't have to spend time on that so just wondering from a governance perspective if there's a better way to deal with things like this in the future Councillor, we can certainly take that back internally and, and talk to clerks and talk to to answer that question. We had the same question, in fact. But okay. when council made the motion to approve that funding, it was very much specifically for the outdoor rink roof. And okay. my understanding is that they don't have the authority then to reallocate it as uh, as you suggest, because it was very specific for that one thing. Okay. But no, that's fine. Something for us to flag in the future so we can all save ourselves a few steps, uh, it feels like, when we're looking to reallocate. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And if there is nothing else, I believe Councillor Nicole uh, moved to receive this information. So please vote. I'm sorry, just to clarify, Mr. Chair, it's uh, it's not for information. It is a request for decision. Right. Okay. So it is a decision point. Okay. I see it up here now. Yep. Okay. So. Please vote on the request to reallocate council proof funds for the Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues. We have all the votes. I vote yes. Just joined the meeting a few minutes ago, but it's not coming up in East Grant for some reason. We'll just need to add you to the meeting. Mr. Mayor, we'll record your vote. Awesome. Thank you. My apologies, the vote on that was unanimous. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so that was item uh, 6.7. Now, I thought I'd uh, gotten this uh, through clean, but uh, there was a request for questions on 5.3 from Councillor Knack um, that we skipped, and I'm just wondering if there, Councillor Knack, did you still want to ask questions on that? I do. Uh, we still selected it, so I, I have just a few quick questions. To yeah, okay. Go ahead and then we'll just jump into our next item. Sure. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to um, ask, I know uh, part of why this is getting, uh, has to be, we need a little more time. Uh, the first sort of meeting with sort of, the, I think a number of the festival organizers and event organizers um, was a couple of weeks ago, if I understand correctly. Is, is that correct? Uh, yeah, the meetings were a little while ago, but also further to that counselor, uh, we just got the survey results back uh, this week. Um, when we got some input from from the festivals and we're just in the process now analyzing those results and writing the report great uh the the follow-up question i have is that um just recognizing that and we still have uncertainty whether anything will be able to happen this year or, or what scale so it, it's maybe not quite as urgent to be you know any earlier than june 30th as an example um what I did want to ask quickly, though, is that I, I, I have had some information shared around. Uh, so this report was originally intended to focus on uh, potentially provincial red tape and uh, barriers, things like the Traffic Safety Act uh, that would cause increased costs and challenges for 
uh, event and festival organizers to run their 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 programs. Um, I have had some information, and I'm sure I think it was shared with with you during some of those meetings around some of the increasing costs from a city perspective too. So when this report comes back, while I think the original intent was focused more on the provincial government and changing that, will there be some reference and maybe some some context and some history around the uh, changing costs that have come from the city side over the last, you know, call it 10 or 15 years? Uh, Councilor, we can, we can take that and, and do, you know, pull together that information for our report. I think we, we do have that in our in our information base, so we can Great. we can describe that. I recognize the notion of the challenges with the provincial traffic safety act and what that might how that might impact things. But in our terms of as you say, our own costs, um, we can we can provide that information as best we can. Great. Yeah, I've just I've just heard some examples of some pretty large jumps over ten to fifteen years, and I think it might be nice information for us to have to see. Are there things we also need to do on our end, along with the uh, the changes we're looking on the provincial side? So that's great. I, I will move the revised due date. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, I think you're muted again. Thank you. Uh, okay, so you move the uh, move five three. Um, please vote. Councillor Zadek? Yes. Thank you. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. Unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Now, the long rumored, much anticipated item 6.5. Um, I believe there is a presentation available. I don't know if we need it. Uh, I'll just put it out there asking if councillors would like this presentation. Uh, yes, I would, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So um, we will hear from administration and then we will move to our speakers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we do have for our delegation this morning, uh, Chief uh, Zetelny and uh, Deputy Chief Russell Kroom, Deputy of our Public Safety Area. And I believe there's also representatives from our Legal Services Area as well. So administration is proposing two amendments to Bylaw 15309, which is the Fire Rescue Services Bylaw. First, administration has prepared a proposal for fuel storage tank registration. This will require an update to Schedule B to reflect the registration fee. And then secondly, administration is recommending the introduction of vendor permits to sell fireworks in Edmonton, which will also require an update to the Fire Rescue Services Bylaw. I'll now pass the presentation over to uh, Chief Sitelny to walk through uh, a few slides. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of Council, and our uh, guests that are, are with us today. Any business with fuel storage tanks of 25 litres or more must obtain an annual registration certificate to use a storage tank. This is required to receive or dispense fuel. This program was previously administered by the Petroleum Tank Management Association of Alberta. In August of 2020, the Government of Alberta required tank registration be managed by accredited municipalities. There is no impact to businesses as registration is vital to allow them to conduct regular business activities. With the City of Edmonton administering this program, there is a revenue potential for $145,000 a year. To review customer fireworks, er, sorry, uh, to review consumer fireworks, were regulated under the Alberta Fire Code until 2019. Each municipality is now responsible for creating their own permit conditions. All of our permit conditions have been created with stakeholders. Administration has also continuously sought feedback to continually refine the permit conditions. This includes an insight survey, a community league survey, direct follow-up with six additional community leagues and show providers. We have also recently reached out to two retailers. Overall, the majority of stakeholders are in support of the permits. In regards to vendor permits for selling or storing fireworks, it is important to note that vendor permits were mandatory under the previous Alberta Fire Code. 
Administration is recommending an update to bylaw 15309 to introduce provisions for selling fireworks. In the engagement that was done, there is an overwhelming support for this permit with fireworks show providers, manufacturers and vendors. The municipalities in Alberta that allow the sale of fireworks also require a permit. This permit will have no effect on community groups or individuals who wish to purchase fireworks. The permit will ensure vendors follow the federal regulations including providing critical safety information to the customer, advising on the proper products that can be safely discharged in the space the customer has available, and ensuring the purchaser is at least 18 years old. In 2020, administration received 77 applications for Tier 1 permits, and of those, 62 were declined. Applications were declined mainly because applicants were sold products that do not meet the federally mandated space requirements, or they did not provide a site map showing the applicant had the space requirements. And just a reminder that Tier 1 permits are displays for private audience on private residential property. There were three experienced permitted vendors selling fireworks in Edmonton. However, in the absence of a seller regulations, the number of sellers has, been, has increased. Without the bylaw, it will open the door to move more vendors without experience or safety knowledge of fireworks. Without a vendor permit, administration has no enforcement abilities if legal requirements are not followed. The City of Edmonton would be assuming significant risk including damage to property and injury or death, as there would be no monitoring or enforcement actions for vendors. As a result of recent engagement with the City of Edmonton vendor and the Canadian National Fireworks Association, Fire Rescue Services is taking the following steps to improve permit and vendor processes. Requirements to list all of the products for Tier 1 permits have been removed the notification process for surrounding buildings for Tier 2 trained shooters will be reviewed and vendor liability insurance requirements of $5 million will be reviewed. An administration is planning on a final engagement session with stakeholders as public gatherings are permitted under the public health regulations. All permit conditions will continue to be reviewed. Due to the large number of stakeholders who have been involved effective online engagement is not possible. I'd like to thank you and we'd be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, we will now move to speakers and uh, I will just mention very quickly that each speaker will have five minutes to make comments. The clerk and myself will run an official timer, however, those attendees uh, participating may wish to run their own uh, timer at home so you're not caught by surprise. Uh, when the speaker is finished, please stay uh, at your mic or on your phone so that uh, um, you can respond if committee may wish to ask you questions. Um, please refrain from using the chat function in Google Meet during the meeting. And that is it. We will now move on to our speakers. Leave. We've got someone's mic on, but we will begin with uh, John Adria. I'm John Adria of Uncle John's Fireworks, a small chain of consumer fireworks stores in Alberta. Our retail customers use consumer fireworks on private rural land. We shoot more than 70% of the professional community consumer fireworks shows in Edmonton, according to data from the City of Edmonton. These are small shows that don't go through City of Edmonton civic events. The same City of Edmonton data shows about a 40% decrease in all community consumer fireworks shows in Edmonton in the three years before COVID-19. In 2019 alone, 100% of Diwali consumer fireworks celebrations by Hindu and Sikh communities were not allowed as a result of new regulations, shows that have run safely for many years on private temple grounds. More shows were cancelled within weeks of the very consultations that were supposed to save them. When we opened in Edmonton, many retailers sold consumer fireworks, variety stores, gas stations, hobby shops, hardware stores, Canadian Tire, Shoppers, Drug Mart, dozens of retailers. By 2019, there were only three retailers left. Before 2015, community leagues spent a few hundred dollars on consumer fireworks and safely did their own fireworks shows with the support and guidance of City of Edmonton Neighbourhood Resource Coordinators. 
This increase in regulation was not driven by injuries, accidents, or even noise complaints. Like most of Canada, Edmonton has a, Edmonton has a long tradition of safely using consumer fireworks. Local retailers are a key part of that success story. Every year we tell hundreds of people they can't shoot aerial fireworks in Edmonton and they can't shoot any fireworks in city parks. And we provide safety information to all our customers. But Edmonton's new regulations will harm the same businesses that have been a key part of consumer fireworks safety in Edmonton. Administration told me just a few weeks ago that the $5 million insurance requirement is designed to keep out small retailers. They told me that in Strathcona County, the same insurance requirement was so successful that only Canadian Tire can sell consumer fireworks. But it's the impact on our customers that will close Uncle John's fireworks in Edmonton. Our customers' personal information will be collected and analyzed by the city of Edmonton and shared with other jurisdictions. Our customers will desert us, but it will get worse. The CPSC rejected the permit to purchase in November 2019, but it was still in a report to council on June 22, 2020, where councillors spoke against it again. Just a few weeks ago, administration told me that the permit to purchase was only temporarily removed from the regulations. The wording of this bylaw gives the force of law to any regulations created administration at any time in the future. We were told a year ago that this was the mechanism that was going to be used to implement the permit to purchase. It was going to be a condition of the fireworks seller's permit. This bylaw would allow the uh, administration to implement this permit to purchase at any time in the future against council's direction. In Edmonton, consumer fireworks regulations are changed by administration without warning or notice, creating havoc for communities and small businesses like ours. Bylaw 15309 has been amended without council's oversight many times so that Edmonton fees for consumer fireworks and many other community activities are by far the highest in Alberta and likely all of Canada. Again today, changes are being made to the consumer fireworks overtime charge in Schedule B that aren't flagged for your review. The report for this bylaw tells you it's required so federal regulations can be enforced. This is not true. Edmonton has enforced parts 17 and 18 of the same federal regulations for professional fireworks for decades without any bylaw. Part 16 of the of same regulation covers consumer fireworks. These two can be enforced with no bylaw. The report for this bylaw says that these regulations are aligned with federal regulations, but that's not true. Federal regulations describe a system of education of consumers by ro lo local retailers and not a system of permits or paperwork. This successful education strategy costs Canadian taxpayers almost nothing. But the local retailers, which are part of the Canadian government's successful safety strategy, are harmed by these regulations. The report says you must pass this bylaw, and I quote the report here, the city of Edmonton would be assuming significant risk, including damage to property and injury or death. Edmonton has never had a bylaw requiring permits to sell consumer fireworks. The Alberta Fire Code was amended almost two years ago. Selling a federally regulated product is not a risk to the city of Edmonton. The report says a majority of stakeholders support these regulations, but the many communities that lost their shows, consumer fireworks retailers, our thousands of customers will continue to oppose these regulations. The many communities we serve in Edmonton want us to remain in business. These bylaws harm Edmonton small businesses, just like the amendments to the Public Places Bylaw in 2019 was used to harm community firework celebrations. Please reject this bylaw amendment and instead, instead adopt our proposed regulations that are based on Edmondson's 2017 rules for consumer fireworks use. These regulations address all of the problems addressed by administration and resolve the problems for communities and small businesses caused by overregulation. This is the fourth time consumer fireworks have come before council in 16 months. Please do not direct more consultations. Please don't pass a bylaw with open-ended regulations that can be changed at any time in the future. Instead, please resolve this today. Consumer fireworks are a part of Edmonton's unique history. Today, I'm asking you to please keep that tradition alive. Please support Edmonton's consumer fireworks retailers and the communities and people we serve. All right, thank All right. you very much. We will now move on with our panel with Tyler Wilson. Hi there, can you hear me? We can hear you, go ahead. All right. uh, my name is Tyler Wilson. I'm a fireworks display supervisor. I'm certified by the federal government to use the largest, most powerful fireworks. I lead fireworks shows for companies like Uncle John's Fireworks who have asked me to speak about the fireworks today. I'm a combat veteran of the Afghan war where I was a combat engineer. I have dealt with improvised explosive devices and I'm currently a primary care paramedic. I have a lot of professional and practical experience with safety and explosives. In combat, we have found and disposed of IEDs and here in Alberta, I have shot 80 plus fireworks shows. Fireworks are regulated by the Explosive Regulatory Division, the e ERD. They also regulate the explosives for mining and military use, including those used in Afghanistan. Fireworks burn very fast or deflagrate while high explosives detonate. In the military, you use explosives to destroy an IED. This is called a BIP. 
a blow in place, a blast to create a blast. This would not work for fireworks. They need a flame to create the blast. So we're never going to have a bunch of fireworks explode, even if one goes off in the middle of a fireworks show here. Or fireworks somehow explode in storage unless it is started by a firework. Fireworks are completely different from true explosives. High hazard fireworks are the largest fireworks and can only be used by federally trained and certified techs like myself. There are about 3,000 display supervisors like myself across all of Canada. High hazard fireworks are so dangerous that a single shell could kill, maim, or damage a building. Even though I have all the qualifications, I still need to get a permit every time to use high hazard fireworks. To just store high hazard fireworks, I need a permit from the federal government. This is the opposite for consumer fireworks, which is what we're talking about today. If a consumer firework were to hit you, it would cause a bruise or injure an eye if you were not wearing your PPE. Or it could give you a burn on bare skin, but they're not powerful enough to break a car window. For consumer fireworks, the federal regulation says you have to be an adult and follow safety instructions on the firework and wear PPE. Even children can light consumer fireworks if they are supervised by an adult. Under federal regulations, no permits are required to use them, sell them, or buy them, and there's no special training. Under federal regulations, anyone is allowed to store 1,000 kilograms of consumer fireworks in a shed. You do not need a permit at all. The same regulations that make a trained tech like myself get a permit to store high hazard fireworks allows anyone to store huge amounts of consumer fireworks because they are not dangerous. The challenge is Edmonton treats consumer fireworks like high hazard fireworks that could kill you. Getting a permit to use consumer fireworks in Edmonton is as hard as getting a permit for high hazard fireworks, and this makes no sense. Consumer fireworks are designed to be used safely by anyone. Professionals like me use consumer fireworks to put on displays for communities. Most of these communities have a limited budget. The process in Edmonton to acquire permits and insurance for shows is very time consuming and expensive. These expenses to get permits put financial strains on communities to afford all the effects of their events. These expenses to get perm uh, sorry, adding fees such as overtime for fire prevention officers at their shows and increasing permit costs will extremely limit the community's ability to put on firework shows. These limitations will also cost communities the ability to really engage with the people that populate them because firework shows always draw, always draw more people to the events. More people that attend, more money that goes into the communities, and more need for volunteers for future events. As I've tried to explain, the Federal Explosive Act does not require permit to shoot consumer fireworks. All this extra paperwork we do in Edmonton for consumer fireworks shows does not make it any more or less safe. High hazard fireworks are dangerous, which is why they are restricted. Consumer fireworks are not dangerous, which is why there is no need for special training to use them. Edmonton permit fees are also too high. Most places don't charge fees for permits for fireworks shows of any kind, even for high hazard shows. But Edmonton is charging fees to small community groups that use consumer fireworks. There has been also some concern that fireworks could create some issues for veterans that may be in the communities where these shows may be in dis uh, being displayed. Though it is true that most combat vets have PTSD of one form or another, including myself. But PTSD isn't triggered solely by loud bangs. Combat vets suffer mostly from being isolated in their homes, and I know you've seen in the movies, but watching fireworks shows would not trigger most vets. And I do not know anybody who is affected by fireworks. So please do not cancel community fireworks shows for us. Instead, try to get veterans out into the communities. Please lighten up the consumer fireworks regulations in Edmonton. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move on to Perry Logan. Good morning. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the CNFA, I'm the executive director, and I want to thank the city of Edmonton for everything they've done to date to uh, get us to this point. So the CNFA looked at the amendments that the fire department is in the city's uh, presented to you, and we have four questions, concerns, just for clarity. To go to the insurance that has already been discussed, our concern is the effect on small business like John brought up. Like we have small stores in Edmonton that sell for Diwali, uh, Asia, Chinese New Year, things like that. So to put this added burden on there, is important uh, to understand why, because it's not required in any other communities that I'm aware of. And the other question, there's a line in the bylaw amendment that uh, this, or to, the term is, or to the satisfaction of the city manager on the rate. So that's a little sketchy as well. We'd like to get some clarity on what that actually addresses. Like, is he going to lower, is he going to raise it, depending on the time of day, the time of year? So that is to concern. The second point is under record keeping. Uh, the amendment that's in front of you, their request that a store keeps every document, every receipt, or keeps a copy of the receipt for every purchase of fireworks for two years. Uh, again, don't understand why. You know, you need to understand a dollar store that sells sparklers on the counter 
is included in this? And who's going to handle all this paperwork? At the federal regulation for safety requirements, which is what is the story, there is a regulation already in the ERD that it has to be 150 kg or more. We support that because, again, we do support safety. But we're on trying to understand why a store would take on this extra burden and cost to keep receipts that no one's ever going to look at. Uh, the third point is, is under storage. Uh, the way that it reads is vendors are required to ensure that storage and product displays comply with current versions of federal, provincial, and municipal regulations. We agree with up to municipal. Municipal has never been involved in any community with requirements for storage. That's covered under the federal act. And it's a thousand kg or less if you're unlicensed. If someone wants to store more, they have to be federally licensed. So again, I'm not sure what the city is requiring by that. Um, it was brought up by the fire chief about the permitting process. Uh, they had the numbers were there were 77 applicants over a six month period based on their time sample. And only 17% of those applicants were approved and 83% failed to meet the requirement. Um, we looked at as, as justifying our education program, which is part of the bylaw, which we totally support, is the 77% that failed didn't include a, or submit a permit to fail. They just did not have access to the proper information. No one took the time to fill an application to fail. So we have to take on the role of being able to supply these people with proper education and access to that education. That's where the breakdown is. And the other question on that is in this time frame, you know, you had 77 applications. It was over 2,000 purchases. So how come the other 1,930 people didn't apply? And that's the concern of the CNFA because we want this to go properly. So in closing, the CNFA is included. We have created an vendor certification and education program, an employee education program, because we believe anybody at the consumer level, selling consumer fireworks like an Uncle John's or anyone else in Canada, should have access to proper education so they can educate their users and make it a requirement. That That's our stance on all of this. It'll, education will solve it. It'll create better access and create better safety. So on that, I just, again, I want to thank you guys for everything you've done for us uh, to this point. Uh, there is a way to go. I appreciate what the fire department's trying to accomplish, but uh, I look forward to hearing questions. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, who would like to just mention what a calming painting you have behind you? All right, so you've got so, a painting. <laughs> move on to uh, Ron Schnitzler. Do we have Ron on the line today? Yes, they did check in this morning. Hello? Hello, we can yes. hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, the, a couple of things with the COVID and everything that's going on in this world. Um, things are slow in the industry right now and people are hurting. Um, going with a fireworks ban uh, or a fireworks permit system in the city of Empton for the consumer to purchase a permit or to get a permit to purchase from our retail stores uh, I don't understand the reasoning why that is needed um, and why they're even going that route. I've been selling fireworks at my retail store for over 25 years now, and I've had no incidents or anybody coming back to my store due to injuries or causes. I have done some research with some of the hospitals in the uh, Empton area, and there's no research stating that there's been... Uh, anything happening in this regards of fireworks use. Uh, in fact, there's no stats even reported or kept uh, because the injury is, uh, there's not enough. I'm not a very good speaker on this behalf compared to the other speakers, but uh, I feel a permit to purchase uh, fireworks is absolutely insane. I don't understand why we're even going down this route uh, again, I can't recall any other store or retailer in all of Canada that requires a permit to purchase fireworks uh, other than maybe a gun store or an ammunition store. Uh, the education starts here at the retail store on a one-to-one -one basis with the customer and how to shoot the fireworks how to display the fireworks and, and so forth and so on. 
uh, a one-to-one basis with the customer is more uh, important and how the fireworks shoot. Uh, going uh, with a permit system to uh, purchase the fireworks in a retail store is just going to put everybody online and they were going to be purchasing their fireworks online. And uh, this is where the accidents are going to happen because as we all know, uh, it's very easy to click that 18 and over on an online sale. And it's um, to have the fireworks delivered to your front door, just like an Amazon package. This is where the porch pirates are going to be buying or stealing these uh, packages off the porches. Again, I, I'm totally against the permit to purchase, but there should be a permit to discharge fireworks. And it should be on the Soho uh, person uh, shooting the fireworks and not on the retailer. Uh, the retailer is there to explain the safety and how to shoot these fireworks. Again, I'm not very good at speaking, but um, uh, this is all I've got to say is all I, I don't understand why we're even here. There's the window ain't even broken, and yet we're trying to fix something that's not even broken here in Alberta. Uh, I, I watch the news every single day, and I'm quite sure we all do. And I, if we all just think back to the last time we've heard anything happening with fireworks in the city of Empton, i like to know because I must be missing something. But I don't see anything wrong with the way it's going right now. And again, a permit to purchase is, doesn't fly with me. And if it, a permit to purchase fireworks, it's going to be another door closed because we will shut our doors. And again, another win for the fire department. So this is all I've got to say. Um, just uh, hoping that you guys vote the right way. Thank you. Thank you. And you did a very good job. Uh, and I'll go to Betty Schnitzler. Oh, no, I decline. Um, I, I was, uh, that, was put, that was put in by mistake. Sorry about that. No problem. Glad to have you here. Uh, you. Naresh Bardwaj. Hi there. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Well, good morning, guys. Uh, my name is Naresh Bardwaj. Uh, uh, I'm actually a former president of Council uh, Bharatiya Council Society, and we've been uh, displaying fireworks probably for the last 20 years. And I think since last year, uh, you know, over past two or three or four years, things are progressively getting worse and worse and worse trying to uh, have our cultural displays because of the restrictions being put on by the fire department. Last year was just a disaster because we were pretty well stopped. Uh, we were not you know, able to do anything at all. And we had to get our counselors involved and work with the fire department. And they had, it was just, it was, it was not called for. So I think, you know, uh, the speakers previous to me who have spoken very eloquently uh, as a business, but I'm going to speak as a cultural association who's been doing it for the last 20 years uh, quite safely. I think trying to over-regulate kills not just businesses, but it also kills uh, organizations like ours, because this is absolutely critical that we maintain our culture, we maintain our heritage, and this is that's one of the reasons we have so many different uh, organizations who are trying to maintain their culture, trying to maintain their uh, religious affiliations and all of that, and this is absolutely critical. So I think uh, having overburdening organizations with all kinds of licenses and regulations and uh, killing people to death having the fire department standing by and, and like, like it was the case last year for us, uh, it's way too onerous, way too expensive, way too expensive, uh, expensive. And I don't think organizations uh, will be able to afford it. And from a business point of view, I think you guys will kill the businesses. Absolutely well. 
Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for your previous public service. Uh, we will now move to questions. And uh, this was selected by Councillor Nickel, I believe. So, um, and by the way, Councillor Nick was selected by Councillor Nack. Didn't uh, Councillor Nack select it? I don't remember. Andrew, did you do it? Go ahead, I did. Andrew. It doesn't really matter. You and I are going to ask the same question. So, you can yeah, go ahead, Andrew. Yeah. Um, uh, sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll just kick it off. Uh, first, uh, uh, to Naresh, thank, thanks for um, uh, speaking on this. I just want to double check because I, part of what I'm struggling with is I'm trying to figure out what what problem the city's trying to solve in all of these changes. Um, so up until and you you talked about some of the more recent ones, I just want to double check. Have you ever had any safety issues or? Uh, you know, in the 20 plus years that you were doing it, did you ever come into any challenges uh, of running the event where there was a safety concern? Not at all. Uh, we follow proper protocols, uh, which means that whatever is laid out, uh, when, when you actually go to buy uh, the fireworks, they, uh, the store owners uh, are absolutely educated and they tell you the guidelines. For the last few years, we actually bring uh, bring in uh, bring in a professional uh, to discharge them. So you know, double the distance of the birth site, uh, putting the barriers, uh, make sure nobody goes near them. All of those protocols are taken in place. In the last 20 years, knock on wood, we've been absolutely safe. It, 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 it only happened last year when fire department declined it, and uh, you know, thanks to Councillor Nickel who uh, went batting for us and we were able to do it, but fire department, they sent their truck there and they had a whole bunch of people in uniform walking around. It was it was intimidation to a lot of our members. And I bet you we had a lot of people there, but they were absolutely intimidated by the fire department. Yeah. And what about the, so the other piece just is related to the cost of doing this and, and the changes that you've seen over the last few years, because I mean, what, uh, you know, I think about when we were doing our community league shows before I was on council and, you know, we, we had a fairly limited budget. You know, these were twenty five hundred dollar shows. Um, uh, and so when we started to hear about these costs increase, I, I worried about the ability to have the type of show that communities are used to. And, and any thoughts on that? Well, I think the smaller organizations, uh, it's a it's a really uh, burdensome because the cost is uh, absolutely is going up because I think one of the requirements uh, was at one time, we were able to discharge them ourselves. And then uh, city came in with the bylaws that no, you can't do it yourself. You have to bring in a professional. So that added extra few hundred dollars to their, their cost. Uh, organizations like ours were a fairly large organization. Uh, so we chose at the time that it's probably safer for us to bring in a professional uh, who knows the ins and outs and, and you know, follow all those proper, proper protocols. But for smaller organizations, you'll kill them. Mm -hmm. This kind of stuff will kill them. Yeah. Thanks for that. And, and uh, John, I just had a, a couple of questions for you. You had mentioned at the opening, you covered a lot in a very short amount of time, and I appreciate it. You were going. Uh, um, <laughs> Can you help me? I just wanted to make sure I, I jotted down the numbers right. You mentioned that there was a 40% drop prior to COVID. And can you just expand? I wanted to make sure I, I captured that correctly. Yeah. So what I did was I uh, I, I asked the city, uh, city of Edmonton to give me some data and Edmonton Fire Prevention was involved. And I asked for the permits that were issued um, over the course of uh, since 2015, because, you know, I haven't been in business as long as Ron, but I've been here since 2009 and I've seen things change a lot. And so what I did was I looked at, at, at the numbers. So in 2019, there was, of course, a big drop for two reasons. One was all the Diwali shows um, were, were not allowed. So it's true that the Bahartia Cultural Center was allowed, but it did involve many uniformed officers. And I will admit, I was ashamed to see how that community was treated that day by our by our city. But so they were the one that was allowed, but all the rest weren't allowed. And so there was a big drop there as well. As soon as the new regulations were put in. So I don't know if you remember, but the people showed up at the city council. Council directed that, that consultations take place. 
within weeks of those consultations, even more shows were canceled. And that was because these consultations happened. The CNFA attended them. Actually, there was nobody from, you know, certainly I wasn't there. Um, but so, so more shows were canceled after that. So there was consultations, but they created more regulations as soon as consultations ended. And that killed, like, for example, uh, 30% of the New Year's Eve shows and, and more shows in the new year. So, so what, so anyway, that 40%, what that is, is I looked at the permits that they've, they've issued, uh, in over the years from 2017 to 2019. Um, and so that's how I came up with that number. Um, maybe it's wrong, but, uh, that's certainly the name of the ballpark. That's helpful. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much for that. We'll now move to Councillor Nichol. Okay, uh, Perry, fireworks are not illegal, are they? No, they're not. They're, what, they're, are they're any, regulated by the federal government. Yeah, are there age restrictions on fireworks? You have to be 18 years of age to purchase them. And if you're under 18 and you want to discharge them, you have to be under the supervision, supervision of an adult. Okay, that's the way I understood it, because when I was a kid, that's kind of how it worked as well. So I'm going to go to you, uh, John. John, you carry insurance, right? I do carry insurance um, because we we're also a display company. Yes, I do carry it. Uh, John, have you had any claims against your company with regards to selling fireworks? No, and so yeah, for selling fireworks, uh, no, of course not. Because um, let's say let's say we had a customer who used them. Um, you know, he's drunk, he's shirtless, and he's holding the firework in his hand, and he hurts himself. Even if he made a claim, he hasn't followed the safety instructions, which, you know, in, so that's why we never will get a claim. Yeah, we have we we have stores across Alberta. We sell a lot of fireworks. And no, of course, we don't get claims it's any more than you get a claim uh, where you bought your ATV when you when you crack your skull. Uh, no, no, we have not. Sir. So, 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 John, it's the onus of it's like many other consumer products, this in a kind of a don't you think kind of fashion. You buy it, you're you're responsible for using it appropriately. Is that's basically your contention, correct? Why why is the vendor being punished uh, for a potential bad operator? You know, absolutely. I think I you know. So the federal I should be really clear. The federal regulations do charge the retailer to provide safety information in written or verbal form, and even to, there's a there's a video now. So we are responsible to provide fireworks safety information. However, that's now printed on all the fireworks. So we have that onus. In Edmonton, there's a long tradition of telling people not to shoot in parks. Ron can tell you that. He's he and I have been doing that for years. You know. We have signs in our store, you can't shoot aerial fireworks, but yes, the onus should be on the user. It has to be. So, so Ron, let's, 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 you know what? There, there's no statistics in the report with regards to incidents regarding fireworks. Uh, do you, can you recall any incidents or issues of fireworks that have caused any problems? You're muted. Okay, uh, Ron. Once you, if you click on, you click on. I guess uh, I'll go to you. I go to you, Mr. Wilson. With regards to you, do you recall any any, any incidences or issues? You didn't have my speaker. Industry of of uh, of, law, of uh, operating fireworks. Uh, you no, know, I remember out of the eighty shows plus that I shot in Edmonton. Uh, and then throughout Alberta, I've never had any issues. Uh, even when a firework does malfunction, doesn't shoot 100% properly, I've never had any personal injuries being very close to the fireworks as they go off or even any of my assistants. And I've never had any property damage or fires or anything of that nature caused at all because of the firework whatsoever. I think, Mr. Wilson, you you made it very clear. Your, your opinion is this is a bylaw that really approaches explosives as opposed to consumer fireworks. Does that is that your opinion? Is that seems to be a bit of an overreach? Well, from what it how it reads and, and the restrictions that we have to go through, they're treating it as if it, they're handling C4. Um, obviously, high hazard fireworks are the dangerous types of fireworks, but the amount of explosives and how they're actually discharged. 
Um, those are the shows you're going to see at like Stampede or K-Days. They're much more powerful and they're designed to go, you know, double or triple the height of your consumer fireworks. Uh, consumer fireworks, they just don't have the power behind them um, to cause the damage that they're saying that Edmonton is going to take on the risk of. Um, so they're very simple. So my, my last question will go to Naresh. Naresh, yeah. uh, we've talked about this a little bit off and on, and, and I want to thank you for all you do for the community. Um, Thank you. It's the, the fixed costs that they're putting on, and you and I have talked about red tape and over-regulate uh, what's going on here. Um, for example, uh, can you give me some of the costings that you had to incur with regards to the show you've been running for, I, I don't know, what, 20 years, 15 years? I don't know how long we've been doing the Wally down in Mill Woods. I mean, uh, because it doesn't, that you did talk about the issue of that, uh, these incremental costs are slowly killing uh, the ability for, uh, for your community to, to have your celebration. Well, Mike, thank you for the question. Uh, in our case, uh, when we first started, we started very low budget and we were discharging it following all proper protocols, discharging it ourselves. As the organization grew bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, and there was more and more red tape being put on, uh, all kinds of you know uh, uh, the regulations were were uh, being brought forward. We chose at the time, and I don't know the exact cost, what it what we had to pay. Not last year because of COVID, we didn't do it. Where we brought in the fire department and everybody else, I don't know the exact cost at the time, but the incremental cost every single year, uh, we are fortunate that we have the budget to be able to afford it. But I can tell you community leagues and smaller organizations, they were not able to do it. Last year, with your help, we were able to display it to the fire department and everybody else, but the surrounding, you know, uh, nobody else was able to do it because of what was put on by so onerous by the city of Edmonton and the fire department, it was just not able to do it. So uh, how much exact cost, I can't answer that, but it has grown exponentially. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, we'll now move to uh, Councilor Benga. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thanks for all the work uh, you've been doing in the race and the community. And a uh, couple of questions for you. Um, yeah. I know uh, Councillor Nichol did ask already. Yeah, what is uh, you know what is the cost to you or the incremental cost? But anyway, uh, I won't ask the same question again. Um, so right now, are you advocating for the against this? Uh, by law because it's economical for economical reasons or red tape reasons it's both what we need to do be what what you know a consumer needs to be able to go to a store and buy the product the onus is on the consumer to make sure that we dis, you know we discharge it properly uh, all of this red tape get a permit get this get that it, it is it is just way too onerous. And Councillor Benga, thank you to you as well, because I know uh, both you and uh, Councillor Nickel are representatives of uh, Southeast Edmonton, and you were both there at the Diwali, and you've seen it with your own eyes. So it, it, it's the cost, it's the regulations, it's the paperwork. People say, heck with it, we're not going to do it. Uh, some say it's too onerous. Some say... You know, it's intimidation by the fire department. Uh, it's not worth it. So all of these little things will add to, you know, we're trying to build Edmonton as, you know, uh, a very inclusive, you know, culturally inclusive, uh, all of that stuff, which uh, by having regulations and red tapes like that, you, you're, you're taking five steps backwards. Okay. In your uh, own... Uh, I guess uh, presentation you mentioned uh, uh, following proper protocol. Yeah. Would you be able to tell me um, that proper protocol 
first of all, what is proper protocol and who is going to be making sure it's being for, uh, followed if there so, is no yeah. bylaw? So, so uh, uh, Councillor, as when you buy the product, it tells you the uh, distance of the audience should be double than the burst height. Because last year when I was involved with this, I didn't know all that stuff, the burst height and, and the fallout area and all of that stuff. Now I do. Uh, so who's following it? It is the onus is on the organization to make sure that it's following. When you buy it, they absolutely tell you that, hey, if this thing bursts at, call it, you know, 30 feet, well, your, your uh, audience cannot be less than 60 feet away. Double the burst height. I'm using it as an example. Double. So at, at 60 feet, we will take a temporary fence and, and we will fence it off there. So nobody can get past that. Uh, we also, since we've been doing it in our big parking lot for years now, uh, the surrounding areas, making sure that, you know, there's nothing open in the areas, uh, there's nothing combustible there to begin with. We know that for sure. But we also uh, make sure we walk around. Diwali is generally uh, in the wintertime, so there's all kinds of snow and stuff there. So no, uh, no possibility of having dry grass or anything like that. And, you know, uh, and we don't use uh, fireworks, which goes, like somebody was saying, commercial fireworks. It is consumer fireworks, and it's absolutely safe. Okay. And, uh, Mr. Iria, a quick question for you. Uh, would you be able to tell me if there is any, like, what's the yearly burden, financial burden on your business because of all this? Well, I, I think the first thing that we should understand is that Bahartia Cultural Center is a really big organization and they have the resources and they have, they have sophisticated people like um, Naresh to deal with them. So the, I guess the burden on our company, we, we subsidize all of these community shows from our retail sales. And that's actually true of every fireworks show uh, for small communities. The fireworks company is, is subsidizing it. So so the burden on us is, well, we want to keep doing this. And so what does it cost us? We spend a lot of time meeting the regulations of the city of Edmonton. Uh, like Tyler was saying, it's it's like a high hazard permit application. I've done both. In fact, I would suggest in some ways Edmonton's are worse. And But the other problem is that even year to year, the regulations change in Edmonton. Like in 2019 alone, this is thing we call a 250 meter rule. How it was interpreted changed three times. Um, so it's, you know, you put it in an application, you don't know if you're going to get it through. And so in Edmonton, the regulations change all the time. So how much time do we spend doing these, these applications? Hours for each one. And I think the other thing we need to understand is we used to do shows for budgets of like $300 and community leagues used to do them for a few hundred dollars. And those shows have just ended. And that's something that nobody's talking about is that is, you know, for example, in the inner city, the Cromdale, Parkdale, the inner city community, a thousand dollars for them is is more than they can afford. You know, they, they used to have a little bit of fireworks with their with their um, uh, dinner where everybody brought their 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 dishes, their uh, potluck dinner. They don't anymore because they can't afford it. Thousand dollars is ridiculous. Same thing for the Bent Arrow Traditional Healing Society or the, or in Little Italy. There used to be a show there, too. These those shows have all ended. So the cost is is two things. One is, yeah, we, we're willing to subsidize it just like every other fireworks company. Councillor Nack mentioned the, the show in his community. That's done as a labor of love by a company that just wants to do that show. So there's that. But also the fact that all these communities before 2017 lost their shows as soon as they started adding things like ins liability insurance and professional shooter and, and all of those requirements. People just get scared off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councillor Vanga. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, might as well stick with uh, John. Uh, Mr. Adria, um, you talked about subsidizing community events. I'm just wondering if you can expand on that a little bit and briefly. Yeah. So, like, every small community fireworks show, there's – Honestly, there's no budget to make money on it. So all the companies, it's not just us. Everybody does it. You know, Councillor Nack can tell you the same thing in his community, but it's true across the province. Most of these shows are done by people like us 
because they love fireworks. They, it's awesome being in those communities. And so, and so what we, what most companies do is they, they, they get a budget from the community, they buy the fireworks, they pay for the permit. The subsidy that we do is we spend hours and hours of time, uh, somebody like me or Tyler or somebody like that, of getting the permit through the city of Edmonton. And you don't know when the regulations are going to change and what's new this year. And, 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 and so, yeah, that's, that's how we subsidize them through this, this effort of we're happy to break even on the show, but then you have to spend hours of painful, of really painful paperwork and unnecessary. And I would suggest sure that's why we do 70% of the shows. It's not because we're so great. It's because we're the only ones still doing all that paperwork. Everybody else has basically dropped out. Well, 30% of them are done by somebody else, but so yeah, right. that's the subsidy is, is the work. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Verifies it. Um, now the next question is, um, you know, one of the things that I anticipate folks um, asking me about when I go back to the community is, you know, I get woken up at night, people are putting off fireworks. I don't know if it's gunshots or if it's fireworks. What's going on? Why is there, why are there so, such an increase in public disturbance? And that's a good question. So I would say that there, I have noticed that too in this past year with COVID, my neighbors who never shot fireworks, they know my position on shooting aerial fireworks in Edmonton. I got signs all over my store. They were doing it this year, and I think it's COVID is one of those things. I don't, honestly, I don't have a good answer for that. We do tell people in our stores, and I can tell you that that everybody does, because we don't want this kind of backlash from the community uh, to counselors. So I guess in the old days, they used to send out a fire truck, but the fire trucks are now responding to, you know, drug overdoses, right? They used to send a, 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 a truck and ladder, and then they'd go and stop those shows. You know, I guess if I had an answer to this, I'd first thing I do is stop the loud motorcycles because and that helicopter that flies over my house, I guess. But I honestly I don't have an answer for that. I think it's because, you know, this is why it's happening. Maybe is um, one thing that nobody's actually said here is the vast majority of fireworks in Alberta and in Canada are purchased online. And, you know, some guy in central Canada. Yeah. I don't have an answer, sir. I really don't, and it's yeah. well. That's yeah. okay. And it's a worry. That answer. Can I? Can I comment? This is Noreen. Yeah, sure. Feel free. Uh, so to answer your question, just because a few people are breaking the law, if there is a bylaw in place that you can't shoot fireworks after 11 p.m., and someone decides to do that, you can't punish everybody for, uh, you know, law-abiding citizens just because there are a few out there who are breaking the law. Yeah. No, so that, 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 yeah, yeah, that shouldn't be the case at all. Here are the rules and regulations in place, and everyone is uh, complying with those rules and regulations. There are people out there who are breaking the law, and they should be dealt with accordingly and shouldn't be punishing everybody. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so, John, I had one other question for you. Um, being a retailer um, and understanding that there's probably going to be some kind of uh, um, regulation put in. If it's not this, it'll, it would be something else. What would you feel is a, is a good compromise? Because we may have to actually, like, I'm, I'm, I'm getting the feeling that what is presented to us today may not be uh, supported by committees and there may have to be more uh, engagement. So, what would you say is a good compromise? So um, the biggest problem with consumer fireworks in Edmonton is the regulations change very often. This bylaw is written so that any regulation created in the future would have the force of that bylaw. So I guess the first thing about any good regulation or, or legislation like this is it should completely outline the requirements for us, and there shouldn't be, so for example, if you look in how it's written, it says that whoever gets the permit has to follow all the conditions of the of the permit. I, I, I have the exact wording here, but um, any person is issued a permit to sell fireworks within the city of Edmonton must comply with all conditions of the issue permit. And we were told a year ago that this is how they were gonna implement the, the permit to purchase, which would absolutely kill our business. So whatever we council does decide, I'd ask you that you outline every one of those requirements in the bylaw itself so that they can't be changed in the future. Um, so, for example, the insurance requirement, my insurance doubled this year. 
I believe that that happened because one of the companies sort of got a monopoly and uh, so they doubled the insurance. Um, so insurance is an onerous um, uh, undertaking. You, you can't have insurance. The, and having, me having to give all of my uh, customer information and invoices and everything to the city every year is not acceptable. It's no other business has to go through that. So could the, could the, could the regulation say you have to have a business license? Or I don't even know if you need to say that because maybe it's kind of obvious, but we could be certified by the CNFA. And that would be, that would be a good uh, compromise. A CNFA like us wants to see this happen. So could we have the CNFA certifies us? We have to follow federal regulations, yes. The problem is, as soon as the, I will tell you, this has happened in the past. When the city, we'd have city inspectors. I was inspected up to five times in one year. And what are they looking for? I guess they're looking to see if we broke, somehow broke some, some regulation. Edmonton has this habit of this over-regulation of, of consumer fireworks. And honestly, unless you constrain them, we're going to have the same thing where, you know, the federal regulation says something, and they interpret it here to, to, to make it impossible for us to operate. Something we need to be really clear, the regulations in Edmonton for shooting fireworks, I know I'm changing the topic, but they actually make it impossible for any of the Diwali communities, so Hindu and Sikh communities, but also the Muslim communities use them for Eid. And there's the odd church in the north side, the Christian church that uses them. None of those communities under the current regulation can have firework shows anymore. Like that, that's a thing. And so... The, the, the city is telling us, um, the fire department is telling us, oh, it's federal regulations. Well, no, it's not. It's how they're interpreting them. And, and so that's the problem. When they interpret these federal regulations, they interpret them to our detriment. And that's my concern. It's like I said, there used to be dozens of retailers and now there's only three because they, they, they hounded the rest of them out of the business. Whether it was at one point they required insurance, at one, you know, when they started coming through your, your, your store multiple times per year, I mean, that's pretty... It's harassment. That's all it is. And I, and I don't know why all those retailers, I mean, I know one, one of them, there was an older couple. Paint you a picture. Imagine an a, a immigrant couple. Their stores open every day of the year and they work all those hours. They have no employees. They used to sell fireworks and they gave up because they told me that they would, the fire department would come in and count their inventory and they would be lose their fireworks seller's permit if they were, couldn't account for a single item. And, and that's the kind of thing that's gone on. And, and same for me, too. I mean, we're a reputable retailer. And, in, you know, all of these things, the paperwork we had to send, whatever you do, sir, maybe just bring this back to it. We need to we need to outline those things and we need to have them in the way that they can't be reinterpreted in six months or a year or two years. Um, so whatever you do, you know. Right. OK, well, thank get, you very much. Can I can I can I ask one question, please? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, we don't uh, have a mechanism for that. But uh, okay, no problem. Um, I do appreciate all of your submissions, uh, and also okay. I'm way over time. So <laughs> we will now move over to uh, questions for administration. And I want to thank our panel for speaking. And please, uh, if you're curious, feel free to stick around. So uh, we have Councillor Knack on the board first. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, and and uh, thanks for this. And so, I, I guess I, I want to start with the question. I think I heard in the presentation that that there that there was support based on the engagement. So I, I wouldn't mind. Um, you know, we we've heard a lot today, where, which suggests uh, maybe otherwise. And and I think there's been a cumulative impact over the last couple of years where there's been some challenges um, that have created this. So. So it feels like to me there's in fact a disconnect. So I'd like to get your response based off what you've heard today, based off what you've been hearing over the last little while. We'll let the uh, chief weigh in on that one, Councillor. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, there was uh, several engagement sessions as I uh, um, laid out in the slide presentation where we um, did a, a survey, we met with um, community leagues, uh, heard from uh, the ven vendors and manufacturers, uh, and uh, the federal regulators on this um, particular topic. And uh, the support uh, was in favor of uh, not just the vendor permit, which is what we're um, discussing today, but also the other um, permits to uh, discharge uh, the ordinance or um, uh, other uh, items that met the requirements under the fireworks bylaw. 
so who I, I just I'm not curious I'm just curious who you've been engaging who's giving that support and, and I and I asked that because I I I haven't heard that from my end I've I've heard from some local communities that have expressed concern about um, sort of this cumulative increasing of of uh, regulations for what <coughs> well maybe I'll ask this question first do we have any measurable data around safety incidents that have occurred. Because that's the purpose of a lot of this, right? We're trying to address safety. So so do we have data that says, here's the problem we're trying to fix? We have some national data, but I'll look to uh, Deputy Chief Kroom to uh, maybe respond to the specifics around that. Yeah. yeah, I guess I'm trying to understand, are we talking about one incident a year? Are we talking about 100? I, I, I just don't know. It's a, it, it seems like we're doing this to solve a problem. So what's the problem we're solving right now? Okay, so thank you very much. And, and uh, so we're talking about the display of um, Tier 1 and Tier 2 fireworks, uh, consumer fireworks. Um, uh, so really, the I guess the regulations that we had brought forward and in, in discussion with the um, with the engagement groups and with the uh, insight survey, um, looking for the broader perspective, uh, we had found that the the requirements were were uh, in large supported by by the broader community. As far as the data, um, the data that uh, the chief had referred to, the national statistics are not really uh, well documented in Canada. So, and and our understanding, and it was made clear to us by both. Uh, local stakeholders and national uh, or the federal regulator was that the the fireworks are quite a bit different in Canada than they are in in the U.S. and and beyond. Um, however, that being said, there there are often near misses that that we've accounted for and that come to our attention. Uh, some of the concerns expressed to us from um, EPS and unfortunately the the data was not available, but on not just the no, no, uh, noise complaints but on um, uh, ordinance that are, are left in the field, um, the debris, uh, it could be a dud, and, and they're the ones who are responding to the call and will try to track it down. Uh, without the permitting process, we don't know who to reach out to to try to, try to uh, change the behavior. As far as um, a serious injury, there, there have been some, but not, not in Edmonton, thankfully. Um, Ottawa had a significant uh, fire and injury, and, and I believe Winnipeg also. There's not a there's not a high number though, uh, councillor. Mm -hmm. And with the, the the few incidents that we have seen, are those from shows that are being put on by communities in partnership with these groups, or are these being done by individuals who are using them, uh, not not abiding by the rules uh, that they're supposed to be under the regulations that, that are in place? So I'm happy to take that, Chief. Um, so yeah, and thank you for the question. Uh, Councillor Nack. Um, yeah, so actually, I'm happy to say that by and large, a permitted event uh, generally will go off without a hitch. And if there are any complaints, um, we can usually, uh, or those have been some of our learnings, but uh, by and large, the majority of the complaints that would be coming in would be unpermitted events. Yeah, so I guess that's what I'm really trying to figure out how to solve here because it feels like we've added a lot over the last couple of years onto the events that are being run well and none of that actually fixes the problem that that's been expressed today so i'm 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 at a bit of a loss right now i see a couple of other series of questions and maybe i'll think about how we best maybe return to the drawing board because it i feel like we've we're not solving the right problem here just the other point, to add, other point to add, Councillor Knack, is some of those um, additional municipal requirements are in part, in part in response to the changing of the provincial fire code. So as, as the province changes change the landscape, we have to kind of fill into that into that space. I don't know if the chief wants to add add anything to that, uh, chief. Yeah, I, I think that's a, the key part to this. Um, as well, based on the, the feedback we had uh, with the Insight Survey, which was over 3,000 responses, um, uh, we also had the three workshops, and, and the feedback was that, uh, you know, citizens did want to see fireworks, but they wanted some parameters around it and for it to be safe. And with the change in 2019 from the Alberta Fire Code, removing this 
um, and, and our ability to actually enforce this work, um, we needed to move it into our, our bylaws so that we, we did have that ability to uh, enforce the regulations. Okay, I'm out of time. I'll probably come back for a referral of some type. Okay, thank you, Councillor Knack. So, um, sounds like we're going to be getting some movement here. All right, uh, Councillor Nickel, go ahead. Deputy Chief Chrome, I know you're a good man, but I got to ask you this question point blank. Over the last five years, how much, how many, how, how many injuries have we had due to fireworks operating in the city? How much property damage has occurred due to fireworks operating in the city of Edmonton? I'm not, I'm not concerned about Ottawa. I'm not concerned about it. <laughs> Wait a big Edmonton. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for the, for the question. And I guess I can happily say that uh, I'm only aware of one, one incident where a firework was suspected to be uh, the incendiary aspect of, of a fire. As far as reported injuries, I do not have any for the city of Edmonton that, that I no. can and I appreciate that, De Deputy Chief. I get that. So that's the number one question. So part of this package is is imposing an insurance requirement. Am I correct? Getting that correctly? That is correct, correct oh. Councillor Nickel. So why are we imposing an insurance requirement on the seller who already carries insurance uh, to go above and beyond, right, when it's an operator issue of a legal product? And for this, thank you, Councillor, for the question. Um, for this, we looked at uh, neighboring municipalities. So Edmonton is actually the least restrictive when it comes to the selling of fireworks and the only major city that actually allows fireworks on residential property. And uh, mm -hmm. when we looked at Strathcona County um, and Sturgeon County, that were the other two that, that allow uh, fireworks uh, in their jurisdictions in this manner, um, one had a, had the requirements of five million dollars for insurance. The other had ten million, and so we looked at at the lower one at five million uh, as uh, an industry best practice. But those are counties. That's not a city. There's a difference between the county of Leduc and the city of Edmonton in terms of operations and fire bans and so on. But I'll leave, I'll leave that one sit. So I'll ask our, uh, uh, is Ms. Jacobson on the line? Is our lawyer on the line? Yeah, Leela Ramaswamy <laughs> from Legal Services. Oh, hello. I'm, I'm used to Ms. Jacobson. So have you had any claims against the city with regards to operation and, and distribution of fireworks that you can recall in the last five years? Uh. To be fair, I did not specifically look into that. I have not heard of such a claim, I can advise. Yeah, neither, neither have I, to be brutally honest. Neither have I in my entire career. I've, I haven't heard of one. So I guess the question here, and Councillor Knack has, has gotten to the point of, uh, this is striking me as onerous and a bit of an overreach. And so uh, in terms of, this is not a problem, hasn't been a problem, hasn't been a problem. Uh, Councillor Banger can step in and talk about it next, about Mill Woods and, and, and this situation. Where we probably have more fireworks in most parts of the city, don't we, Councillor Banga? right? Uh, being Mill Woods and, and Canada Day and so on. And I've never, I've never had an issue or, and Councillor Banga, I'm not sure if we even had a complaint or of with regards to the fireworks and so on, and regards to the noise that uh, Councillor Paquette raised. And I think that was a good question to ask. I do have uh, another question though, with the storage tank res uh, registration, I understand that. Uh, I hope I'm reading this right. This new registration fee for storage tanks will be set at $75 with a potential revenue of $145,000 annually. Uh, it is a cost recovery fee, correct? Or is there something extra to that? That is correct, Councillor Nickel. And so for $145,000, how many tanks are you expecting to review and so on? Can just give me, give me a sense of that because uh, is $75 going to cover it? Is it too much? Is it too little? Our analysis was uh, $75 was uh, fair to introduce because it was something that um, businesses and uh, owners of the tank 
uh, tanks that need to be registered actually were paying uh, to the province. So we looked at um, you know what they were paying, what was reasonable, and what kind of resources we can put towards this and in, in, into our uh, quality management program uh, when it comes to uh, risk. So. Uh, I'd look to Deputy Chief Kroom to some of the specific, uh, well, no, the amount well, of tanks. That's, that, that, that's fine. As long okay. as you're comfortable with that and giving me the assurance. And I just got 14 seconds here. This is a government of Alberta requirement, correct? Uh, this is legislated. Got to do it. Don't have a choice. Correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Banga. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with uh, Councillor Nickel there. Uh, I guess uh, Millwoods is probably most famous for uh, having all these fireworks uh, displays. Anyway, my questions uh, are based on uh, on basically the insurance currently or under the proposed bylaw. Is the insurance requirement both for the vendor and for the consumer? Right now. Oh. Uh, thank you, Councillor Manga. The insurance uh, requirement of five million dollars is just for the vendor selling the fireworks. Okay, and there is uh, no insurance requirement for the consumer. So, if we're looking at tier two permits, um, this with uh, community leagues and whatnot. Uh, they primarily coordinate that through uh, neighborhood services section and the community leagues are required to have uh, adequate insurance as part of their uh, agreement uh, with the city and the major majority of community leagues have this and, uh, and, and work with the show provider to make sure that they're named on their policy as well. And this prevents uh, volunteers from insurance coverage if they uh, discharge fireworks. All right. And uh, my other question is uh, on this provincial fire code. Um, what does that require us to do? Um, thank you, Councillor Banga. The, the removal of um, fireworks from the provincial fire code uh, now puts the onus on the on the city, and I would uh, maybe look to uh, legal to to comment on on what requirements now fall on the city with that removal. Um, Councillor Banga, because of the removal of the firework, um, anything to do with fireworks in the fire code, the intention of that was the um, provincial administrators felt that it was best for the municipalities, as they know their municipalities best, to undertake their own regulations. So with respect to vendors, um, previously the previous fire code had requirements um, that a firework vendor permit was required, conditions that every sale, there had to be a record of uh, the date of the sale, the buyer, their address, the type of fireworks that was sold, the amount. Um, and because the city of Edmonton decided, has made the decision to continue with the selling of fireworks, we felt that these, um, these regulations that were in the fireworks before to regulate firework vendors should continue to some extent as we are still going to continue with the selling of fireworks in the city of Edmonton. Okay. So um, under, uh, just to make me understand please, uh, under the current uh, system, if uh, two business or, uh, businesses are located side by side and one is uh, our business or uh, uh, temples, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, fireworks are shot in the industrial area and a fire starts, whose insurance covers that? Is it the vendor's insurance or is it the consumer's insurance? Sorry, could you repeat the question? If a if a, two businesses are side by side and there's a fire in the a business and uh, and a temple or uh, some place where uh, fireworks uh, display is being uh, displayed, uh, and and somehow a fire starts, who is responsible and whose insurance is responsible? I think I better put it this way. 
Okay. Um, I will, I will have to add the preface that it always does depend on the particular facts, but if the fire is caused by the firework event, there's definitely some responsibility on, on the fireworks display because that would be a major contributor to the fire that has happened. All right. And my last question is, um, um, I know um, we have uh, been kicking this uh, bylaw back and forth a few times, and uh, I have measurable that, uh, data of safety incidents. Uh, I only recall one that was probably around 30 years. Uh, if there was, uh, that was in Fort Saskatchewan where uh, some fire uh, rescue officers' uh, uh, hand got blown off or damaged or whatever happened. And uh, that was a while ago. Uh, I would say probably 30 years ago. Is Are there any other incidents besides that in the last few years? Maybe the deputy chief can weigh in on that. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, and thank you, uh, Councillor Benga. No, uh, again, so the, the number of injuries or um, any, uh, any situations resulting from a firework display are, are um, uh, very, very low and, and nil in some cases. However, the number of complaints, uh, uh, concerns expressed by uh, EPS on on the um, uh, unpermitted events, um, those those still remain. And, and why, when they are at, at with us at the engagement sessions, uh, some of these regulations were were embraced by by that group and and uh, the rest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Esslinger. Thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate the report. I guess I'm a little confused because I thought we had talked about this a couple of years ago, and uh, we weren't going down this road. So if I understand correctly, what's changed is the federal regulations? Uh, th thank you, Councillor Esslinger. Um, what has changed is in 2019, the um, Alberta Fire Code removed uh, the fireworks portion and uh, now look to municipalities to manage that removal and enforce it. And so what we're proposing today is um, that the requirements that came out of out of that code, we've uh, engaged uh, citizens, vendors, uh, manufacturers, and, and uh, regulatory uh, personnel to uh, come up with uh, a, a permit for vendors that would um, uh, meet the intent of what came out of the fire code and be safe for the citizens of Edmonton. Okay, and if I read the report correctly, it says if we don't have vendor permits, the city's assuming significant risk, but we don't have any evidence of that. So can you just confirm how you got to that conclusion? From the risk perspective, I would look to uh, legal to weigh in on that piece. And I can I can jump in a bit while we're while we're waiting. Um, without a vendor permit, uh, administration has no enforcement ability for the vendors who do not follow the regulation requirements for uh, storage or sale of consumer fireworks. And so these regulations are also critical for the safe usage of fireworks where vendors must provide safety information, uh, ensure the purchasers of 18 years of age, and uh, most importantly, um, advising on the products so that they can safely be discharged in a space that the consumer has available. And so there are also strict regulations regarding the quantity and type of fireworks uh, that can be can be stored. So without these vendor permits, the city of Edmonton is assuming that risk, including damage to property or injury, um, as there would be no monitoring or enforcement actions for vendors. Thank you, Chief Zidilny. And one more thing that I would add as well is that um, under the under the Explosives Act, only only uh, a rep an agent of of the federal government can enforce those provisions. Um, when these provisions are made into a municipal bylaw, which we have to do because the fire code no longer regulates these items, the city of Edmonton can actually um, directly enforce. They have the enforcement powers under the bylaw. So uh, 
The one speaker said, uh, if we had regulated or certified the vendors through the CMFA, I think I got that right, uh, that would have addressed some of these concerns. Would that alleviate any risk? Uh, thank you, Councillor. That, that would be the minimum training that we would require um, uh, for vendors to uh, to have and be able to um, uh, display the fireworks. I'd look to uh, Chief Kroom to maybe um, add to that statement. Sorry, you button eluded me there. Um, yes. Um, yeah, actually, that, that is a desired state, actually, that CNFA become an integral partner in, in communicating to the vendors and, frankly, the shooters and, uh, even better yet, all, all users of uh, consumer fireworks. We'd be quite quite happy to um, to get to that point. Uh, we just didn't feel that we were there yet. We weren't know, we didn't know if CNFA was uh, able or had capacity to, to manage that aspect. So the regulations um, appear to us to be um, a reasonable approach to get this um, established. Okay, it seems I might be more palatable. Um, my other question concern was on uh, the, were we able to engage with the cultural groups and the community leagues that had typically used uh, fireworks in the past as part of our engagement? Chief Kroom, would you be able to answer yeah. this one as well, please? Yes, I would. Yeah, and thank you for that. No, so we relied on the um, uh, community neighborhood resource um, of folks. Now, they weren't, so not, not specifically represented. It was a broader representation. Um, so that, that, that is something that could be improved on. I think groups that have used it would uh, look at it differently because if you asked me as a consumer, do I want fireworks to be safe? I'd say yes, but... It's those who have engaged someone who's had to have someone come in might look at it differently. Thank you. I'll look forward to the referral motion. Thank you, Councillor Esslinger. Uh, Councillor Knack. Sure, maybe just a few questions because I was just uh, sending some emails back and forth with the clerk. Uh, first, help me understand. So the, what, the province made a decision to stop doing this. If it was as critical as, as it is, what, I'm not sure I understand why they stopped then. Why did they say, oh, this is something municipalities have to do now versus them doing a centralized governance uh, of, of something that they feel is so critical? I think legal can weigh in on that one. Yes, um, Councillor Mack, my understanding was they felt municipalities were um, better able to determine what was best for their own municipalities with respect to consumer fireworks. And I believe that came as a result of the province regulating fireworks for many years and th these were comments that had come back to them from the municipalities. And if we, depending on our rules, I, what I'm also trying to understand is the federal government's rules that are in place and how they do or don't impact us. So if we didn't have a rule on X, but the federal government obviously has clear regulations, I, I'm still not sure I understand. Do we need are we creating rules that go above and beyond what are currently set out by the federal government? Because I've heard that submitted a couple times today. And if we are, why? Um, the Explosives Act does regulate some aspects of, uh, of fireworks. Um, where there's a gap that the fire code had previously filled in was that um, with respect to, uh, f sorry, fireworks, um, that are stored that are 150 kilograms or more, um, there's a requirement under federal legislation that all records of sales have to be kept. If they're under 150 kilograms or less, the previous fire code required that sales records be kept for all of those transactions. So that's one gap that the fire code filled and that um, with the fire code no longer regulating uh, fireworks sales, that's a gap that, that we now have that the municipality feels it needs to, um, sorry, that it needs to fill. Another one is uh, regulation or enforcement. Um, so under the Explosives Act, only federal agents um, that are designated to enforce the Explosives Act can actually enforce the regulations. Um, and so my understanding is that's two EPS officers that are with the bomb squad. Um, with the fire code, 
um, because the fire code applied to all municipalities in Alberta, all municipalities could enforce the fire code. So with the fire code now removing the provisions with respect to um, with respect to fireworks, unless there's a municipal bylaw within the city of Edmonton, there wouldn't be any ability to, to enforce to enforce those regulations. Okay, so I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out my way forward here. It sounds like the storage tank piece is, is sort of independent of this. I feel like that's something that we could move forward with, and we have to. I I am very concerned about the sort of cumulative changes over the last three years, and how that's impacting communities who are trying to do events and programs versus what we're trying to deal with, which is those one-off events of somebody not using a product safely. So it feels like we've created a series of bylaws to try to fix that. It hasn't fixed that. And it's just had a negative impact on others. So I, I wonder if, and I would like for guidance from administration, is something along the lines of, we, let's approve the, let's send the bylaw change to the city council on the storage tanks. And then let's sit down with the appropriate people and, and figure out what like and do a full review on all the fireworks regulations right now because i feel like we've added to it with the interest of safety we haven't had any safety issues and so all we've done is add cost and complication and that might be an unfair oversimplification and so i'm happy for you to tell me that but that's how i view this right now that's how it seems like i know what some of these sellers are feeling and i'm hearing that from some of the community leagues so I feel like it's worth us getting back in, like you're doing right now with festivals and events and getting together with the right folks and saying, okay, what do we actually need to solve the safety issue? And how do we make sure we're not adding unnecessary costs to leagues and groups that just want to put on shows for their residents to come together? Yeah, if I could uh, jump in, Councillor Knack. Um, no, I, th I think those are, are great questions. The vendor permit, actually, um, you know, it's the cost uh, of, once somebody uh, decides to sell fireworks, that moves their business into a higher hazard category, which means we now have to send somebody out to inspect and ensure that um, it meets uh, the requirements uh, set out in the fire code and whatnot. So, um, you know, t today talking about, um, about that vendor permit and some of the requirements that have now been uh, removed from the fire code, and uh, created a gap and uh, us now implementing those back into the bylaw have now, um, you know, are, are, are meant to, to continue on with uh, the safety um, that, that is in place, and, which is now f fell to the municipalities. And um, I, I would uh, further add that, uh, you know, as we move forward, looking at um, how we can remove red tape, maintain safety of citizens, um, make sure that uh, we, we aren't creating barriers and we're contributing to um, the, the fireworks uh, shows and, and, and citizen well-being. Um, we're, we're committed to doing that and, and taking the feedback um, from vendors and citizens as we move forward to make sure that we get it right, but we also get it safe. Well, I'm out of time, but I'll have a motion because I think we said that a couple of years ago and, and I feel like maybe we're not there yet. So I'll, I'll work, uh, I think I've got wording, but I see Councillor Nichols on the board, so I'll come back. Well, Andrew, Andrew, what I what I want to do, and it's just a suggestion, let's, I'm prepared to move forward the parts of the bylaw uh, that have the storage tank registration and that's it. And the rest, you're going to have to, I feel that we should start from scratch on everything else, but that's what I'm prepared, Madam Clerk. And uh, Andrew, if that was your intention, you can make that motion. I can make that motion. I don't care. One of us can. But I, I think, think that's we what we're in the chat now. So I, either one of us, I'm, I'm okay with it. It's the okay. same. So, uh, yeah, I guess we can just put that motion up and then I'm, I'm prepared to, to speak to it. But uh, let's get on with our day here because I think that's how I feel anyways, if anyone else wants to add in. That's very appreciated. Um, okay, so do we have wording of that motion? I can read it in if that's okay. I think I've, I think we've got it now. The clerk said put something there. If you're okay, okay. with it, yep. sure. Uh, so it would be the Community and Public Services Committee recommend to City Council uh, that Bylaw One Nine Five Eight Zero be amended as follows. 
delete section three, delete section two A from schedule B, that bylaw 19580 as amended be given the appropriate readings. And then separately, the administration review requirements, uh, I would add in consultation with appropriate stakeholders related to fireworks and provide draft amendments to ensure safety of Edmontonians while removing barriers and costs. Yeah, that works. So who's making this motion? Uh, sure. I, I'm Andrew, can you go ahead. Sure. Yeah, Andrew, Andrew I'll, and I just want to speak to it too. So. It can yeah. be a group, Whenever. group motion. Okay, so... <laughs> Uh, go ahead, uh, yeah, Andrew, do you want to speak to this or are you? Uh, I'll just quickly close at the end. That's fine. Okay, go ahead, Councillor. With, with all due respect to the fire department and administration, this is just an overreach to me. Uh, we have not, you, you have not provided any evidence with regards to injuries, property damage, and questions to liability. I, I'm sorry, it is a bit of a stretch. I'm hearing from administration that we would be legally on the hook for operations of a, of a, of a consumer product that is sold uh, legitimately by vendors. And to be quite honest, if I think if you put in these bylaws, you're just pushing vendors outside our jurisdiction. Uh, listen, to, listen to these requirements. You're asking for them to add $5 million worth of liability for selling, selling a legal product. And you want two years of receipts uh, for, for these individuals. Okay, that may be the case, but you know what? We don't ask somebody who goes into a, who operates a bar and ask them to keep two years of receipts of who they sold a legal product to. We don't go into a, a, a gas station, at least not to my knowledge, and ask two years of receipts of who you sold cigarettes to. And they by far cause more harm than, than fireworks. And so I find this very, very difficult uh, to, uh, to, to, to even contemplate. I think we're going to send it back. And what your engagement was, I'm very curious to, because if you talk to Councilman Banga and myself, and, and uh, not to speak for your mo, uh, sorry, uh, we are hearing something very, very different, especially from our cultural communities, right? This is onerous. You're, you're killing our events unnecessarily with this incrementalism that's going on and and so i'm just saying no don't do it and uh and uh either, not even start from scratch i'm just saying this is you're creating uh, a problem where there is none and uh i do appreciate Councilor banker using his historical police knowledge to recall a 30 year old incident which is the only one that comes to his mind and so that i can uh, so I think, Councillor Knack, thank you very much for that motion. I think this is exactly what we've got to do. Got to get on with the tank stuff. Got it. Cost recovery. It's provincial regulation. Let's go. But this other this other part, I got to say, no, no. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Zadek. Thanks. Oh, just to speak to it, um, I'm very much in favor of the discussion that's happened and, and thankful to the other councillors for asking good questions. Uh, I support the approach that we're going with this. I think it's uh, very reasonable um, to, is, is it councillor Knox motion? I, I agree with that and what councillor Nichol was just saying. So I think um, it's time to move forward with um, this current direction and revisit some of the other aspects. That's all. All right, forward, not backward. Okay, so we've got uh, Councillor Knack to close. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and again, just uh, just my, my thanks to the speakers today. And and, and again, I, uh, you know, I, I think I, I'd echo some of what Councillor Nichols said, and and just to say, um, I feel like a couple of years ago when some of these changes started to come in, we had these groups flagging the concern about what could be cumulative impacts and the impact on the local events. And I recall having sat through those meetings, the council sort of voted for them with the understanding that we were going to double check, really review some of these things and go through and make sure we're not uh, actually impeding the ability for these events to go forward. And I feel like and, and so my apologies if that's happened, but I, I haven't seen it. Um, you know, even even the point around 
overtime costs. I remember hearing about that, and 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 I don't think we ever finally resolved that. We sort of approved it with a verbal commitment that no, we're not going to do that in advance. But I really think it's important for us just to have a bit of a refresh with regards to fireworks. Um, and and again, if there's truly safety issues we need to resolve, I don't think anyone here is going to say. Don't create a regulation to address a legitimate safety concern. But I'm not hearing the data to back up that requirement to, to put these things in. So I, that's why I think it's really important. And, and so just to be clear, we added, and I added it when I spoke, it was said it, but we have in consultation with appropriate stakeholders, that includes the people here on these call on this call today who have given up their time to be with us, that includes some of the community leagues directly who are doing these events. Um, I, I think we really need to understand from them that these community shows are just simple things that we want people to be able to put on as often as humanly as possible while being safe. And I can think back to the years that I was doing this, helping out on the shows in Metal Arc. Uh, and, and as mentioned, the reason we were able to do a, the, as big of a show as we could was because we had somebody who ran a company in our community who was willing to take, you know, essentially cost and and put on what was spectacular shows. Most communities couldn't do that. So I there's a disconnect right now. And, and maybe it's me, but I think we need to go back to work with all these groups who are genuinely just trying to help communities do run good shows and be safe at the same time. So um, that's, that's why I wanted to make sure we go back to this, figure this out, come back and let's, let's do a full re redraw if we need to, to help you have your safety pieces, whatever that is, make sure that ideally doesn't impact cost unless absolutely necessary to address the legitimate safety concern we're dealing with. And then everything else, let's figure out ways to just let those things go. Um, so that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Councillor Knack. Um, who knew this discussion would be so bombastic? Uh, let us now vote on this motion. Yes. We have all the votes. Let's display the vote, please. There you have it, unanimous. Okay, and uh, so that ends uh, item 6.5. Now, we've got uh, three more items uh, uh, in public and we've got one in private. It is uh, 11.35, I'm just uh, check with the committee. Would you like to hop into private if uh, administration is ready in order to manage our time? Andrew, you're pretty quick. Yeah, okay. that would be very, very quick. Then I'll move to bring uh, item 9.1 forward, and uh, we can, t and then we can move into private if, if that is okay by everybody. Yeah. Okay. Um, so vote on moving 9.1 forward, please. Yes. Apologies, Mr. Chair. It's coming right now. No problem. I was just thinking, we really do need some elevator music. We have all the votes. Okay. All right, display the vote, please. And that was carried. Okay. And uh, so. Um, Councillor Nichol, do you want to uh, move that we move into private? Yes, sir. So moved. Okay. And uh, so that is uh, according to Section 16, Disclosure Harmful to Business Interests of a Third Party. Okay. So please vote. We have all the votes. Okay, display the vote, please. And that is carried. Okay, we will move into private, uh, deal with that business, come out, uh, I would assume, before lunch, and then uh, proceed with our day. So.
We have time specific at 1.30 if it's in public.
We're back in public. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Neck, did you, have, did you have a motion? Uh, yes, I can just remove the recommendation as written in the report. Okay. Um, I don't think there's any discussion, so please vote. We have all the votes. Display the vote, please. And that is carried unanimously. Okay, so uh, we have a choice. We can break a little early and uh, come back early, or we can uh, hear the presentation from administration on item 6123, but they, that presentation may be longer than 15 minutes, so I'll check in with administration. Let's take an early lunch, Aaron, because I think you're right. The presentations are going to be longer. Yeah, okay. Okay, so let's make sure that we're here back promptly at 1.30, and I will endeavor not to be here at 1.31. All Thank right. you. Thank you. I don't want to have to call the meeting to order, Aaron. <laughs> Understood. I can see.
roll call in a little under a minute. And welcome back to the March 24th, 2021 edition of the Community and Public Services Committee. I will begin with a roll call. Councillor Nickel. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Councillor Zadek. Good afternoon. Hello, hello. And Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Good to see you. All right. We also have, uh, I see Ben Henderson. I am uh, still here. A wonderful counselor. Uh, speaking of wonderful counselors, we've got uh, Councillor Esslinger on the line. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good to see you. Um, I hope it's appropriate that I mention I really like your haircut. Uh, and I see we've got Councillor Hamilton. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. And Councillor McKean. You need not comment on my haircut. It's uh, it's precise. And Councillor Katerina. Is on the line and will surely be joining us soon. Okay, so uh, here we go. Uh, we did some great work this morning. Um, out with a bang. And here we go now onto item 6.1. And I believe administration uh, does have a presentation after which we will hear from any speakers. I understand we have one speaker who came in. Should we actually move, like, let me just double check. Do we have that speak, uh, a speaker signed up for these? For this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think we have a 1.30 time specific, do we not? Oh, you are so right. You're wrong. Councillor Nickel, thank you for being on top of things. I really appreciate no it. No worries. No worries. It's super helpful when people point out things in the meeting. I really appreciate that. Okay, so um, we will go to item 7.1. But before we do that, just as a matter of order, uh, I believe we may have a speaker who signed up to speak for item 6.1, 2, and 3 cross-referenced, and we should probably enter that in if that is the case, clerks. That is correct. We do have one, one speaker who is registered for 6-1. Okay, and I believe that is Paige Gorsak, is that correct? Correct. Okay, so if anyone would move uh, to add her to the list. I move. Okay, please vote. Yes. We have all and, the votes. Okay, support the vote please. Thank you, that is carried. And now we can move on to item 7.1. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I'll start off by just letting committee know who, who is here for this uh, for this item. From our uh, city administration, uh, we have Jackie Ford, branch manager branch manager of our social development area. With David Aiken, branch manager, community standards and, and neighborhoods. Um, from city operations, Gord Seabrook, DCM. Uh, Carrie Houghton, McDonald, uh, BM of ETS, as you're well aware. And Brian Simpson, uh, branch manager of uh, Parks and Road Services. And importantly on this item, we have our colleagues from Edmonton Police Service, uh, Deputy Chief Al Murphy, uh, Inspector Angela Kemp, and Superintendent Shauna Grimes. So to the presentation now. Um, on February 17th, administration was directed by council to provide information on our extreme weather protocols, which includes how city employees are expected to work with Edmontonians experiencing homelessness and other situations that put them at risk of the cold weather. On to the next slide then. Uh, the city, in consultation with Homeward Trust and community partners, work together to determine when it's appropriate to activate our city's extreme weather response. Administration most recently activated the extreme weather response for nearly a two-week period in early February. 
The response was activated due to cold weather and shelter capacity conditions being met within Council City Policy C620 titled Supporting Vulnerable People During Extreme Weather Conditions. Our actions during the response are guided by principles embedded in this pol policy. And very briefly to speak to those principles, they speak to, we apply safety first. We are connected and we are integrated. We ensure people are treated with dignity. We direct efforts to housing. And finally, we strive to be efficient and effective, learning from past years and best practices. Before a winter emergency response is going to be activated, we communicate the intent 48 to 72 hours before activation. This is communicated primarily through a customized email distribution to social serving agencies, internal to our city, and EPS communication, and public service announcements. The announcement was of the activation this year was widely published in local media and shared on social media. The same process is followed with the notification at the end of the winter emergency response. Individuals who may be accessing the shelter system or are experiencing homelessness typically learn of the scheduling of the response directly through interactions with other members of their community, uh, could be or from staff at shelters or outreach workers or during cold weather checks with our peace officers and members of EPS. Uh, next slide. Planning for this year's winter emergency response was unlike any other that administration has undertaken as we navigated multiple emergencies. With COVID-19, as we talked, the extreme cold and an opioid crisis. Homer Trust and the administration did develop multiple contingencies based on outbreak status at different locations, how to handle symptomatic individuals, and ensure the right tools of like naloxone and Narcan were present for frontline staff undertaking wellness checks. With all of these external factors, our planning for the potential response changed on a week to week basis and sometimes even on a day to day basis. The measures put in place during this year's activation included the addition of approximately 160 temporary shelter beds to the system. The additional spaces provided during the nearly, nearly two week period created a system of shelters where some of the shelters were in fact full overnight, but at all times the shelter system had capacity during the day and overnight. The shelter spaces were complemented by up to four dedicated ETS overnight buses traveling between emergency shelters and high demand transit centers, an enforcement pause which included transit peace officers refraining from issuing bylaw tickets to those who were using transit without paid fares in order to stay warm and a pause in removing illegal encampments. Through the nearly two week period, there were in fact thousands of positive interactions between shelter staff, crisis diversion and outreach teams, our administration and EPS as individuals and organizations did come together to ensure those experiencing homelessness had a safe and warm place to sleep during that extreme cold period. However, on the final weekend of the extreme weather response, social media posts circulated regarding police responses to two separate events. One involved removing an encampment on public land near Hope Mission, and the other involved removing vulnerable individuals at an LRT station for public health violations. So now to get to the specifics on the next slide. On February 13, Hope Mission contacted police to check on the well-being of people sheltering in an encampment outside their facility. EPS contacted city administration to remove the encampment and the individuals affected accessed the support resources of Hope Mission for continued shelter. The decision to remove the encampment by EPS was completed in the interest of safety for the affected individuals. The removal of the encampment near Hope Mission occurred outside the formal encampment response team process. 
The encampment response team is a collective of administration and social agency individuals who meet to prioritize, plan, and then resource the removal of encampments with wraparound services. Since that event, administration and EPS have realigned operating procedures, ensuring a single source referral occurs from EPS to the encampment response team. This encampment response team will then evaluate, including a review of externalities like COVID-19 or extreme weather, and then make a decision to trigger a camp removal. That was the first, in that was the first instance. The second event occurred actually the next day on February 14th, in which vulnerable individuals were, were removed from an LRT station. As council is aware, uh, the city formally did operate LRT stations in past winter emergency responses as a temporary shelter. Since the approval of policy C620 in 2019, the LRT station is no longer used as part of this response as they really do not have uh, adequate washrooms and temperatures still remain quite cold. However, some individuals do choose to temporarily seek respite from the cold at these locations. During the extreme weather response, Peace officers will increase patrols in the transit system to conduct wellness checks on individuals. They'll assist with referrals to shelters and the winter emergency bus and act when enforcement is necessary. Not just during winter emergency, but at all times, peace officer interactions begin with respectful conversation, empathy, and offering connections to services instead of formal sanctions like ticketing or removal from the LRT system. However, individuals will be asked to leave the premises at scheduled closure times and as a last step if they are creating a disturbance or disorder. When individuals are asked to leave a transit station, the transfer of individuals to shelter is coordinated with transportation options including a REACH 24-7 crisis diversion and the dedicated overnight ETS bus during winter emergency. And on board each of the EETS buses this February was a team of social agency workers and peace officers. The peace officers were in constant contact with ETS control center who were monitoring and coordinating other officers in the field who may be looking for a referral. With this coordinated approach, individuals may then choose to use the transportation options to access available shelters. However, it's not uncommon for some individuals to refuse transportation to a shelter and in those cases referral and transfer efforts in conjunction with the social agency workers are made to the furthest extent possible. So during this latest extreme weather response, peace officers did request additional EPS assistance in patrolling transit centers as a number of stations were seeing large amounts of disorder and peace officers were actually shorthanded from also providing service on the overnight shuttle buses. Edmonton police and peace officers coordinated their efforts in transit stations for the duration of the winter emergency response. And then specifically on the 14th of February, EPS members were patrolling the downtown LRT stations and did remove individuals for public health violations. This event, I think as council's aware, is currently under further investigation by Edmonton Police Service. And then on the next slide. Uh, at the conclusion of every winter emergency response, a formal debriefing process is undertaken to evaluate what worked well and what could be improved on. This year's response was seen as trying and challenging within the parameters of COVID-19, but also seen largely as successful based on the number of trips provided by ETS overnight bus and the capacity of the system was maintained. But there were two important learnings from this year. From this year. Number one, ensuring key points of information between agencies are clearly communicated. And secondly, ensuring coordination and integration of practices between different organizations. And as we know, our weather is extremely unpredictable and so actions were immediately undertaken in case another winter emergency response was needed this winter. Directly coming out of this year's winter emergency response, EPS and administration have developed and have implement, implemented a new standard operating procedure for transit safety and security 
as well as revisions to our coordinated encampment response. Homer Trust is also using the experience to enhance transportation options with their partner agencies. I'd like to now pass it over to Inspector Angela Kemp of EPS to discuss improvements on our coordination and collaboration efforts. So over to EPS. Thank you, Rob. My name is Inspector Angela Kemp and I lead the Crime Suppression Branch. I'm here today with Deputy Chief Murphy and Superintendent Grimes representing the Empton Police Service. The Empton Police Service is committed to creating collaborative solutions to increase public safety, not only within our transit system, but throughout the city of Edmonton. The partnerships that we are building with the Empton Transit Service, the City of Empton Administration and Community Resource Agencies will create solutions to address the concerns of the citizens of Edmonton, including the vulnerable. The ongoing joint problem solving initiatives that will be implemented to address concerning behavior with a human centered approach focusing on community engagement and education. This intervention will create a reduction in criminality and as well allow for an increase in pro-social behavior within our transit locations. It is our goal to ensure the continued support of transit safety initiatives and to partner with out outreach agencies for the best possible conclusions. In addition, the Edmonton Police Service in conjunction with the City of Edmonton have developed processes to ensure alignment of police and peace officer engagement to best address encampment concerns while understanding the complex needs of Edmonton's most vulnerable population. We thank the committee for this opportunity to contribute to these problem solving initiatives and continue to work for the betterment of Edmonton. Uh, thanks, Angela. So just to wrap up then, while the two events we described in our presentation this afternoon are clearly very troubling, and as I hope we have communicated, communicated to committee this afternoon, we will do better. But I do want to close with an acknowledgement and thank you to the community partner organizations that ramped up their service, service offering during the winter emergency response. Their efforts did not go unnoticed. I know many of them have been working above and beyond since the pandemic started but I do hope they can pause for a moment, reflect and take some pride in the role they played in keeping our fellow Edmontonians safe and warm during the extreme cold. So this concludes our, our uh, formal presentation. Mr. Chair, we are happy to take, uh, take questions. Thank you very much for that. Um, I see that uh, we have uh, Councillor McKean on the board. However, this was uh, Mayor Iveson's inquiry, so I'll just check in. Go, go ahead, Councillor McKean. I'm just organizing my questions here, so. Okay. Go Thank ahead. you, uh, if you don't mind, Mr. Chair, then. Um, so I've been struck by, uh, I guess, a lot of information that has come to my office over the last few months and, and, and since the incident of February 14th, I think you said it was. Um, I personally, as the Councillor representing downtown, I'm getting constant emails from businesses, but also residents downtown who have had uh, what they describe as very scary incidents. And I, I, I don't think I have to uh, defend my record on, on advocating for the homeless, but we have a complex issue. So I just, I guess I wanted to say that from the very start. I understand the police are getting pulled every which way in every direction on this and our peace officers too. Um, so I don't, I guess the question I have, because we know that some people get banned from shelters. Uh, let me start with that group of people. There are homeless people who get banned from shelters. And if it's cold or whether it's or not, it would seem to me then we have no answer for that particular subpopulation. Am I right? I don't, I, like, I'll start with the police, if you don't mind. What would you do in that situation if you had somebody that had been banned from a shelter and was maybe um, causing some I'll use the word disturbance in a in an LRT station or something. What would be your options? Uh, thank you, Scott. From an Empton Police Service perspective, um, during the cold weather response, if they are banned, 
um, from the shelters. Bans are lifted during those times. And every effort is made to take them to another shelter um, for servicing so they can find shelter in those aspects. Um, from my experience over this past winter response, there's always been a shelter that's been willing to assist in those circumstances. Okay, good. So we're not left. They're not left high and dry. Um, can you comment at all on the uh, complexity of this situation for peace officers and police officers when we, you know, we want a compassionate response. Obviously, everybody does. And when it's really cold out, there's there's risk to public health. But are you also getting pulled by the public on questions about um, public safety and social disorder? Uh, you're correct. There's definitely situations that are counterintuitive. We have some public uh, residents who are very concerned about encampments in their areas. And we also have the issues of the social disorder. But more importantly, we also have to remember that the vulnerable population needs the resources and the outreach. Um, what would help um, all these situations is having more access to outreach agencies working 24-7 would really be a benefit to help these situations that you're speaking of. So there would be situations, Angela, then where it's not really a matter for the police or peace officers, but and but we don't have the outreach teams available right then and there to respond. Is that am I hearing that right? Uh, in some situations, that's correct, sir. Yeah. So the yeah, and and I know that our twenty four seven outreach is pretty good, but I've called it myself and been told it was going to be quite a wait. So that system may be overrun uh, as well. So I guess my point I wanted to make is first of all, and I may have further questions to come around on is I just want the Edmonton police service to know that I understand you're getting pulled in at least two different directions here, um, um, by this issue. And, and I don't know what the answer is. Um, but I understand that you, um, you, <laughs> you face public criticism at times when maybe, you're fulfilling the wishes of the downtown, of a downtown business or a downtown resident. And, and I think in a lot of cases, just try, trying to do right by the world. But I just wanted to get that on the record for you guys. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, Mayor Iveson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Appreciate the report. Uh, obviously, we've come a long way from several years ago when the LRT stations were the best we could do to the point now where uh, we see many different ways to meet people's needs um, uh, and get them to safer places and maintain safety and order uh, on the transit system in a better way, further to yesterday's discussion, actually, a committee. So, uh, but uh, maybe just starting chronologically, I guess, with the... Um, the incident on February 13th with the decampment or the, I guess the non-standard decampment um, uh, uh, next to Hope Mission um, that I understand started as a welfare check. But so in, in that case, um, if I understand correctly, uh, that was a police response and not, not a peace officer, park ranger, encampment response team response. Uh, that's correct, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Now, and and the note is that administration and EPS have made adjustments to improve coordination in responding to complaints of encampments on public land. Um, what is tangibly? What does that mean? What are the adjustments that have been made uh, in order to make sure that the integrated response comes forward? Maybe that's a EPS response, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Rob, I can take that question. So the Hope Mission um, request for encampment removal was completed by the Hope Mission asking for assistance. Um, there were uh, circumstances surrounding that on the welfare checks of those individuals, and both individuals from that camp were um, given resources from Hope Mission. Uh, the cleanup was done for the public safety issues to make sure that no others were um, taking over that camp in that cold weather to make sure that they all had access to whole mission resources. In relation to the encampment procedures, 
We have aligned procedures with our city operations and city administration to ensure that there's a singular contact from EPS through the 311 app or to the um, uh, Troy Carriers area with the city of uh, Edmonton to ensure that all the encampment process for cleanup and outreach work is um, done in a manner that it's recorded and, uh, and acceptable. So I'll, I'll leave aside the irony that they were camped in extreme weather next to the shelter and that it was the shelter that, that uh, asked for them to be checked on. Uh, I, I'm going to presume, I'm going to give a benefit of the doubt uh, out, of, out of compassion. Because um, that's a separate issue that we've discussed around shelter standards previously. So I'll leave that aside. But just a, a further question, since it still comes up, and it came up also around social media uh, during uh, during the um, the cold weather period, uh, persistent concerns about tent slashing and the suggestion that the the city and removing uh, encampments is engaged in. Uh, tent slashing, and I just want to ask again for the record that 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 is not our practice to destroy property or compromise shelters for people in the course of uh, decampment. That's absolutely correct, Mr. Mayor, and, and that was certainly a, a a point of of input we got last summer as well. And and we looked internally, looked at our protocols, and looked at our approaches, and nowhere could we unearth any kind of any kind of to validate that that input we were getting because we certainly and the heard, expectations we certainly, are quite clear in our training of of our staff that that that's not acceptable no ab absolutely so we we don't know how that got got legs but it was very concerning to us and we tried to unturn every rock we could but could not come up with any kind of validity i mean i we don't argue that it didn't, wasn't happening but certainly not certainly not from uh from city from city staff at all, at all. Okay, and and we've been tagged with that many times, and and um, and that's frustrating because because I've heard that answer before, um, and yet I still have to ask. So I, I take that answer at face value. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, lastly, I guess I I really appreciate the note about the thirteen hundred trips on the buses that helped people proactively get to where they needed to go. I think that worked really well. Um, and having peace officers and social agencies embedded there, I think, is part of that success. Is that a model further to discussion at committee yesterday that would be helpful embedded within the LRT stations to help route people to the right destinations? Mr. Mayor, we were just on a call over, over the lunch hour with colleagues from across the corporation on that whole concept of, of, of a layered approach where you have, you know, EPS, our, our peace officers, outreach workers, um, perhaps private security, all, all, all layered into the same system. So that is certainly, um, I think, the the uh, the next evolution of our of our approach in dealing with some some of these challenges for sure. And and, to, and it's multi agency as well. But but it seems like you know from a best practice point of view and and what we've been talking about internally as a, as a way to go. So putting those outreach workers on on ETS. Um, was was quite effective is the input we, we we received and how do we cascade that then into other other parts of our operation if you will thanks I'm out of time okay uh, I'm just getting word that uh, we do have someone who has requested to speak but uh, we missed uh, getting to them so I'm just wondering uh, well, I will just make the motion. It's pretty simple. Uh, we have uh, Robert Hool who would like to speak to this item. Uh, so if there are any objections, I mean, we can put it to a vote. But I, I'll just look for objections. Oh, seeing none. Okay. Thank you. All right. And thank you, uh, Mayor Iveson. Uh So since we do have a request to speak and there were uh, no objections. Um, that's a matter of order. We would actually go to the speaker at this point, ask questions, then return to administration. Um, if, are there any objections to following the, the proper order? No, go, let the speaker go, Aaron. 
Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, I believe we're just getting the speaker on, um, on the call right now. They were waiting. Their request had come in after the item had started, so we were just making those arrangements. So you might want to go to your next speaker and we can make sure that they're connected. Oh, I see. Okay, well, if that's all the same, then I believe that uh, Councillor Nickel was next with questions from uh, administration. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Paquette. Okay, Mr. Smythe, let's, you got to talk me through this a little bit, uh, how it starts and how it finishes. Okay, Mr. Smythe? So give me the cold uh, response definition. What, under what conditions do we flip the trigger? Uh, there's, uh, there's two triggers that are looked at by the team. Uh, one is capacity in the shelter system, and the second is, is temperature. And it's not an exact science, but those two factors will weigh in, and then our team will um, determine if, if our spo response has to be uh, triggered. Okay, so let, let's separate both of those, Mr. Smythe. First of all, it has to be of a certain temperature or weather condition. What are those variables that they consider? Just so I understand this clearly. Maybe I'll ask Ms. Ford to weigh in. Jackie, do you have a little bit of more detail on that? Uh, uh, yes, thank you. So around the, uh, the weather, we are also look, have to remember this is extreme heat or cold or extreme weather. So okay. the, the temperature is one. The duration of how long that, uh, that, ex that extreme weather could happen, if it's one day or two maybe two, depending on the conditions, that might not trigger it, but it's length and it's, at, and it's temperature. Oh, good. I, I'm glad you mentioned the heat one because I was, I was always thinking cold. So I think that's, that's an important thing to keep in the back of the head. So what is it? Minus 20, minus 15, um, but speaking of temperature, not talking about uh, wind, is it a wind chill factor? I just explain to me the mechanic of the weather call. It is actually, we, work, we rely on uh, uh, Environment Canada, but a weather warning of some sort. So it may be extreme cold, it may be extreme heat. Um, but it, so it is, again, it's not an exact science because if, if there is room in the shelters, that may or may not trigger it. But it, in, a weather warning would have to be issued. Okay, I, I just, I'm asking this question because I just want crystal clarity. Uh, and I always find it, it, this comment about when it's weather, um, well, we got to be crystal clear, do we not? Like if it's minus 20, we're going to flip the switch. If it's minus, you know, um, because we have to have some kind of metric here because isn't that, won't that cause problems for you if, when you make the call? That's why I'm kind of a little concerned about, you know, just the basic measure of when we, when we let's talk about extreme cold, for example. Right, um, minus ten is not minus twenty, but the wind chill could be minus twenty. Is is that the metric? Well, the, if the weather warning is issued, that would be the that would be the first trigger. Again, uh, okay, time. Uh, the other part of that would be the fact that again, it there is no precise point that I can say that there's a checkbox here, here, here. We look at all the conditions, the number of people who are homeless at the time, the number of shelter beds available, the weather warning, and we do give 72 hours notice, so it's or 48 to 72 hours notice, so that all of the shelters and the services, uh, the crisis, uh, mobile crisis center, all have the chance to get ready for the weather that we see coming down. Correct. Okay. I understand that, but I'm just starting with a basic trigger. Then, then we enter the question of, of, of capacity. Uh, that's a different question altogether. So when the weather trigger goes, we flip the switch because we've got the weather warning. We have kind of two kind of exposures, do we not? We have an individual, and then we have an issue of whether they're in a, a place or a tent or a structure of some kind where they could be at risk. Yes? That's correct. And in terms of the shelter capacity, uh, we're looking at above 90% capacity. So that okay. would... Yeah, for sure. For sure. I have a question that, that goes to this. What, okay, what the person that you see out there, the weather warning has been, uh, you know, it's about our responsibility. So let's say we go to that individual on the street and we say, we got to get you inside. That's one process. Then the second process can be asked is, what if they don't want to go? What do we do in that situation and where do our responsibilities and kind of, do we force them to go? I mean, 
for their own good. What, what do we do in that instance? Councillor Nicol, we have staff from uh, Legal Services here. Nancy, maybe you could weigh in on like how far we can we can move down the continuum that Councillor Nichols is talking about. It, it would be helpful for me at least. Happy to, Mr. Smythe. Um, so what I would say there is absolutely we're going to respect an individual's choice as long as they have the capacity to make that choice. So if they're in a state where they can't make a choice for themselves, we will absolutely take the steps that any human would need to take in that case. But otherwise, it is their choice, and we will respect that. So, oh, I'm out of time. Thank you, Councillor Nicol. Uh, we have uh, Councillor Banga next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my first question is uh, to EPS there. Uh, without commenting on uh, on that uh, current situation that's under investigation, could you be able to tell me uh, if a private or public uh, body calls you to uh, a call saying that there are some unknown individuals uh, uh, at their property and uh, they need them removed? What is uh, the normal protocol for uh, Edmonton Police Service? That's a complicated question because it all depends on the type of property, if it's private or public property. Um, in relation to a private property complaint, the police would attend in a, a standby, standby situation where they could have the municipal enforcement officers remove the camp, and then we would stand by in that event. Um, it'd also be complicated by the fact if EPS has agent status at those locations, and then they would be able to have those removals occur. The most important part I'd like to draw your attention to is the fact that we will make every effort to have these individuals be linked with resources, and that would either be calling our 24-7 or 211, or even having our own EPS members transport um, these individuals to shelters. Um, understanding from the last comments, it all is voluntarily, and we are unable to detain people to take them to shelters unless they wish to go. Okay, and what happened to a simple check on welfare call? Let's say somebody's camped in the in the river valley there is a process that the city of edmonton does entail for the encampment strategy rob i'm not sure if you want to go over the process but for eps if we do locate an encampment we would then be calling 311 and our city partners um, outreach workers would attend the encampment and offer resources um, from then they would then be scheduled removal with our city operations team Maybe Mr. Aiken can elaborate on that, Councillor? Sure. So, so Councillor, as you know, the, the complaints come generally through 311 to our uh, park uh, park ranges. Uh, we do an inspection of the, the campsite, and there's uh, two decision trees. Uh, one, if it's abandoned, then we work with our city operations folks to get it cleaned up. Uh, if it is um, occupied, then there's a number of different avenues that we go down to uh, get the necessary support. Uh, we advise uh, some of the local uh, support agencies that we have a, a camp that is uh, inhabited, and then we go through a process of trying to get them the necessary supports that they need. We do an evaluation of uh, the safety and health risk, not only to the individuals, but to the surrounding communities, and then we take the steps to try to find them um, other locations uh, or housing, um, and then also affect that cleanup. So we, that, that process is documented. We have a number of steps and considerations, and that does change during our extreme weather protocols. Uh, also during COVID, uh, also uh, in relation to um, other public amenities and residential areas. And so we, we consider all of those things in our approach. So Mr. Smythe, um, um, my first uh, question to you is, uh, uh, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, there are 58 unique users. What do you mean to say by that? Councilor, I'm just looking through my notes. I don't... I'm 
not seeing that reference. Uh, and it says that tip now reported 58 unique users. Okay, uh, yes, I see it on the slide there. That's right. Um, that was during that was during our extreme weather response. I mean, during the cold weather, um, that facility accommodated up to 350 people. Those were individuals that that may not have been staying there, but during the extreme weather response, uh, they they were uh, transported or made their own way to that facility as as to basically to get out of the extreme weather, extreme cold. Okay. Uh, my time's up. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Um, I'll just check in to see if our speaker is ready. Yes, I believe they're on the meet now. Okay. So um, why don't we just hear from our speaker and then we can move to second round of questions. So go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, everyone, and thank you to the clerk for um, for short notice and getting me uh, squeezed into the meeting. Uh, Rob Holden, Sikasun, Wapsisipi, Tando, Chania. Nice to see everyone, uh, all the familiar faces. My name is Rob Hull. I'm from Swan River First Nation. I am uh, appearing on my behalf. I do sit on the Community Safety Wellbeing Task Force, but I'm here in my own volition uh, without prejudice to the task force, um, just because I was kind of watching the discussion, listening to the discussion, reading the reports um, first and foremost, um, and and felt compelled to want to register to speak because um, I am, um, going, I'm going to be frank, I'm appalled by the content of the reports. I am appalled by the, the approach of administration to this issue and the conversation that's happened to date. Um, I think it misses the point by a great deal that that we're trying to water down and look at the broader overview of what happened on those two days without actually addressing the issues of why it happened, um, the ramifications of, of why it happened, and the overall just lack of compassion and empathy from people who responded to some of these calls or just acted under their own authority to remove people from spaces and places that um, they're used to being removed from. Um, I find it appalling that the report is written in a way that speaks to disorder and um, threats of violence and things like that. And we all know that the circumstances around the 13th and the 14th had no undercurrents of, of disturbance or threats of violence uh, for those events, um, especially the one in the LRT. They were not being violent or being belligerent or causing social disorder. They were being served by a community-based organization that has sprung up due to the lack of um, government and, and provincial and federal um, intervention into the housing crisis. Um, and they were just trying to eat their food. And again, if we look back at the uh, health orders of the time, um, you, were, you were kind of... Uh, required to wear a mask indoors for, for gatherings and for interactions, but um, there are um, concessions for people who are eating, for people who are, are doing other kind of activities, um, people who are not able to wear a mask all the time due to health restrictions and whatever else. So again, we, we're getting kind of the runaround in why people were intervening. We're getting the runaround around uh, what happens to the people and the victims and like I said at the beginning, the reports read very much like the victims of these actions are the perpetrators and that they're part of a larger issue at hand around social disorder. And I understand shopkeepers and people like that have complaints and they have to keep their businesses um, running and try to be uh, operating in any way, shape that they can. But again, we're missing the humanity of the people who were directly affected by this we're missing any kind of direct follow-up. And I think the whole intention of, of the mayor's push to have this conversation happen again and in more of an elongated fashion is that um, it wasn't paid the attention that it had been at the time. And it, and it, it, it I'm baffled by the, uh, the conversation and very emotional um, if it's not coming off as such 
um, at, at the conversations that we're having today, because I don't see anything in the report that says that this will never happen again. Um, I see a lot of what? deflection. I see a lot of uh, victim blaming, and I'm more than happy here to appear on behalf of those uh, that are not available to speak to this because they are the victims of these actions and um, and how the system and our systems right now, when we're trying to do better, continually fail um, to address the issues at hand and to put them plain on their face so that we can have a real frank conversation on why uh, people, and especially Indigenous people, continue to be victimized in all of these fashions and structures and systems and policies and and no one really addressing the root cause and the issue. And um, it just leads to ongoing frustration from people like myself who are trying to make change um, and seeing things happen in parallel that contradict that push for change. So I'm happy to be here to speak to it. Um, and I also have a personal connection to the story um, because, and I shared this at the task force, my family, uh, some of the meals that were being handed out that weekend were created by my kids. Um, they put love and passion into those meals and to have the police reportedly throw stuff in the garbage, to be um, very direct in, in just vile actions. I think it, it, it's affected my family personally because we were connected to it. And, and um, happy to be here, happy to speak, happy to have the time to express those concerns and that... Um, frustration and happy to field any questions from council. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hulo. I believe that Councilor McKean may have a question for you. Yeah, Rob, thanks. Thanks for showing up and thanks for your passion. Uh, understandable, especially with your family connections. What, what would, um, and I'm really interested in this because it seems like um, we may not have the nuanced systems that we need in place and what would you suggest um it you know i think if maybe we need more outreach teams to be responding to this people with you know either lived experience or knowledge of um of the issues that are behind homelessness that sort of thing what 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 would if you could give us a recommendation today what would it be i'm frustrated too and, you know, and I keep saying in my writing and my comments that homelessness creates conflict and I'm tired of the conflict. Uh, and um, and I, I just think we need to find more nuanced systems to deal with these, these situations, which are in the midst of a pandemic are not ideal either. But please tell me what 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 would you what would be your advice to us? I think, uh, thank you for the question, Scott. Um, I always like to remind people that um, before 1492, no one was homeless. Homelessness did not exist. Um, people were free to go and live how they wanted, wherever they were, and that the intrusion of civilization has pushed people to becoming housed and unhoused and homeless versus home. Um, so there needs to be a thoughtful recognition of that, a regrounding of people's priorities, and a, a, a reimagining of, of the way the current system runs, and that includes police, and that includes the, the downtown service industry that's been created. Um, all of that needs to be revision, revisioned and re-explored because when you keep reinvesting into a system that does not work, Without substantial foundational change, the same problems are going to keep cropping up. And I think that we're seeing just an example of that. And if people don't want to go to the shelter, I think um, our, your lawyer, Nancy, was pretty clear that if they don't want to go, you can't force them to go. So why can't they just be where they want to be? And the problem is that sometimes our our push to want to help is actually hindering that help and actually putting people in more precarious positions. Um, for me, I think it needs a re-envisioning of, of council and other authorities stretching their powers and really pushing the envelope on their powers and, um, 
educating people on what the rules are. And if you can eat inside without a mask on, then people should be able to eat inside without a mask on. And, and I don't understand how people can be removed from transit centers and whatever else uh, for not wearing a mask while eating. And it, again, there's inconsistency in the rules. There's inconsistency in the way that if things are being enforced. And we knew um, at the very beginning of this whole pandemic and once we started talking about health orders and things like that, that there was going to be a disproportionate amount of enforcement and other things happening because that's the way that the systems and people within the systems are used to doing their regular business. So without strict controls on hampering them from doing that, they will use their best discretion and whatever else, which may be biased and skewed and what and whatnot. But that's just the way that they've always done it. And I think that's evidence in some of the responses we've seen from leadership on the police were just doing their jobs and, and that's fine. You can just do your job, but do you have to like, can't you have compassion and empathy for a, a moment and connect on a human level and say, maybe we won't pack up their stuff and throw it out. Maybe we'll just let them eat their sandwich and they can be on their way. That should be part of the discretion as well. Yeah, no, I hear you on that. And I think this is the, you know, the whole struggle that we're working through. Um, and the task force will be bringing back some, hopefully some ideas for us to further chew on. Um, my frustration, and you might not share it, but um, I represent a part of town where a lot of conflict is playing out. And some of it is things like young women um, who live or work downtown being scared out of their minds by... Um, you know, and not just by the sight of a homeless person, but an interaction that really scared them. So I struggle, you know, I struggle to figure out what, what we do about those situations. Obviously, we want everybody safe and everybody to feel safe. And so we get struck in these constant conflicts between different uh, parts of our society and wanting a compassionate response for the homeless. But I also wonder if in doing that, we also have to recognize that there might be some in that big population uh, who may also be um, causing, maybe being violent towards their own, if you will, their own population. That there might be people within the homeless population that we need to protect the homeless population from as well. Any thoughts on that? I don't. I don't uh, disagree with that. I, I. There are people in the um, in any population that have uh, disorders and have uh, substance abuse issues, and, yeah. and things like that. The problem is that the stigma and the normalcy that's been appropriated towards different sectors of our society that is the real issue. There are um, very fantastic, very prolific, very successful addicts that. Um, operate within the downtown core as well, but live and work in high-rise towers, and they do not face the same kind of societal stigma and discrimination as the people on the ground who have been struggling with some of these things that they did not cause themselves um, for many, many years. And I think that's also part of the conversation that needs to take place. And um, also, I can understand people who have fear and and reaction to lived experiences and interactions and events that have impacted them. But for many out there, it, that is not the case. And they are going off of back of stereotypes and anecdotal information that they hear. And that in and of itself is racist and, and discriminatory because you cannot prejudge someone by the, by the way they look, by their lived experience by how they may be carrying on themselves that day because you don't know what their story is. And, and that's where the whole compassion and empathy part comes in. And that's what I think Edmontonians need as a whole is more compassion and empathy and, and understanding. And I've been in a lot of these conversations, um, working for the city and without with, and not for the city. And um, a lot of work still needs to be done in Canada in general. Thanks, Robin. Addictions Friday, if you want to come to committee. We'll be dealing with that then. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McKean. Uh, Mayor Iverson. 
Thanks, Mr. Hool. Um, always appreciate your thoughtful take on these tough questions. Um, and but but the clarity on on the moral side of it in terms of empathy and compassion. Um, and so, I, but I I take your point about gaps in the system um, leading to to these outcomes where um, this is this is where this is one of the last public spaces that isn't outside when it's very, very cold where people can be and then to be trespassed. Um, and we're going to be talking about this in the next agenda item. So I think you should stick around for this, the next item too. Um, but really in, in the context of this report, it's the gaps in the systems. Um, so I don't know if you had a chance to hear about the part with um, the deployment of, of services starting from compassion and empathy as, as you advised. Uh, on the buses that are trying to, um, and I, I heard what you said too, uh, listen very carefully to the point about not everybody wants to take up the services, you can't force them to, but um, I guess the question is, is there is there an example you're aware of where some, where a place is doing this well that we should be looking to for inspiration for starters? Well, I think every community deals with unhoused people um, and these kind of issues around safety differently. There are a lot of different municipalities tackling these issues. Um, we've looked at and examined um, instances in the United States around crisis diversion facilities that operate 24 seven that do not have a closed door policy that is always open, that is integrated with emergency services that um, if a person doesn't want to go to a shelter because of the chance of um, ongoing trauma due to um, either affiliations or the way that they do business, um, then they have a facility that's non-denominational that has staff on salary and has on staff on the clock that can provide mental health services that can do crisis intervention. We recognize the work, I recognize the work of PACT and, and some of the crisis diversion teams downtown, but Again, we've seen through the call numbers and through the distribution of work of the police service and others that they're not answering all the calls that they can and they're stretched thin as it is. So um, so how do we bolster some of those services? There are lots of examples in the South. There's been a fantastic report by the Ventures, Venture, um, the name escapes me, but it's around the establishment of a crisis diversion facility. There's one in Seattle, there's one in in the Texas area, they work in hand in hand. Some of them work hand in hand with the universities um, to really push that need for a 24 seven response outside of normal hours that can handle the workload that is required. Um, and and I know that we're doing the best that we can, but again, um, we're in an instance here and at time when we can do basically whatever whatever we want. The world's been turned on its head with COVID-19 and people are reimagining new ways to work and new ways to budget, new ways to spend money. And money is appearing out of nowhere for some of these things. Um, but yet some of our most vulnerable people continue to be left behind. And I think we're in a moment here, like the Roaring Twenties, where we have a real chance to change uh, things for the better. And it takes people doing bold things and bold desires and and bold decisions and, and wanting to take that initiative. And it's it's nice to want to take an incremental approach and to get people housed and things like that. But the reality is some people can't be housed. Some people through trauma, through colonization, through uh, mistreatment by the systems and the structures and the policing industry and things like that do not have the capability to be housed. So how do we transition them into a a safer place other than the street where they can receive the services that they need. Um, because housing first, other models of like that fit a certain demographic of, of our unhoused people. Um, but there are others that need a lot more support out there and, and may never be to the position that they can be housed independently. And we need to come to that understanding and maybe look for alternative models for them to be safe. So and that and that would bridge the either acute healthcare response at the one end or the acute criminal justice response at the other is a more community based 
a support yeah. model for crisis the, intervention. The problem is that the default for many, uh, especially Indigenous people, has been um, the criminal justice system, yeah. and that's through just uh, policy, procedure, and the Canadian legal framework, and we need to understand that that needs to change as well. And systemic racism. Yes, and I, I wouldn't call it systemic racism. It is outright racism. It may be ingrained within the system, um, but once you recognize it as systemic racism and it's everywhere, then it just becomes a conversation around racism. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Iverson. So, Rob, first of all, thanks for coming to share your thoughts with us. Um, you talked about um, root causes. And, um, you know, we're going to be continuing this uh, conversation right after this item where there will be some motions made that hopefully address some of those. But um, I'm curious about what you feel is... Uh, an, an approach that can be used that would actually solve some of these root problems from a municipal level, because we know that uh, a lot of these attitudes are ingrained in us, whether consciously or subconsciously and often subconsciously in, in, you know, the larger society. And uh, even amongst uh, the same people for on, upon whom these uh, biases are perpetuated. Um, and we also know that there is a vast ignorance of the history that led us to this point. Um, and the third aspect is that we know that people can be very cruel and feel it's justice or feel that it's action. Um, and with all of those concepts together, again, from a municipal level, from your perspective, um, what should the approach be? I think to solve a lot of these problems um, in systems and structures, especially governmental and hierarchical structures, there's been a lot of abdic abdication of authority without um, leaders and other people understanding how much actual authority that they do retain, even though they abdicate a lot of it. And, um, some of these conversations have come up um, at the task force and other things around the police commission and their authorities and their powers, the role that city council plays in, in appointing people to the commission. Um, and we have to understand that just because another authority puts the final stamp on something doesn't mean people's hands are washed of those decisions and those um, ramifications and, and things like that. So it's about, the community and everyone as a whole owning up to how we're treating each other and how we're either vindicating or invalidating one another's humanity. At a municipal level, there are things under Edmonton's control and jurisdiction um, that they could be bold and, and take a real um, forward approach on. And that includes transit systems that are under the privy, that, that includes tax breaks, tax um, tax uh, kind of caveats. I, I saw in the news, the business license thing, there, there are discounts that can be made. Um, most importantly, there are structures under the city's operations where we have a kind of band-aid solution right now in Tepinawau. Um, but anything, if anything should come out of all of this is that there, there's a need and a desire and a place for a long-standing structure like Tepinawau moving forward and and that um, how how can a municipality like Edmonton justify having two world-class convention centers that compete against one another when we've shown that one can be used for something else albeit with a with a proper uh, operating injection and things like that could be a very vital uh, facility and, and operate at tip-top without its own problems inherently in, inside of it. But again, um, it's about increasing the accountability and increasing Edmontonians' um, accountability and ownership of the way that we treat each other. And I made a point uh, very often of um, before the police came to the West, there were no police in Indigenous communities. We, we, we policed ourselves through community responsibility and respect 
Um, and those well, types of things can be re envisioned and revitalized. It's uh, interesting to note that there were also no addiction issues. <laughs> so, um, last question then. This was a little bit more of a overarching one, but even with the uh, the naming of the wards, for example, um, people politicized it. And they said, well, I've got indigenous friends who think that this is useless. This doesn't help with reconciliation. You know, we've, we, those kinds of attitudes. And so it really makes all of this into sort of a, a divisive issue when really we should be trying to come together to create solutions. So what would you say then? You have, a, you have the floor right now. What would you say uh, to the politicizing of issues that really should be um, things that touch into our humanity and make us better people rather than finding ways to um, divide in order to conquer, so to speak? Well, I think uh, people need to um, put themselves in the shoes of one another. There's a, a saying that um, in Indigenous communities, at least walk a mile in someone else's moccasins or something to that effect, that talks about really connecting with someone's lived experience with, with the situation that they live every single day to understand where they're coming from and to understand how you would feel if you were put in that situation. And I point that to all the shopkeepers downtown and, and people that are complaining to, to counselors and other people. If, if you had nowhere else to go and you were just trying to survive and have a meal for the day when you haven't eaten in three or four, um, wouldn't you want a moment of compassion or a moment of understanding so that you can finish your meal or you can have just a place to be um, for a couple of minutes while you continue to struggle um, for the rest of your day? And I don't think that that's uh, landing with a lot of people because they get caught up in, I need to make a mortgage payment or rental payment and this payment or that payment. I need to pay my taxes and whatever else. Um, and that's what's led to a lot of this misunderstanding and, and disconnection. And and I think we need, just need to connect with another on a more human level. And uh, it's nice that you bring up the ward naming because the ward naming, I think now we're seeing the ramifications of that initiative and people are sharing the names. It's in people's campaign materials. They're learning a lot about one another. Um, they're learning a lot about maybe their constituents or potential constituents and houses that they should avoid because of they might not like the name or, or like some of the material. So I think it's, it's helping raise the awareness, but again, we're not um, out of the woods. It seems like every step forward is two steps back. And at some point we need to walk together and push forward in unison and, and as a community and as a whole. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, I believe that's all the questions we have for you. Um, but feel free to stick around for the next conversation. Um, we'll now turn back to uh, um, our work with administration. I'll s quickly check to see if there are any questions. I saw that uh, Councillor Nickel was uh, sort of indicating a second round. Do you still want that second round, Councillor Nickel? No, Councillor Banga asked the questions on police protocol. And my, my only, well, that's about okay. it. He, he answered some of them. Okay. So... If that's it, um, uh, I'll just ask if there's any sort of uh, conversation that's coming out of this or if uh, Mayor Ibsen would like to close this item. Yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll move receipt of information. Um, I might contemplate a motion, except that I think the next discussion we're going to have around, uh, particularly in the transit centers, uh, how we can respond to that more elegantly uh, is, is, is a good segue, actually. So I'm happy to move in receipt of information of this. I do have a couple of comments, but um, um, let's see if there's anybody else wishing to speak to it. Okay. Um, and looks like uh, Councillor McKean uh, would like to also close. Thanks, Sarah. And I just um, wanted to say a couple of things um, in, in regards to, to Rob Hula's comments, which I really appreciate. Rob has uh, always been uh, a strong leader and, and advocate and uh, reminds me uh, of a lot of issues on reconciliation that can pass 
by my mind sometimes. So I really appreciate that. I just wanted to say, because I know, I think I may have brought it up, the the downtown businesses. Uh, and I, for, for their sake, I will say, the Downtown Business Association has contributed considerable money to Boyle Street Community Services and other efforts. And they, I just read another email from them, from their uh, ED today, and it talked about a compassionate response to homelessness. So they keep, uh, as the representatives of downtown business, uh, they are leading on compassion as well. So I just, I wanted to make sure that this assembly knew that of the Downtown Business Association, its philosophy around um, homelessness. While they're, you know, concerned about impact on business, they're always stressing a compassionate response. So thanks for the opportunity to say that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And uh, so we'll now vote on uh, receiving this to close. Oh, sorry. I missed the fact that you hadn't. Go ahead. No, sorry. Um, so. I mean, I think um, the pandemic has been exhausting for everybody. Um, but for most of us, from the comfort of our homes or our workplaces, if we're allowed to go into them, um, after nearly a year of pandemic conditions and after an extended bout of really inclement weather, which fortunately um, isn't our whole winter. It was just a couple of weeks this year. I think Edmontonians, again, mostly from the comfort of their warm and cozy homes, were really troubled to see um, the, the stark situation laid bare that is experienced by too many of our fellow Edmontonians experiencing homelessness. And um, we've discussed over the last several weeks and months, the many gaps in the system and the many structural and historic causes for why uh, particularly indigenous Edmontonians are overrepresented in our, in poverty and in the condition of homelessness. And uh, as a Canadian city that has made real commitments and taken real action around reconciliation, um, we've made some progress, but not nearly enough when it comes to uh, recognizing that it is not a weakness of an individual that can be easily judged or dismissed, that has led people to find themselves in desperate circumstances on the coldest nights of our year. It is a collective opportunity to exercise precisely that compassion and to suspend judgment or even to be aware of, of judgment and implicit bias uh, that we may have learned historically through no fault of our own but to say there has to be a better way. And um, I think some of the discussions we had yesterday and some of the discussions we're about to have uh, indicate that bringing uh, services to people who are struggling where they're at is what is needed. And many folks are on the transit system as riders with uh, every business to be there like anybody else. And some folks are sheltering in... Um, headway spaces and semi-public or ultimately public quasi-public spaces because there is nowhere else to go because of gaps in the shelter network gaps in the housing system uh, issues uh, and opportunities to do things differently with the criminalization of poverty uh, issues of systemic racism and outright racism so i think that this these these two incidents gave our community an important opportunity for reflection um, about these interlinked complex issues, as well as what we are going to do about them. 
And I appreciate that uh, the police service offered an apology when this initially was discussed and, and that an investigation is continuing uh, with respect to uh, what, what unfolded here. And I appreciate that uh, information was provided uh, about the circumstances here of the February 13th issue uh, around Hope Mission. And I do think that um, I still, I, I disagree partially with Mr. Hool, uh, respectfully. I do think housing is not the only answer, but housing is a huge part of the answer. Um, and all the evidence indicates that most people, I think it's fair to say perhaps not all, but that most people will respond uh, well uh, to the right kind of supportive housing. Now, I think more of that needs to be Indigenous-led, more of it needs to be culturally safe, more of it needs to follow evidence-based approaches around the full spectrum of addictions and mental health supports for people to really meet them where they're at. Um, and that would go a good long way here uh, to restoring some of the historic harms here and getting better public policy outcomes. And to the extent that we may still need hubs, shelters, crisis diversion, whatever we want to call it. I think everyone's talking about that. I think the challenge is we have to deliver it. So I'm not, we're not going to solve that one today, but um, building on all these interrelated discussions, I think we're, we're learning as we go. And, and I'm out of time, but um, we'll keep at it. All right. Thank you. Please vote. Yes. Mayor Iveson? Sorry, my uh, tablet went to sleep here. I'm a yes. Thank you. We have all the votes. Let's play the vote, please. And that great conversation has passed unanimously. And we are now moving on to items 6.1, 2, and 3 cross referenced. And I believe that uh, administration has a presentation, after which we will go to our speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, work on these uh, three reports uh, we're presenting this afternoon was very much an integrated effort between uh, city operations, citizen services, and legal services. So for this item, uh, we from city operations, we have DCM Gord Seabrook and Kerry Houghton McDonald, branch manager of ETS, as you know. From legal, legal services, again, similar to last item, uh, Nancy Jacobson and Christina Hodgson. And from citizen services, we have Jackie Ford uh, and David Aiken and some of his staff, John Simmons and, and, Grant, and Grant Lane. So we are, we are here today to continue the, the, uh, the important conversation um, we've been, we've been uh, having about the need to help and support Edmontonians in our community. The pandemic has caused many challenges for everyone, and similar to the mayor's closing comments on the last item, but even more so, those challenges are for our vulnerable situations. The pandemic has further highlighted inequities in many areas, and as directed by council, it's critical we take a fresh look at our policies and bylaws to ensure fairness and equity. We know our approach must be rooted, and similar words to the previous item as well, our, our push must be rooted in compassion, in empathy, and safety, and that we need to treat everyone in a respectful and compassionate way. So we continue to move forward with one clear premise in mind, it's to improve the quality of life for those who need our help and support. Our peace officers have had many more touch points with Edmontonians over the past year, and we do continue to work on fostering and improving connections with support services that are available in our community. Our peace officers do begin every interaction with a respectful conversation, and it is our goal, it's always our goal to help. We continue to focus on training and providing our officers with the tools and insight they need to make a difference. A big component of this is rooted in a deeper understanding of some of the lived experiences of Edmontonians. We recognize just how critically important this is in reviewing our bylaws and our fine structures as we are committed to improving the lives of all Edmontonians. 
with those brief introductory comments, I'll now pass it over to Mr. Aiken to get into the actual details of these reports. David. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, to build on Rob's introduction, uh, this slide in front of you is a highlight of the three reports that are before you today. First, we have completed the bylaw review with the approach of making meaningful and thoughtful changes to address the need to create a safe society, change existing tools that contribute to inequities, and to anchor our approach in inclusion, compassion, and not just enforcement. As you know, bylaws are created and enforced in an attempt to ensure the safety of all Edmontonians. Those who are marginalized by poverty, addiction, or other systemic challenges can be further marginalized by the application of certain rules and fines. Second, administration's application of legislation in our transit system can have unintended consequences. A recent review highlighted that a greater understanding of marginalized and vulnerable population members is needed in order to change enforcement approaches, show compassion, and seek other means to change behavior. Third, Council has supported the principles of establishing and leveling of bylaw fine amounts to act as a suitable deterrent, sanction, and be proportional to the severity of the offense. And in the case of transit, consider other determinants such as fare evasion, fare revenues, and root cause analysis for non-payment. These three reports are cross-referenced as each touches on related considerations for us to be successful moving forward. The creation of bylaws provides a framework of rules that guide behavior and establish community standards. Council regularly reviews legislation to consider purpose, applicability, refinement, and how the schedule of fines to ensure that they have the intended effect. Council in the past has subscribed to a low, medium, and high fine leveling principle that has guided the setting of bylaw standards. Administration develops the corresponding policies that set out the application approaches and other considerations. Other orders of government can also influence the city's enforcement powers by modifying programs and powers. Municipalities are authorized by the Governor of Alberta to employ peace officers and regularly provide bulletins for information on legislative, policy, and procedural changes, and any other information relevant to the service provided by our peace officers. As part of the review, administration looked at those bylaws that most commonly affect marginalized individuals. At the heart of the review, bylaws need to maintain the health, safety, and wellness of individuals and the community. Application of bylaws should avoid harm, show compassion, and not cause unintended consequences. Administration undertook a review and analysis of bylaws that covered public safety, civil conduct in public, and maintaining community standards. Six bylaws were identified. The Parkland Bylaw, the Traffic Bylaw, Conduct of Transit Passenger Bylaw, Animal Licensing and Control Bylaw, the Community Standards Bylaw, and our Public Places Bylaw. Analysis of enforcement statistics demonstrated that these bylaws were most frequently used by city enforcement staff. As part of the analysis, the intent of the legislation, overall desired outcome, and the practicality and effectiveness of enforcement were considerations, but also in terms of the impact they may have on vulnerable population, visible minorities, and indigenous communities. In addition, administration conducted a jurisdictional scan of equivalent bylaws across Canada that you can find in attachment two. During our bylaw review, the analysis resulted in the identification of three bylaws containing seven offenses that could lead to pretense policing based on the frequency of tickets issued. Proof of payment, harassment, loitering, ride a bike on a sidewalk, jaywalking, littering, urination and defecation. With this preliminary analysis completed, and the 13 actions identified in the Community Safety and Wellbeing Bylaw Review Report, we eagerly await the recommendations coming from the task force to shape and steer our next steps. We will consider their input in the context of legislative change, social agency supports and collaboration, improved staff training, increased accountability, and the implementation of harm reduction strategies to meet desired community and council outcomes. At this point, uh, I will just pause for a moment and segue into the transit tickets and no fixed address be report before handing it over to Kerry 
on the third report regarding transit fare fines. In December of 2019, Student Legal Services of Edmonton provided counsel with a report relating to ticketing of individuals with no fixed address. For clarity, the term no fixed address was used in multiple contexts that included but not limited to a person failing or unwilling to provide their address, a person who has no personal information to substantiate an address, a person in transit through Edmonton and a person experiencing homelessness. Administration welcomed the insights and the analysis of the student report and the recommendations. The data highlighted a disproportionate trend concerning people with no fixed address. In response, administration has changed its approach and made program changes to address this disparity, but our work needs to continue. In 2020, 43% of peace officer interactions were with people with no fixed address. This clearly highlights the need for interactions, approaches, assistance provided to our vulnerable population members need to evolve and to balance compassion with well-being and transit safety. Program improvement, a closer review of enforcement practices and rising awareness of issues surrounding inequities and bias are critical for success. While efforts are underway to improve referrals to support agencies, to enhance staff training, and to seek alternatives to fines and other methods to achieve voluntary compliance, we also seek to align the learnings from the student report with our own Community Safety and Wellbeing Bylaw Review Report Next Steps and the upcoming Task Force Report and recommendations. I'll now turn it over to Kerry. Thank you, David. Fair evasion fines are meant to discourage fair evasion and encourage compliance with proof of payment requirements. As we know, fair payment generates revenue that helps offset the cost of operating transit. Some people purposefully evade fare and others may be evading fare because they simply lack the means to pay and must use transit to access the community. Root causes need to be examined, incorporating gender-based analysis and an anti-oppression, anti-racism lens. We need to examine one's ability to pay fares and reduce barriers for accessing programs such as our PATH and Ride Transit programs. We can also work with community partners to analyze needs and co-create solutions together to help those whose needs aren't being met. Helping those who need help is a foundational principle outlined in our fare policy through the affordability principle. Reducing the fine amount presents some challenges and it could en encourage fare evasion and discourage fare buying behavior. It could lead to reduced fare revenues and lower ridership, perhaps alienate some riders who have been complying and paying for the service, and potentially introduce more fare related disputes, disputes which could lead to operator assaults. We need to carefully consider any changes in that regard. There are opportunities to consider equitable fine payment options including things like incentivizing early payment, which is offering early payment options to provide incentives to pay early and reduce the amount that they pay. Community service options, highlighting and connecting people to the province's fine option program as one example to work off fines rather than make cash payments. With that said, I'm now gonna turn it over to Mr. Smythe to wrap up. Uh, thank you, Kerry. So just to conclude our presentation, we know that there's still a lot of work to be done Administration will continue to examine how our services and bylaws interact with vulnerable Edmontonians and those who find themselves at the margins of our community. We will continue to build awareness of our ride transit program that offers low income transit passes and continue to closely monitor the houselessness numbers to align the number of path transit passes available. Administration will also continue to further enhance training, undertake greater interaction with community partners and agencies and work with council appointed anti-racism advisory committee to look at the bylaws and fines we have in place. As administration, we know we are responsible to continually evaluate and adjust our services to meet the needs of a growing population and ensure better lives for all Edmontonians. In that spirit and through a GBA lens, we will continue to include different perspectives in our work on the front lines. And finally, as Mr. Aiken indicated, the Community Safety and Wellbeing Task Force report coming forward to Council on April the 6th will add their voice to a coordinated and aligned way forward. We certainly expect the recommendations of the task force to play a major role in charting our next steps. 
concludes our presentation. We can now step back and hear from the uh, speaker, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you very much for that. And uh, in continuing our uh, tradition today of musical speaking chairs, uh, I've uh, received note that Paige Gorsak is now no longer able to join us. However, we do have a speaker who uh, would like to speak in her place, but uh, we do actually have to vote to add this speaker to the list. And uh, that person's name is Juan Vargas. Um, are there any objections to adding Juan Vargas to the speaker's list? Not hearing any, uh, let's now move to public speakers. Uh, Mr. Vargas, you have five minutes. Thank you, Council. Uh, my name is Juan, I use he, him, and they, them pronouns, and I'm an organizer of Free Trials at Edmonton, a grassroots community group united around the goal of fair, free, and improved transit services in Edmonton. I'm here to speak on the issues of transit ticketing, equity, and accessibility. First, I want to speak in support of the Student Legal Services Report and call on council members to read the original report if you haven't. Their analysis is crucial to understanding the injustice resulting from the city's current bylaws. The disproportionate targeting of houseless individuals is haunting, given this council's stated goals of ending homelessness in our city. Studies prove that mobility is a major indicator of economic justice for our communities because we know access to reliable transportation is a clear indicator of economic mobility and the ability to both access and be on time for jobs outside of the immediate community. Next, I want to address our concerns with the administration's bylaw review report and make specific calls to action for city councillors around transit in line with economic and racial justice. The first is the move to end fare evasion ticketing now. This bylaw negatively and disproportionately impacts the houseless and low-income communities, and it needs to be repealed until a just alternative can be put in place. In the interim, transit operators and peace officers might instead record data on the situation at hand. Why is the user unable to pay that day? What service alternatives might be available to them? This data would provide council and administration with insights into where existing services are failing to reach communities, as well as the other reasons a rider may be unable to pay. So the administration's report suggests that there is no equity to be gained by not giving a ticket because it will not address the problem. But a fare evasion ticket can result in a ban which might escalate, a warrant for one's arrest, or other further interactions with the criminal legal system. Council must understand that action toward equity is still valuable even if not addressing the roots of the problem. Call it a band-aid solution or whatever you want, that is still an opportunity for social and economic and mobility justice. Moreover, the current solutions offered by the city are inadequate. Consider, for example, the root problem solutions that the report highlights, such as the PATH program. That program provides 1,900 monthly passes to houseless and at-risk Edmontonians. However, data on our houseless population shows that we have at least that many individuals uh, that are homeless. Uh, this means they have enough passes for each person to have one monthly pass. So for the other 11 months of the year, transit is not accessible to that person. Moreover, consider that the PATH program does not reach every vulnerable Edmontonian who might be struggling with fare payment, such as low-income riders, individuals living below the poverty line, folks who have not been able to navigate complicated means testing for reduced rates, or who are accessing transit in an emergency. So I think we can deduce that this program is not offering enough at the so-called root of the problem. So to re reiterate here, Free Transit Edmonton is calling for you to start addressing the criminalization of poverty by ending fare evasion tickets. Second, we call on you to end loitering tickets. The report says administration will be reviewing this bylaw for clarity and definition. Until such a time as the review is complete, members of our community should not be pushed out of public spaces, particularly at a time when people have no place to go. You heard from Rob Hull in the last section about the discrimination and disrespect shown to community members simply for eating a meal. Third, reduce fines in line with student legal report. First, the, uh, the report from uh, both SLS and Councillor Paquette have outlined how fines disproportionately target those with no fixed address and that the fine amount is disproportionately compared to other tickets amounting to a tax on poverty or a criminalization of poverty. Consider that we charge $200 more for a transit ticket than the average parking ticket. I think this is really huge and a really big thing to focus on. On this point, I also want to flag some other concerning points made in the admin report. First, that the report argues that lower fine amounts would create a perception that our transit system is low quality. It's a bit of a bizarre logic, given that a lower fine amount is in place for other serv city services without having that impact, for example, $50 for parking. It also suggests that lower fine amounts with lower ridership. Similarly, this is a weird logic and no reasons are given for this argument or how that would happen. Third, it also suggests that no equity benefits, that there is no better equity benefit since it would not address the root cause. I discussed this above, but it's so dangerous 
Uh, sorry, it's important to reiterate that this is dangerous logic and not in line with the experiences of Edmontonians who received tickets and faced economic inability to buy transit tickets. Fourth, fine amounts do not go to support supporting transit specifically. Moreover, fines and fees are not sustainable or just ways to fund government. They exacerbate poverty, they fuel policing for profit, and they trap millions in debt. Free Transit Edmonton would support a move towards alternative tactics to encourage fair payment for the duration of the time that transit operates on a fair model. And I say duration of the time because for us, it's very obvious that the solution to all of this is to have no fares uh, for transit and move towards a, a possibility where Edmontonians don't have to pay to get on transit. Above all, I'm here to t today to call on Council to recognize the role that you have. Administration's role is to prove data and background, and where you as your elected representatives have the opportunity and responsibility to make change that supports Edmonton being an accessible and just city for all residents. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I'll look to committee and council members for questions. I'm not seeing any. Um, I've got a couple of quick questions, maybe. The first is, um, okay, so I empathize with uh, what you have to say uh, completely. Um, the challenge is in the practical application. So, for example, if we um, got rid of fines completely, uh, in essence, uh, we're making transit free, which uh, I understand is your goal. Uh, but the other question then is that, um, we do tend to have uh, a situation on our hands uh, with folks who uh, are in tragic circumstances of either drug addiction. Um, if you go to uh, an LRT station right now, you'll probably find evidence of it in front of your eyes, and it is tragic. Um, and uh, But we also have uh, issues of uh, trying to find appropriate solutions for folks experiencing homelessness or other or houselessness, I suppose, or other um, maladies or challenges. And so if we were to reduce or eliminate all fines and eliminate all approaches toward loitering, um, what do you see as the um, end result in our transit stations? And I mean that, I don't mean that as a, like a, uh, you know, cutting under your position or anything like that. It's actually a very, very honest and sincere question. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Bacat. Um, Council, I think that the actual practical solution is this point, right? When we think about people who are loitering, when we think about people who are looking for a place to stay, when we think about people who are looking for a place to go, the practical solution is getting them to those to those places. It's getting them to a shelter. It's getting them to a place where they'll find the health resources that they need. And what fines do is that they interrupt people within those journeys and they interrupt people from being able to not only access those places, it also adds an additional burden that most people can't pay. So if we're talking about practical solutions, I think that instead of thinking, you know, how can we make sure that people, uh, you know, don't break this law, for example, we think about like, how just is the law, right? How just is the fact that we're punishing people for this in the first place when they have no other options? So I think actually, realistically, this is the practical solution, especially when we consider the fact that fines often compound with other issues and often keep people from further accessing the things that they need uh, to get to to the place where we all want them to be, right? Which is uh, a safer place, um, away from addictions, uh, safely housed, um, all the things that I know that this council wants. Right. Okay. So, and then my other question is, uh, you raised the, uh, the issue that um, a parking ticket could be $50 to $75 to $100, um, but a transit fine uh, is more along the lines of $250, and the majority of these fines have been given out to people with no fixed address. So, presumably, that $250 might as well be $2 million, and... Uh, um, since they have no way of paying, they basically just accrue more and more fines on their record. Is that sort of your contention? That's correct. And I think it's important to also consider that a lot of individuals carry more than one fine, right? Nothing's stopping someone from being fined more than once in a year or, you know, for whatever reason. And that adds on with things like bans, that adds on with things like being able to even get to a job. Um, and it's incredibly disproportionate given that if you're someone who has a car or access to driving, 
you probably just have more disposable income uh, to, to move away with. I think you're, you're exactly on, on, the, on the spot with that. Okay. So, and that's why you call it an inequitable uh, finding system. Okay. Because we charge more for those who have the least. Okay. It makes sense. Now, some people will say, yeah, but if you do this, aren't you letting a lot of people who can pay and should pay into the system off the hook? Because money's got to come from somewhere. And if people are paying their fares or buying bus passes, then it has to come from taxes. And is that the best use of taxes for transit or is the best use of taxes for transit to improve transit? Um, I think we can definitely follow an honor system here. I think that most people understand that it is a duty to pay into these systems. And, you know, even when people have the opportunity to evade, they're going to pay anyways. Um, so I would much rather have someone who can't pay get away with not paying if it means that, um, you know, some other people pay more. Or I would rather have some people who would be able to pay not pay if it means that people who are houseless or people who are at high risk are able to get a ride without the fear of being punished, without the fear of going to jail, without the fear of just becoming deeper entrenched into poverty. I think it's an absolutely fine trade-off. And I think it would is not necessarily nearly as big as, as we are often led to think. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, I'm out of time. I appreciate it. Uh, I see no other questions for you. So thank you for your submission. Uh, we will now turn to administration for questions and uh, we can start that list. Um, this was selected by Councillor Nickel, so we'll start by asking. Uh, Aaron, weren't these your motions, Aaron? Uh, yes, but you, well, you selected. You can go first. You can go first, Aaron. They were your motions. Oh, I uh, I don't mind going last. Uh, you know, I like to hear everyone's uh, thoughts. They are more interesting to me than my own. So, Councillor Vanga, go ahead. Yeah, my a uh, couple of my questions were. Uh, for the previous speaker, if he's uh, still around. I don't believe Mr. Hull stuck around. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, don't worry about it, and then I'll go. Okay. Well, uh, then if there are no other questions for administration, um, I'm happy to begin. I mean, just a second. Um, yeah, go ahead. I mean, uh, Mr. Hool, I, I mean, the speaker you were uh, just questioning. Oh, uh, Mr. Vargas, yeah, I believe he's still on the line. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Mr. Vargas, I got a question for you. Uh, I mean, I'm going to be totally blunt. Uh, I know you were talking about honor system and everything else i mean you know with all that happenings in the world there you think this honor system actually works other than just in the books uh council bang i think the point of public transit is to get people moving around and like i said i think i am fine with the trade-off given that most edmontonians who have the means to pay for transit will pay for transit. I think that the uh, impact would be likely negligible. Uh, uh, insofar as uh, we maybe will lose a lot of money, I think you have a lot of cities like New York City and Toronto City who in the last two years have spent millions of dollars on fare enforcement, whereas that millions, of, those millions of dollars could have instead gone towards helping the people that can't access transit. So it's not just about a, the trade-off being worth it for me. It's very much also about the fact that this is a complete misplacement of resources, whereas we can actually be dealing with the issues in a much better way instead of just throwing fines at it, uh, especially for people who just don't even have the... If you can't pay a two or a $3 ticket, you're not going to be able to pay a $200 fine. Okay. And uh, again, uh, I keep getting questions uh, uh, from uh, people living in my area um, why that? Why should they be paying for somebody else? They're paying enough in taxes uh, for uh, through the taxes, through uh, uh, property tax, through the uh, through the um, I guess uh, income tax, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and uh, through the user fees. Why should they be paying, not some folks? 
Uh, yes, sir. I think that you know clearly there is a, there is an equity argument here. But if the argument that you want is an economic argument, then I would say that the return of an, of investment on you know letting someone on transit for free one time, if it means that they access a doctor's appointment, if it means that they access a shelter, if it means that they access food services, if it means that they access being able to pick up their meds, is absolutely worth it in every single way, as opposed to interrupting that trip, uh, finding them hundreds of dollars, right? So if the, if the question is, why should I pay for this? It's because the payoff is incredibly huge and is incredibly beneficial, not only to that individual, but also to the city as a whole, if that's the attitude that we're going to take about things. So... Just uh, dwelling on the same thing there, uh, that finding out each person's need, wouldn't just that bog down the system? Like, how do we, how do we actually do something? Well, I mean, the system is there to help people, right? I think if it's going to be bogged down, then we expand the system to help people in a way that is more beneficial. Um, but I think that additionally, like if we're looking at it about actually helping people, I think we can take a, a more or less universal approach on it and filling in the gaps in people's lives, right? Fines don't fill in gaps in people's lives and fines certainly don't make people's lives better. If that's the aim that we want to take, then I think that we can invest a lot more into helping people where they need to be instead of just... Assuming that every problem is because people want to evade fines, and that's the reason why people are evading fines. I think it's a lot more complex than that. Well, when it comes to the fines, uh, whether they're uh, fines for uh, riding transit, whether they're fines for uh, speeding on the provincial level and uh, or whatever, the fines are there to gain some sort of compliance. And... Uh, they're not money makers, as you stated earlier. Not, uh, if uh, uh, even for the traffic tickets, uh, if you get a ticket, uh, it probably costs ten times. So you think we should probably get rid of the whole fine system? Doesn't matter at what level. Um, well, sir, I think that with regards to traffic tickets, I mean, I think there's countries that do proportional ticketing. That's not really my concern. I think that people die when people speed. People don't die when people evade traffic, uh, when people evade transit uh, fares. Uh, and I think it is an equity issue, right? Like that's that's why we bring it up as an equity issue. Um, but if you want to talk about uh, finding speeders, I think that's a different conversation. Happy to be part of that conversation as well. Okay, we'll do that someday. Thanks. Love it. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I see no other questions for our speakers, and I will just check one more time just to be sure. No, not seeing any. Okay, so we will move on to questions for administration. Uh, I don't see anyone on the board, so um, I'm happy to start it out. Um, and I'm just, I'll start out with uh, a question from attachment two on the jur jurisdictional scan on bylaws. And uh, so that shows Edmonton, Calgary, Vancouver, Toronto, and Saskatoon, and uh, their um, policies or their bylaws. And we see that in Saskatoon, there's no bylaw for enforcement uh, for proof of payment and no bylaw present for loitering. And I'm just wondering um, if you can explain that to me. Like, am I, does, that, does that mean what it says? They just don't have a bylaw for these things? Uh, that that's correct. That's the information that we were able to uh, to garner from the e scan. Okay. How does that? I mean, do we know how that works for them? Then. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any sort of information relative to um, the, the the size or the concerns they have relative to those issues. Um, clearly, if they have no legislation in place. I would interpret that to mean that that um, they they haven't experienced that, but I, I don't know, and certainly that could be a follow up if directed to do so. Okay, but the city still stands. It does. Okay. Uh, all right. So when we're th talking about uh, equity, as, as was raised, um, you know, the other thing that came out of the jurisdictional scans was that. Uh, um, we're looking at fines of about $150 in other cities. Ours is $250. Um, are we able to prove, is there a rationale that that, is, that our fine is more effective in uh, preventing fare evasion than 
$150 in similar jurisdictions? Uh, thank you, Councillor. We've not done that evaluation to look at effectiveness. Uh, my understanding is when Council decided to go to 250 there was extensive uh, discussions and analysis that led to setting uh, that particular price point, uh, but we've not done that evaluation for effectiveness. Okay. Council and I suppose, I mean, was the approach to enforce compliance or was the approach to encourage the purchase of uh you know, bus passes or fares. And uh, if we don't know if it's effective or not, then I guess I can't answer that question either. Because we don't know. We have the idea that maybe it does, but we don't have any data. So we do have data in terms of fare evasion. And during the revenue management audit, the city auditor had a whole section talking about strengthening controls and reducing uh, fare evasion. Um, you know, that particular price point is to encourage, uh, you know, compliance and, and fair purchasing. Um, as mentioned in the report, um, you know, the root cause of why someone can't pay is really where, where I'm personally concerned. So whether it's a yeah. lower fine amount or a higher fine amount, if someone can't pay uh, the bus fare in the first place, um, you know, I, I'm just, I'm thinking we need to look at some of those root causes of how to support them. Right. So if we don't have the data, though, that $250 fine is generally fairly arbitrary, especially if we base fines based on generally taking a jurisdictional scan and seeing what everyone else is doing. So everyone is just sort of looking what each other is doing. But uh, at some like you would assume that at some point someone actually made um, a study of this and determined um, the best uh, price point, I guess, so to speak. But we can't say that one way or the other. Uh, Councillor Paquet, maybe I can add some historical information. Um, yeah. count, count, council amalgamated around 18 different bylaws uh, several years back and, and really uh, consolidated them into the Community Standards Bylaw and the Public Places Bylaw and a few others. As part of that, we, we, we did um, bring forward reports uh, to council talking about what, what would be the, the principles or the fine matrix in, de in deciding what fine amounts to to uh, associate with any particular offence. And so our council did go through an effort because we did have fines ranging that were $10 apart or, or from $50 all the way up to 250. And so council was very intentional in crafting, as I mentioned in my opening comments, a sort of a low, medium and high. And that $250 piece that's reflected for most violations, not all within our community standards, right. public places became that sort of, that sort of center mi middle ground that council felt was sufficient for a deterrent value so people would say think twice about trying to break the law but also sanction uh, and also that proportionality discussion that we've had that you know it's not too much where um, it, it's out of line and it's not too low to the actual offense that's occurred and so I think as part of the transit discussion with the 250 um, there's those other considerations about fair revenue fair evasion and is it the right uh, leveling and it is consistent and we found that with um, without the fines um, and there's always going to be municipalities that may be slightly higher slight, slightly lower but we have historically done that review and research and provided that information to council so i guess the the ultimate question then is um did it work by by having a fine of 250 dollars as opposed to like the 150 dollars in other jurisdictions did it work did it reduce fare evasion did it increase the purchasing of bus passes um, did it do all the things that we hoped it, it would do, or was is it just now a fine of $250? So, sort of, give or take. I completely appreciate where you're coming from. I think if uh, that's the wish of council to do that particular study, absolutely happy to, to take on that work and follow up. Okay, so we don't know. As mentioned, we have not done an uh, um, effectiveness evaluation on it, um, but are certainly happy to do that. Uh, we do know, as I mentioned, through the revenue management audit, the auditor's expectations is that we're tightening uh, and adding more controls around fare evasion to reduce it, um, but have not done uh, that program evaluation study to monitor or measure the effectiveness. Okay, I'm out of time. Uh, Councillor Knack, go ahead. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for for this information. Uh, just one more question on the on the fine piece, and and appreciating the work that went in previously around trying to create some certainty there. Um, I think the part that that jumped out at me when I was going through the attachments, um, particularly related to the transportation fines overviews, and it was hinted at a little bit in our speakers' responses too, is that we have fines for things like you know parking in fire in front of a fire hydrant or parking in an emergency zone, things that if somebody were to do could legitimately have an impact on the health and well-being of our of members of our of our city. And yet, then when I read the, you know, then I when I reflect on the other one and I see $250 for not paying a fare, that that seemed a little odd to me. And and I mean, it's on, it's on me as much as anyone else as, as somebody that's uh, set these in the past. Um, but I just wanted to double check, you know, so when I look at that, it looks like a very odd discrepancy that the things that actually affect the health and well-being of our society are actually lower in fine than somebody who doesn't pay the fare. So that's how I interpret it now. And again, I'll put as much blame on myself as anyone for 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 allowing that to continue. So any thoughts on that? Any any reflection on that, too, if anyone has the same thoughts? Or? Certainly, um, Councillor Nack, in, in, it, it's always been a um, not an easy discussion when it comes to what is the right fine amount. My experience over 30 years, that you know, we've had the 70, 90, 100, 110, 115, without any logic to, to, to at the point in time when those fines were established, what, why would they be $10 more than another? And so council did go through that levelling exercise, and that's reflective of a more consistent approach. But I think as administration, we look at the, the various offences and we bring um, changes or recommended increases based on a whole variety of factors that we are seeing uh, continued violations escalating and it's not having that deterrent value um, or we or for a number other reasons safety concerns growing numbers trends things like that you know our job is to bring that information forward for you to consider but also in in relation to other types of uh, uh, fences and things like that so again um, we will certainly do our best to provide you that information and then you can weigh that and uh, make those decisions relative to the leveling of those fines Absolutely. And it was really helpful data because it, it gave me that chance to sort of look at it and realize, ah, oh, that does seem a bit out of place, at least it, at least it did to me. Uh, the the other questions related to uh, 6.3 and well, and this uh, and 6.2, this since they're all really connected. Uh, I just want to confirm because we heard it from the speaker, but I, I want to make sure I'm correct. Uh, the, the PATH program uh, currently is now 1900 passes per month that we provide, correct? Because I, I think there was a suggestion that it was 1,900 for one month and then the rest of the year they, they might not have access to them. Thank you, Councillor. Yes, that is true. It's 1,900 passes a month. And the, pro the program works so that if you actually, if you are part of the program, you get a pass that month and then you bring the pass back the next month and it's, and it's just renewed that way. So yes, it yeah. is 1,900 per month. Great. Right. And, and then just the, the follow up to that is that I, I recognize that was an increase over over the 500 we used to do. Um, do. Have you set yourself a hard limit that you will never go above 1900 or if if a social organization, you know, you're coming up to 1900 and an organization says, hey, we need another hundred. I, I imagine we're going to help out. Right. Like that's not a hard, hard number. Correct. So the way the program is designed and what was approved is that the number of passes should match. Um, our houseless figure. So, you know, from a compassionate lens, absolutely want to make sure that people who need the support are going to get it. Um, you know, it's not uh, a situation where there's actual revenue loss from my perspective. Um, you know, we're assisting people. And I think, you know, generally we've heard recognition of transit as a critical service, uh, mobility uh, as an enabler, and happy to support it. So, yes, we can increase those numbers. Right. Yeah. I mean, you have the flexibility to go. We might not use it up, but I just want to make sure you have that. Um, maybe some just smaller, smaller questions here. I guess I don't have much time left. Um, out of curiosity, when I looked at things like, um, jaywalking, I was curious, do we know how many tickets we've issued for jaywalking outside the core versus inside the core? It was a small number already, but I'm curious if we have a number of that because technically it's illegal to cross a local road, right? But people do it. Technically it's illegal to play street hockey on our local streets, but I, 
I'm guessing we don't enforce that often. So I'm wondering how we sort of make that d differentiation, decide where to enforce and where not to. Uh, Councillor Nack, I, I don't have that data, um, so I'd have to go back to the team and see whether we actually capture it based on the, the downtown and outside the downtown and whether we're able to differentiate between the two. Okay, I'm out of time. I might come back around. We'll see. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Nack, I was just taking a look at the time. We're bumping up against 3.30, which is the 15-minute break. Um, so I think we'll do that and come back to questions because if we power through, we've got 10 minutes here, but... I have uh, every faith that there's actually going to be more than 10 minutes of questions left. So uh, let's just take our break now. 345, we'll be back on the dot.
Okay, and we are back. I hope everyone had a great break. I'll do a quick roll call. Uh, Councillor Zadek. Go here. Hello, Councillor Nickel. Good afternoon. Good to hear your voice. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. It's fine to hear your voice. Uh, who else we got on here? Uh, we got Councillor Henderson. I am Hello. here. Uh, Councillor Esslinger. Still here. Hello. Uh, and Councillor Banga is still here. And That's in. <laughs> Councillor McKean. Present. Hello. And Councillor Cartmel. Still here. Hello, hello. Okay, wonderful. All wonderful people. Okay, so let's move on with questions. We'll just jump right in. We've got uh, um, Councillor Henderson next. But, I think Councillor uh, Nichol is on the committee. Yeah, I was going to say Councillor Nichol is on the committee, so we'll go. Oh, I'll never get in the way of Councillor Henderson asking a question. Please go. <laughs> Oh, go ahead, Betty. Go ahead. I'll let you guys okay. work. Well, just a number of things that came up. If that's the thanks, Mike. Um, I you, it strikes me uh, going back to that question about Saskatoon is an interesting one because my memory of Saskatoon. It's been a, a year, a few years since I've been on that bus system. There was all they have is a bus system where you get on the bus and the driver expects you to pay and you do so. Um, there will be no kind of issues around proof of payment areas or honor systems or any of that in the Saskatoon system. So I'm guessing that makes a difference to this question of a need to create a penalty, correct? Yes, Councillor. We got, I got some information saying that they do have a, a small uh, bus system similar to St Albert and um, therefore that might support why they don't have uh, either the, the fines or the enforcement staff to uh, regulate it. Because I want to, I'm remembering a report, it leads to, to another question. I'm remembering a report we had a number of years ago when I think there was some pressure on us to deal with this question of fare evasion, uh, to look at going into a system which only really exists on our LRT. Our bus system still has the driver at the front that, you know, which, which was about, um, you know, should we be doing areas that you can only get into if you go through a turnstile? Um, and that you know, that my memory from that report is that we were one of the very first municipalities to try this system of saying you don't need a turnstile and to go with a system of, of honor with enforcement. Um, but that those two things had to go together. And we'd actually, a lot of people had followed our lead. This is way back into the 70s because we'd shown that it was possible in actual fact, it's more effective, it's, it's less expensive to go this route than to go with a, a system where you would have to put in your token and go through a turnstile or do any of those kind of things. Um, is that is my memory correct on that? Well, I certainly wasn't here then, but I can tell you the conversations. I've had. No, I wasn't here in the 70s either. No, no, but I, I thought we had a report on this three or four years ago, the last yes. time we addressed this so question. So the reports that have uh, mentioned it talk about an open style or a closed style. And yeah. right, so uh, this is my second transit property I've been in. I'm part of CUDA. Um, a lot of agencies don't have a closed system. They have that open system. So you're spot on. Because I think, you know, I think part of the challenge here is, and I don't know how we address this, um, is that ironically we're setting, we're setting our, our rates to deal with people that do have the ability to pay. The, the fines are targeted at them, not at the people that don't have the ability to pay. Um, and yet, so we have one set of tools to deal with both groups. So, you know, the, the fine system is what allows us to go with a system that doesn't have turnstiles. Um, and that's not, but that's not targeted against people that, that, that can't afford it. That's targeted against people that can um, and choose not to. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm wondering how we can resolve that, that unfortunately we have one set of tools that's trying to deal with two different issues here. I think that's why I was trying to focus on how do I help people pay for using the service? And I've got a couple of different mechanisms already, but maybe I'm missing something. Maybe there's an underserved group. I'd love to work with uh, community partners and our social development branch as well to explore that. And maybe we need to add something different. And maybe there's barriers. If I take that anti-racism lens on it, you know, maybe how we designed ride transit has some barriers that I haven't witnessed because of my background. 
Um, but if we take that lens on it, we could look at it differently uh, and remove barriers to access so that all people who want to use transit will be supported in accessing it and having those uh, you know, affordable transit options and or free options given to them because we do have a couple of offerings that uh, provide free passes. But uh, just to do a double check, and I'm, I'm assuming you have these numbers from before, our ability to create an open system, and that system's going to become op more open rather than less when we go to a, a tap-on system, I suspect. Um, our ability to do that um, is because there's a consequence if you choose not to. Um, we couldn't have an open system if there wasn't some consequence. Do, I mean, is there any? Is there are, are there any numbers about what that looks like? I mean, I think going back to Mr. Vargas' comments earlier, um, do we know what the kind of lack of compliance is if there's no if there's no penalty for not complying? Uh, it's difficult without having the technology. So the smart fare technology will give us a much better sense. Um, I know the fare evasion rates estimated at two point seven three percent for closed, which is the LRT model that we have. Um, when we do move to smart fare, we're looking at some, uh, you know, amendments to reinforce that the proof of payment zones include the buses. Again, this connects back to that auditor report uh, recommendation that they had made uh, to tighten up controls around fare evasion. Great. And then my memory of these motions was they were really targeted at making sure we weren't misusing these bylaws that we were using for the purpose they were intended. Um, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, and I, we haven't talked a lot about that. I just, any thoughts on where we're at with that question? Because I think that's where this started. I'm out of time, I realize, but if someone can take a crack at that. So I, I can give you some uh, some numbers in regards to uh, proof of payment uh, going back uh, a number of years. And so, um, you know, probably five years ago, we would see around 10,000 um, tickets for proof of payment in 2016, we saw it drop to around 8,500 uh, right through till 2019. It's at 5,000. Uh, so we've seen a significant drop just in the last four years. Obviously, 2020, uh, we're in the sort of 500 ticket range. So again, but obviously, there's there's lots to consider relative to that number. But but I, I think the, the the downward trend of fare evasion tickets. Um, in the last five years is trending downwards significantly. Great, thanks. I'm out of time. Thank you. Councillor Nickel. Okay, Mr. Aitken. So I know we've talked fair evasion for many years and you're you're a person in the know. So I think the point we're trying to get at here, parking in front of a fire hydrant at minus 20 has a different consequence than somebody and getting a ticket has a different consequence than somebody not being able to get on the bus at minus 20 because they don't have money. Correct? Very different consequences. Correct. So my question to you is, as part of your work going forward, there has to be an elasticity curve here with regards to fines and uh and compliance uh that that can have a compassionate element or that that issue worked into it isn't isn't aren't we talking about modeling out just what's appropriate given the fact that parking in front of a fire hydrant is different than not being gave, getting on the bus which isn't very important yeah. not saying not do not don't park in, in front of a fire a fire hydrant kids don't do that i'm saying that <laughs> no disagreement there so this is this is the question. Isn't this the model we want to see? Is is that should it be uh, an escalating from 20, 50 plus plus to uh, to the option that given the person of a particular circumstance might be able to get a waiver at some point? You know, these sorts of things. I just want to know if that's what the work you're trying to do, when we might see it. Councillor Nickel, that, that is the work. Um, as mentioned earlier, um, it is a complex uh, situation balancing uh, infrastructure, um, safety, w wellness, health, compassion, and dealing with the vulnerable population that sometimes we're not always aware of. And so uh, I think in the application, the pendulum, uh, pendulum is swinging. Um, you know, we've seen uh, you know, an increase in our referrals to, to the different agencies uh, providing those transport services, those necessities. Uh, I, I don't think for one minute that it's good enough. We need to do more. Um, our transit peace officers you know, give out hundreds of free transfers in addition to the path piece. Uh, and so I, I think it's recognizing that we need to 
accommodate and show compassion uh, and take different uh, approaches to gain that voluntary compliance from, from certain populations and not use that ticketing sure. approach? Sure. David, I get that. When are we going to see it? <laughs> That's my question to you. When are we going to see it? So um, I, I think the information that we provided shows that we're on that path. I, I think that the increase from referrals in 2019 that was around 1,300, you see in 2020 it's close to 6,000. So you, we're trending in the right direction. I hope to see a doubling of that. Uh, you see our warnings have gone up by 10,000 each year, from seven to 10,000 each year. So that shows that we're using warnings rather than ticketing. And our ticketing numbers uh, in, in, in areas are going down. So I think we're seeing the first signs of that. But again, we've still got lots of work to do. Okay, David, I'll get straight to the point. You know, it's 250. Are we going to be dropping it down to 50 and then escalating? Is, is Let's just get right to the mechanics of it. So the mechanics, I mean, I, my understanding is around 10 years ago, the fine, uh, and someone if maybe from Law Branch can, uh, can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the fine was lower than the $250 amount, and we found that there was that fair evasion, and that, that supported some of the arguments for an increase of it. Council is certainly within their purview to make that fine amount whatever, and they've got a lot of latitude relative to what that fine amount is. We provide the information relative to uh, the success of it. Is it having that deterrent value and all those other considerations? And, and right now, uh, as Kerry pointed out, maybe we don't have that intel to suggest whether the 250 is the right amount or not. Well, I, and I guess that's the crux of some of the things we're talking about today is, is that we just we want to do it right. We want to put in the proper model, but it's just the mechanics of, uh, of supporting our decision is, is what's in the back of my head anyways. So. Councillor Nichol, the, okay. As you, as you mentioned, the crux of it is w whether the fine's $250 in my mind or $150, someone who can't pay can't pay either amount. Yeah, that's true enough. Yeah, that's very, very true. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Nickel. Okay, so I'm going to throw um, a motion on the board. We'll see uh, if it sticks. Um, it says that, uh, that Community and Public Services Committee recommend to City Council that administration prepare bylaw amendments to reduce the current amount for fine fair evasion from $250 to $150 to be in line with other jurisdictions as outlined in attachment three of the March 24th, 2021 city operations report CR 7813, or to allow for proof of purchase of monthly transit pass within a two week period. Um, and two, that administration work with social agency partners to co-create equitable fine repayment options and conduct an anti-racism review of current low-income fare programs to remove barriers and support equitable participation from those who need support. So I understand that administration's position uh, that fines for fare evasion are a necessary part of the system. Um, and do not address the larger equity question of capturing support for those individuals who cannot afford to pay. However, I do struggle to understand the rationale for a fine of $250. Even saying that uh, fair evasion has dropped, I mean, there's so many factors involved with that, from warnings to um, the offerings of low-income passes and uh, um, all sorts of different efforts that we've made uh, along these lines. So we, I don't think we can uh, say conclusively in any way that a $250 fine is more effective than a $150 fine. Um, but what I'm hoping with this motion is that what uh, we can achieve is a more equitable, equitable way to allow people to actually get the passes they need if they need them, or to work with uh, uh, these agency partners to co-create better fine repayment systems. Because as Councilor Nickel was pointing out, to someone making uh, you know $20,000 a year, $250 is just exorbitant, whereas someone making like $80,000 a year, it's it's really not something that they're going to blink at. So we created a fine, as Councillor Henderson said, for sort of the, the demographic that we hope is using transit, um, but instead it's uh, overly um, uh, harsh on people that really are utilizing transit. Um, and also with this, um, what I'm hoping is that what we see is that the fine uh, can be reduced if people just buy a pass. And so instead of trying to, um, you know, close the fist and be punitive, instead um, we're sort of 
guiding people into a more appropriate usage of transit. So that's sort of the rationale. And um, I'll put it there and uh, I'll see if anyone has any questions about that. I'm not seeing any. Um, Mr. Chair, before um, you vote, if I could just confirm for part two that the intent would be to have a report back. And if so, if we could look at a due date for that. Yes, thank you. That would be a, that's a, a, a great addition and necessary one. Okay, so let's see if we can improve this. Uh, Councillor Knack. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. And just a very simple question. I imagine it, it, it's likely in, in built into the assumption of it, but uh, the reference to proof of purchase. So if somebody was accessing PATH as an example and they acquire that, like, that we would consider that that's that's what your point is. Anyone who acquires properly a, a monthly transit pass. Yeah, so proof of purchase or proper acquisition of. Perfect. I don't know if we need to write it in. I just thought I would say it out loud to make sure that it's clear. And if it is, it might not hurt to say uh, proof of purchase or proper acquisition of monthly transit pass or something like that. Yeah. Does it? I think administration, do you need that? Um, in terms of the proof of purchase uh, component, it'd be difficult. I'm, I'm just struggling to follow. Yeah. Okay. So let's add that in and that makes it a little more clear because basically if someone who can afford a bus pass is uh, evading a, uh, their fare, they get this $150 fine, they go buy a bus pass and uh, that receipt is their proof of payment. That, that, that's how they settle their fine, that kind of concept, right? I'm wondering if Ms. Jacobson wants to weigh in in terms of uh, navigating that process because I understand the province is involved. Mm, yeah, I think right. She's on the line. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Carrie. So it's something we can look at and we can certainly come back with options. I, I believe the challenge that's being flagged for you here is the disconnect upon which once an officer issues a ticket, uh, effectively the municipality loses a good portion of its jurisdiction over the matter. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to say that we can't look at that option, but it is a good flag to say to you that we will have to be a bit creative in how we could implement something like this. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a challenge, but I have faith in you. But it still counts next time. That's okay. No, I did. I, the, all, all I wanted to flag is that, that I assume that the work that would come back is either somebody buying a pass or somebody getting access to the PATH program or, you know, something like that. Just as long as they have access to a monthly pass, that's what we're talking about. Because yeah. somebody that can't afford the, the monthly pass or can't afford the fine, can't afford the monthly pass, if they can get the pass through the, the programs that exist. So I just, maybe to someone on administration, that you are assuming that, that acquiring a pass would be what we're talking about here in that, in that first point. Somebody acquires a pass through PATH or through other programs or purchases one, that's over, that's okay. So I, I just, on that point, I think you're bringing up something really interesting and we've had talks internally about perhaps we could consider as part of the PATH program uh, our TPO uh, role and helping to distribute those passes as an alternative. And maybe that's something we explore so that, uh, you know, if they determine through conversation without asking directly if someone is, um, you know, without a house, if we could explore some opportunity to enhance uh, getting those passes in the hands of people who need them. I just want to put that out for consideration related to that point you just brought up. So long as that's happening, that's all I wanted to ask about. That's, that's great. I just wanted to make sure it was clear everyone thank you okay. uh yeah councillor nickel uh aaron why 150 did you consider an escalation from 50 to 100 to 150 for repeat offenders i don't know i just want you thinking why you just like i'm fine with this uh i just because it's usually a curve but yeah you know, so, yep. that's a really good point that's sort of why i've got number two in there um, uh, because if we're working with social agency partners, co-create equitable fine repayment options, then that's where we can maybe bring in sort of that curve that you're talking about. Oh, okay. Sure. Uh, the 150 was sort of like, if other jurisdictions are 150, why are we such an, uh, you know, an outlier? Bring it back in. I mean, uh, it's also a little bit more than a pass would be. So it's worth your while to just buy a pass than just collect a fine. 
And, uh, and, uh, so that was sort of the rationale. Okay. Yeah. I just think, uh, an, an escalation curve might be, might be an interesting tool, at least to test. I don't know. It's just, uh, okay. Thank you. I think that's fair to add in if, uh, like, I think that's a friendly. Okay. No, no, I don't want to make it too complex. I want, I want you to get what you want. Right. <laughs> I'm going to be blunt. Let's just get this one going. And then we can maybe then we can talk about escalation questions under option two and how that would could possibly model out. So, OK, just, that's a good yeah. idea. Nothing. Yeah. And so they can do it. Yeah. OK. Uh, Councilor Henderson. Yeah, I'm, I'm completely supportive of option two of, of number two. I have some real questions about number one, uh, mm -hmm. because, again, I think number one has to stay targeted to the people. Who can afford it and who are choosing to misbehave and i and this seems to me does exactly the opposite i don't know why anybody um you know unless out of honor um would ever buy a bus pass again because it'd be cheaper to wait till you got caught and then go buy one when you needed one under the assumption that you're not likely to be get get caught 12 months in a year um so i think you need to be really i understand the instinct behind it but i actually i think there's some really serious unintended consequences to this that we need to think through. And I, whether 250 or 150, I, you know, I think we need to set it at a, we need to set it at a rate that people are, it doesn't pay to take the risk um, for those people who can't afford to pay. I, I think number two deals with the real question here is what we do with people who, for whom it is a real hardship, for whom it is a real challenge. And I quite frankly don't think for them 150 is just as unattainable as 250 is. So, I, I, you know, I think we need to be careful with number one that we don't accidentally undermine our ability to to have the honor system work for us, um, which means there have to be consequences for not for not uh, for not paying. And right now, quite frankly, there'd be no consequences for anybody who was buying a regular bug path elsewhere. It'd be way cheaper just not to buy one and buy one in that those few months you got caught. So. That's my question. I think there's unintended consequences to this, the way it's worded, and I understand the instincts behind it, but I, I think it's fraught with problems. So, I, you know, it, it's going up to council. I can make that point there, but I thought I'd flag it here. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good point. Um, I guess the way I was thinking about it is that um, in the end, what are we trying to do? Or, uh, you know, if we want to penalize people, okay, people who can afford it, they can afford 150 or 250. People who can't, um, you know, that 150 can basically disappear uh, because of number two, uh, if that is uh, what is determined to be best for that individual. But um, the other thing I was thinking is that, you know, people who are going to try to avoid a fare, you know, we have no proof that $250 is more effective as a that uh, as a tool than $150 and that other cities seem to manage at 150 and Saskatoon manages with nothing. I, Whether the I 150 know. or 250 is right, I don't know. And I would suggest we should go back and have a look at some of the history on that because my I have a vague memory that we changed it because 150 was not proving a big enough deterrent. But I, that's a very vague memory. I think there was a report a number of years ago that we were trying to deal with this question of fair evasion, and that's probably when, when we changed it. Whether or not we've ever gone back to check and make sure if it worked, I think is a very valid question. Yeah. So, and Anyway, uh, that's it for me. Thank you. In the absence of that data, we just don't know. Um, all we have is uh, what we see across other jurisdictions based on our scan. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Mayor Ives. Thank you. Um, I think I, I take uh, Councillor Henderson's caution seriously. Um, I like the idea of routing people to transit, the intent behind that, and maybe on like a first offense basis or something, there's a, a, uh, you know, a sort of restorative justice kind of thing, like make the system whole by buying a pass and come back in. But we, we can't allow that to be an open-ended mitigation because of the thing Councillor Henderson suggested. So um, so I might propose a, um, a, an amendment um, either to split out that last clause of part one and put it into part two 
um, to allow administration to consider some options in that regard uh, in the context of the work in part two. Um, or I think, you know, fine repayment options that I think it could include that. So the other way to do it might be, if it's friendly, to strike it from the first motion so it's not part of the, the bylaw. And that would give legal and and transit and finance a chance to think about what like a restorative justice model, including on ramps to transit could look like. So um, um, perhaps, perhaps yeah, we I'm could write it from idea. part one and add it to part two. Yep. No, I think that's a great idea. Um, it, it retains the spirit of it, which yeah. really is the intent here. And um, again, we just don't know if 250 is more effective than 150. Well, and, and perhaps in speaking to it then, as presuming that change, uh, I'm supportive of both of these. I, like Councillor Henderson, vaguely recall looking at this a decade ago in response to uh, a real consistent issues we were finding with, with fair evasion at the time. Um, now, one of the things that we're hoping we're going to get with Smart Card is higher levels of compliance with ease of payment, with open payments for people and so on and so forth. So, hope, And that was even argued at the time 10 years ago. When we have open fares, all this will get easier. Um, and, and we'd be able to consider the questions of turn styling the system as well, whether we need that for LRT, which I, I would hope that we don't. But, but um I think this is fast changing, but I think I'm persuaded that perhaps we were leaning a little too hard onto law and order when we juiced it up to 250. But I think for people with um, limited means, uh, especially if we're out of step with comparators, uh, I think for lim people with limited means, whether it's 150 or 250, may be too much. Uh, um, and so part two is really, uh, as a number of people suggested, the most uh, impactful part of this, which is to uh, uh, determine those options. Because I, I am aware of, and, and actually it was the late uh, Minister Manmeet Bular who brought to my attention that there were youth entering uh, um, the, the correction system as a result of, um, uh, as a result of transit infractions. And that in fact, um, one youth was was in detention and died and the reason that they had the reason they died is not because of of this it was the circumstances within detention but but that they would not have been in the system in the first place uh but for um uh, zealous enforcement of of this bylaw and that's not to say the the overcorrection to that would be to say well let's just not in force. And I don't think that's acceptable either to fair paying uh, Edmontonians who, who uh, are prepared to contribute and understand it costs something to provide transit service and see value in it and are prepared to, to pay a fare uh, and, and do, their, do their fair share uh, in reflective of the value that they receive from the service. And, and since then, the other thing that's different though, is we put substantial uh, alternative programs in place for ride transit and for path, uh, as well as a uh, free transit for youth accompanied by uh, a fair paying adult uh, 12 and under. And so I think we've, we've created an awful lot of circumstances to support people who need that mobility, who don't have the means to sustain it. Um, and, uh, so when, in spite of all of those things, we're still in a situation of, of defiance, um, we, we need to be able to have some consequence for that. Um, and we still need to have some consequence for, um, for, for people who can't afford it, who would, who would roll the dice. Um, so, so I think this strikes the right balance on all of that. I'll be supporting it. All right. Thank you. Um, anyone else? No? Okay, I'll just qu close really quickly. Great suggestions. Um, uh, I don't know if uh, it, it's already made those changes. It looks like they're in there. I'm not sure, but uh, I'm open to those changes. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, I assume, what we'll be voting on. And uh, yeah, at the end of the day, really, the idea is just to encourage more uh, folks to use transit without uh, the sort of, you know, people who can't pay 
sort of having them add up all of these fines that they never can pay that impact the rest of their life over $3.50. So, um, you know, in talking about equity and talking about the service, I think that, uh, um, well, I hope that this gets support. Now, the other thing that uh, I would just mention in closing is that um, uh, I, I do believe that a lot of people were getting caught uh, with fair evasion because we had the downtown free zone and they got often confused or not confused, but as the case may be. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I think we've uh, talked this one out. Hope you get, I get your support. Please vote. Yes. Councilor Paquette? Uh, it's submitting. I'm, I'm a yes. I support it. And Mayor Iveson? Yeah, mine is submitting slowly as well. I'm also a yes. Thank you. That's all the votes. Okay. And uh, one last one, stretching your patience, but uh, let's, I hope it's quick. That Community and Public Services Committee recommend to City Council, one, that administration prepare amendments to the conduct of transit passengers bylaw provisions regarding loitering, including recommendations for exemptions for helping agencies and organizations, their corresponding social workers, and anyone accessing these services in transit stations as part of a whole systems approach to community safety and transit, and two, that administration work with community partners, including but not limited to Boyle Street, Breach, Edmonton Mennonite Center for Newcomers, Bissell Center, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Mosaic Center, iHuman Native Counseling Services of Alberta, and yes, to increase referrals to 24-7 crisis diversion and return to committee with program and or delivery proposals for agencies to provide access to supports and services within transit stations. And quickly, this one is, uh, you know, an extension of the of the efforts that we are already making somewhat unofficially and uh, bringing some policy and practice to it. Um, one example uh, of how this can uh, be utilized in the real world is in 2011, the Edmonton Public Library partnered with a community agency to offer outreach services in response to folks taking refuge at the downtown branch. And uh, we've all seen the massive success of that program. So transit centers like libraries are places that folks generally feel safe in when they have nowhere else to go. So can we look into adopting a similar approach to our transit loitering bylaw? Can we partner with the social agency and have them offer outreach services in downtown transit centers and uh, you know directing them from there to wherever they need to go and in, in, in conjunction with other helping agencies. So offering folks some nourishment and support is a much better response, uh, most likely, than kicking them out and finding them for not having anywhere to go. So, any questions? Not seeing any. Um, and we can consider that my close as well. Uh, please vote. Mr. Chair, can we just confirm the due date on this one as well? Oh, yeah, that's right. I wanted to ask uh, when is a, an, an acceptable and workable due date for administration? Um, I'm thinking first quarter of 2022, Councillor. First quarter of 2022. Okay. Well, uh, this will be something for a new council to definitely get sink their teeth into. All right. Sounds good. Please vote. Yes. We have all the votes. All right, display a vote, please. And that carried unanimously, thank you. Um, and I think that takes us to the end of this item. Believe it or not, we did it. And uh, we'll now move on to item 6.8. Now we have five speakers. And um, my estimate was that this might take an hour. We'll see if, it, if uh, that was correct. So um, let's move to item 6.8. I believe that administration has a presentation. 
We do. And good afternoon, committee. Thank you for your time today. We have a short presentation for you outlining the analysis we've done. Uh, with me today is Kim Petrin, uh, the Branch Manager of Development Services. I'm Stephanie McCabe, uh, the DCM. Uh, YC Ramirez is also online, the General Supervisor of our Licensing, Inspections and Compliance, and Kevin Tom Tomalty, our Coordinator of our Peace Officer Section and Community Standards. So before you today is the Vehicle for Hire Annual Report, and it provides highlights from the projects undertaken to promote safe and accessible transit for hire services in the city in 2020. The city plan directs that our mobility system should be safe, secure, accessible, and responsive. And the Vehicle for Hire program works collaboratively, collaboratively with industry, and we really appreciate the input from industry on this one and other stakeholder groups to uh, support uh, that direction. I'm now going to pass it to Ms. Petrin, who will provide you the uh, remainder of the presentation. Good afternoon. A number of activities were undertaken throughout 2020 to advance the Vehicle for Hire programs initiatives and to support the industry through the COVID-19 pandemic. The latter included postponement of the license renewal date from April uh, to September, non-cancellation of licenses that were not renewed, and a 50% wa waiver of dispatch and vehicle license fees and 100% waiver for limousines. The program's accessibility initiatives included provision of updated training materials for accessible vehicle drivers with the goal of enhancing the level of service for accessible vehicle users. Due to the impact of COVID-19 on resources, completion of research and consultation regarding the viability of a centralized booking service for all accessible vehicles for hire was shifted to the end of this year. Communication with industry continued in 2020 through email updates and virtual meetings to discuss issues of mutual concern and how we can best support. Industry highlighted various challenges to their operations, including the adverse economic impacts of COVID-19. In response, administration is recommending a 50% fee waiver of 2021 vehicle and dispatch license fees, and a bylaw review will be done to identify areas for potential amendment. Enforcement activities in 2020 were focused on promoting adherence to public health guidelines relating to COVID-19. These included the city's state of local emergency order, the temporary mandatory face covering bylaw, and the provincial public health orders where verbal warnings or fines for drivers not in compliance were issued. The vehicle for hire program operates on a cost of service model, although program performance in 2020 was higher than anticipated. Revenue exceeded expenses and over $113,000 was transferred to the Vehicle for Hire Reserve. Plans are in place to apply reserve funds towards the recommended 2021 fee waivers. Program focus areas such as accessibility projects, safety and enforcement activities are also contemplated. The Vehicle for Hire program, work program for 2021 will focus on collaboration with stakeholders and industry, including the Accessibility Advisory Committee and the Women Advocacy Voice of Edmonton to advance initiatives of value to the stakeholders and administration. These initiatives include accessibility service strategies, safety measures in vehicle for hire, and a review of the bylaw to recommend potential amendments. Further, a review of enforcement strategies in line with the priorities of the 2021 work plan is underway. Administration is pleased to be able to work with such a dynamic group of individuals and stakeholders in a collaborative effort to identify and resolve issues affecting the industry. Administration recommends that Community and Public Services Committee recommend to City Council that the 2021 fees within the Vehicle for Hiler Bylaw 17400 for dispatch and vehicle licenses be waived by 50%. Thank you and pleased to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much. Uh, very good presentation. We'll move to speakers now. Uh, and first up is on our panel is uh, Liviu Burtick. If you manage to stick around for the day, now is your chance. Put the hand up. Oh. Just, uh, yeah, one, one second. All right, you've got oh, five oh, minutes. Yeah. Go ahead. Hello? Hello, we can hear you. Go ahead. You got five minutes. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, 
to the city for the 100% wave last year and well, a part of this year. And uh, for the fees, I'm sorry, waive the fees. And um, I would like to let you guys know that we cannot afford yet to pay not even the 50 percentage off because like last night after the news we had from uh, our premier, we had two more cancellations of weddings, August and September. Tradition season is coming up in a month. Uh, we don't have nothing bookings yet. Our are sitting for one, for 13 months now. Uh, with another words, the chicken doesn't make the eggs. We have no eggs. So I'm asking for another wave, very kindly. And uh, also would like you to know that some company, we don't have sedans, only stretch limousines and buses, the 30 passengers buses. People up to five people, they are not going to rent a bus, the 30 passengers for a dinner run, or there are no hockey games, of course. No so concerts. no concerts. We are just sitting, collecting dust on our limousines. Uh, it will be very nice to work again this year. Uh, let's hope next year is going to be a better year. We are in business for 26 years. We never missed every year we paid. Actually, we were the first ones paying our fees to the city. But this time, like I said, the chicken doesn't make the eggs. We have no eggs for breakfast. Uh, another one I have. We talked last meeting with uh, Vehicle for Hire. They want to introduce an instructor to teach us how to drive or how to run our business. I, I really, we don't know exactly what they are trying to do. Probably an fee cost to of co yeah, cost to us which is not fair. I'm in Edmonton for 45 years and for 40 years, every year, I had the license with the city. So it's anybody going to come to teach me after 26 years in limousine business to teach me how I got class for a class two, one, that covers everything. So who is going to teach me how to drive or how to act? We never been in, in bankruptcy. We, we, we are having a very, very good reviews in our website. We never had a complaint. So what's going on? Is just for the money to come again? Can anybody answer me the question? That would be. I would be very satisfied. We are paying the vehicle for hire for them to have a job, but not to clean us up. I mean, let's slow down with fees, too many by laws. Like last month, we talked, I talked to them, I said, so you are hiring somebody to teach me now how to do it? Class one, class two. How more do you want from me? I've been in business for 26 years. Who, who is going to come at 20 years old to tell me how to run my business or how to drive? Really? So, can anybody answer me those questions? Or Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Mr. Bertick, and uh, now move on to our next speaker, uh, Suzanne Bertick. Yeah. Hello. Thank, thank you. And wow, it's been over for you, so I'll try not to be too uh, animated. I also feel the same way as my husband. Um, there are companies that uh, have been trying for years to separate the stretch limousines from the black cars, the sedans, Ubers, taxis, because of this problem. Um, where could get a fare with a smaller car? Limousines are, they cost more, it costs more to operate, so we charge more. and. We have not been running, sir. We have not been running. There are no concerts. There are no. Uh, there are no uh, concerts. There's no, no sporting events. Uh, grads are done. Uh, and been closed down, so the weddings are canceled with the stretches. As we usually do grads and weddings. Airport. Well, there's nobody traveling. There is business, sir. So last year you were kind enough to waive 100% for the stretch limousines, and I'm not asking to be special, but we are special because we don't run like the rest of the vehicle for higher um, units. So 100% waiver is what I'm asking for. Um, as for the driver training, well, when you do, the city requires you to have a class four, which is a bus and a uh, specific for public uh, driving. So if they want to train us, then can we hire any class five and we no longer have to do the medical and, and do what requires for a class four? Because you can't have it both ways. You take written test, a driving test to get your class four to chauffeur. And now they want to teach us how to drive as well. We barely can get people to work on the weekends yeah, and evenings right. because that's what we, we hire as weekend, part-time and evening. We're not running seven days a week. It's a, it's a limousine. You don't need a limousine every day of your life. It's for special occasions. So, yeah, I, I don't agree with that. And they keep saying, oh, no, it's just for uh, uh, for the uh, accessible driving that they're going to have the training. But that's not what I'm reading in the notes. So somewhere there's a message. Um, companies like Prestige, that they have their own driver training for, for accessible. Um, you know what, if they have it, why why shouldn't they continue to have it and do it their way? I mean, we're taking care of our businesses. It's a business. Let's have some common sense. We have too much, too many chiefs. And, oh, I can't say that. Uh, we have, I I don't know. We just have too many up above and not enough down below. That's, that's all I can say. Trip sheets, my last point. Okay, so you guys are taking data. We are threatened if we don't turn in trip sheets, we'll be fined. The license, all sorts of things. So the sheets are to tell you that downtown picks up most of the, of course, people are coming, business people from the airport back and forth. To me, it's a waste of my time. I have better places to put my time, like trying to figure out how am I going to survive? Do you guys want the limousine services to just shut exactly. down? We're, we're, we're overloaded. We have too much. And then we have to put where we're picking up and drop off point to point. Like, what else? Why don't you guys give me a job and I'll gladly do that for you? I'll go to the companies. I'll collect the data. Give me 15 bucks an hour. I'll come and do it because I'm not working right now anyway. But come on, let's use some common sense people. Please, please. That's, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. And that's it. I'm done. Okay. Thank you. Uh... We now have John Waterman. Okay. Five minutes, go ahead. And I, you may be on mute. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, go ahead. Okay, my name is John Waterman. I'm the owner of Black Gold Limousine. I agree uh, with what Susan and Livio have said about the three items they're talking about. Again, I'm here to petition that we uh, are granted 100% relief of uh, our fees this year. Um, the uncertainty of COVID has left us in the same position of, as last year. Uh, people are not booking weddings for the summer, even if it all opens up in June or July, it will be too late for the wedding season. And I'm not confident it will open up at that point. 
And so our bookings for weddings are pretty much non-existent. Um, so I hope you can grant us the relief like you did last year, and I thank you for that relief last year. Um, with regards to the quarterly reports that we have to submit, uh, listing our customers, where we picked them up, where we took them to. Again, you know, as I was listening to the fireworks um, discussion, I would say the same thing. Like, is there a point to this? And are we creating work for nothing? Are we creating a problem that doesn't exist? Um, you've determined that most of the rides go to downtown. Um, and my point is, what? how does that help the city that you've determined that? Like, it's a lot of work for us, a lot of work for you guys, and it doesn't seem to have a point. And I would pose a question to anybody who can answer it. What is the point other than monitor traffic, which you can do by putting a, a line down on the road and count the cars that go by? But for us to do this, like you don't require this of other businesses. Um, you're not asking people who go into a store for them to give you a report on where the customer came from, what he bought at the store, you know, how far he traveled. That doesn't, why are you doing that for, to us? It, again, I would like to hear a logical explanation of why we're doing this quarterly report. And, you know, the threat of fines and the same is just seems to be uh, tiring, I guess. And again, with the, the same, same things they mentioned, the safety, I don't know why we need it trainer where we, we you know we take courses we pass you know inspections twice a year we have to pass you know our class four class one which is all about safety so again i'm not sure what the safety issue is and again are you creating a problem that doesn't exist i haven't heard of you know safety issues within the limo industry and uh i'm just looking here what else um, yeah, I think that's it. That's all I wanted to talk about today, and I hope you can address those issues. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, Phil Strong from the Greater Edmonton Taxi Service. Good morning. Well, it's late afternoon now. Um, I... <laughs> Good morning. This is going to be a long day. Uh, I enjoyed listening to some of it though as I was doing other things I must admit Um, I represent Greater Edmonton Taxi Service and Prestige Limousine so I have a a two handed commitment here Uh, I have to agree with my limousine friends that the limousine business is parked i mean parked there's no point giving us any fees or anything because it is dead we get the few inquiries and they cancel etc etc it is just not viable and any charges to for limousine plates is just a money a hundred percent money drain on us and and you know, I don't think we should have that. Um, moving on to the taxi environment, the taxi environment's a, a, a little stronger, and I, uh, I think uh, the administration's right in charging fifty percent on the on the licenses as they did last year, and on the dispatch fees as they did last year within the taxi industry. We do have taxis out there; they are making some money. Uh, we're, I'm not saying we're uh, dancing around the table yet, but, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be one of the first to, to, uh, to grow as we come out of this pandemic. Um, but it'll take the limousine business a while. And my se- second item here is, um, the accessible transportation. And I see sort of worked into this all these reports and you know uh, I'm going to tell you I started driving taxi in 1974 while I was going to university then I came out west in 78 and I've been in the taxi industry with the exception of a year and a half since then 
when I managed Greyhound Bus downtown. There is no one in the industry today in Edmonton that's got my longevity, which has its downsides too, obviously. Um, but, you know, I need people to listen to me and I don't feel I'm being listened to. And the accessibility transportation cannot, no use wasting time doing all kinds of things, trying to get a centralized dispatch, everything like that, until we answer the problem of driver compensation. Yes, every in a utopian society, everyone should pay the same. I don't mind people paying the same, but someone has to pay the driver the extra free, whether it's subsidy um, or however we design it, but it won't work. I'll give you two quick examples. An individual driving a van, doesn't matter what kind, and a similar van of the same kind with a wheelchair in it, if all they did was non-accessible trips and just taxi trips, the guy with the wheelchair van would pay an extra $20 a day in fuel. Why? He didn't have to run more miles. He probably did the same kilometers as his buddy in a van because the van is heavier. It just eats up more fuel. So that's a disadvantage to own a wheelchair accessible van without even doing a wheelchair accessible trip. Secondly, I should point out that a restaurant, when they fix a curb in front of the restaurant to be accessible, i.e. take the bump out of it and make it wheelchair accessible, get a larger door in the front door, Put a little extra room between the tables to allow wheelchair patrons to come in. They have a one-time capital cost. They're done. Every plate of spaghetti that they or steak that they put in front of the customer does not cost more than a, a regular able body customer. It just doesn't. Every time a taxi picks up an accessible wheelchair accessible trip, it costs them more every time. It's not a one-time capital cost. Within five years, that, that vehicle is wrecked. Within five years, you know, the curb is still all right outside the restaurant and the door still works. But this is the reality. I think I got the feeling lately that some people are starting to understand this. There's yeah. guys that are parking cars that do not want anything to do with a wheelchair accessible vehicle anymore. And that just isn't right for the people that need the service. All right. Thank and you. So we have to improve that. My last item is leveling the vehicle for hire industry. This will be I'm, I'm afraid you're out of time, but there will probably be questions for you. All right. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we'll hear from our last panelist, Elaine Lazina. Councillor, thank you for having me today. I'm Sylvain Vizina from Protocol Limousine. I'm here today to address, once again, issue with the Department of Vehicle for Hire. As you might remember, myself and other members of the industry were involved back in September about the fee waiver for 2020. Today, I want to bring to your attention that this report is far from accurate on what is going on with the industry, especially the relationship between the industry and vehicle for hire. On page number two of vehicle for hire report, it is mentioned that fee were deferred until September. That is, this is inaccurate and fee were due by August 14, 2020, and the industry was well reminded about this by the department. The fee waiver was approved on October 5, 2020, at the city council meeting. The excess amount paid were never refunded despite numerous requests. This means business who did do the right thing and paid their fee on time were penalized for not being good uh, for being good corporate citizen. Unfortunately. This seems to be a pattern with vehicle for hire. The department wasn't looking at the best interest for vehicle for hire 
at the time, and this didn't change, even after the positive intervention of uh, Ms. Stephanie McCabe, Deputy City Manager. It was well appreciated. Unfortunately, it seems that the relationship with the department is proven difficult. Registered business are being taken uh, advantage of, and when we are trying to uphold vehicle for hire to the bylaws 17400, uh, things fall apart. We are being told that they are loophole in the bylaws, that it is very complicated when not impossible to enforce bylaws. Even question on budget and cost of the program are deferred to another department. Basically, we haven't found yet something that can be accomplished within the vehicle for hire department. The question of why we are paying this fee is legitimate. Vehicle for hire mandate is to regulate the industry and provide a safety layer to Edmontonian. Clearly, there is massive problem if you can't enforce your own bylaws and worse, if you don't know them. We have been trying to work with the department for six years and the problem discussed them then are still the same today. Illegal transportation business running without proper licensing, company operating with rental vehicle, even inside city owned building, shuttle operating as private shuttle, which goes against the definition of a shuttle on the city of Edmonton website, hotel providing their own unlicensed chauffeured vehicles to client, senior transportation that doesn't require vehicle for hire licensing, Vehicle for hire mandate is to ensure uh, the safety of Edmontonian through licensing. The vehicle and chauffeur license come with verification on mechanical of the vehicle, the ability on the road of the chauffeur, and a criminal check. All the previous examples fail at providing the safety brought by licensing. The vehicle for hire in action on all of the above create a burden on license business and fail to ensure everyone is operating under the same rule. At a time where every business was looking at their revenue falling off a cliff, we looked at every line item and what the expense brought to the business. We did inquire about the structure of vehicle fire, and we found a multi-layered management structure. There is a total of six levels of management above a program manager of the department. It does look very top heavy. However, Everything we ask uh, for was always someone else's responsibility and out of reach. Even today, we're still trying to get a few things addressed and they're being pushed way further into the future. A, a good example of this is the budget of vehicle for hire that isn't easily accessible. It's rolled into something else and it's something that we're having a hard time to find exactly what it is. Um, even the, uh, a good example of that would be the uh, report that we're seeing today. Vehicle for hire does have a reserve, but we have no clue what that amount is. It is something that uh, we're hoping that we'll be able to get our hands on at one point. Last year, vehicle for hire was probably one of the only one in the industry to not bleed red ink. Vehicle for hire ran a surplus of over $113,000. Waiving 50% of license fee would equal to about $42,000, according to the same report. This means the surplus of last, of last year would be enough to cover the entire license fee for everyone this year at a time everyone wonder when, if we will return to something more normal. Unfortunately, Vehicle for Hire is looking at adding money in the bank for future pet project at a time where the industry is suffering badly and could really use a break. The money was paid by the industry and should be used to help the industry during this unprecedented time. Should be told, I wonder about that $42,000 figure. There is over a thousand licensed vehicle at uh, over $400 each, which would bring over $400,000. So I don't know where that uh, $42,000 on the report came from. Sylvain, so thank you. Uh, unfortunately, you're out of time. Uh, appreciate it. You may have some questions. Looks like uh, we do have Councillor Nickel on the board. Okay, thank you everyone for coming today. So let's get let's just get straight to the mechanics here. So everyone here today um, is advocating for 100% of the limousine uh, uh, fees to be waived, correct? Phil? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, so we're all okay. That's the first thing. I'm. I'll be happy to move that. That's not a that's not a problem. Uh, so. And whether the committee supports it or not is a different question. 
So uh, quarterly reporting, um, the necessity of it. Uh, I, okay, so we're hearing that's needed red tape. Um, do any of you see any value in what's going on and how much time are you committing to this? Phil, do you have a comment on the quarterly reporting? I, I, I don't think it's necessary. It's obvious where the traffic is. I mean, that's what downtowns are about. Okay, Sylvain? This is something that was brought by a vehicle for hire department that we had um, someone coming to explain us that that was part of trying to plan the future bus schedule and where the bus would be going, which we always said, you know, people that <laughs> get limousine will not ride a bus. Okay. What about you, John and Olivia? Yeah, there's, I, I there's was also... A, there's only a handful of limousines in the city, and I don't know how our traffic pattern really affects the flow of the city. Like, it seems like we're, we're asking to do a lot of paperwork. For John, something John, that how, John, how many limousines we got running in the city? Uh, that's a good question. I'm, I don't even have an answer to that. Does anybody else know? Anyone? No, I couldn't tell you offhand. Olivia? If you don't right know that. now, I, I have Okay. I, would I believe the appropriate presenter would be the department. Yes. Okay, I'll ask the department. Okay, so there's a question, do we even need this anymore? Okay, and last but not least is a question of um, the training. Uh, somebody, whoever have you have, have you have your mics on, can you turn them off because we get a terrible echo here at my end. Sorry, I appreciate that. Um, is that just being a suggestion right now? That's the way I'm reading the report. Am I misreading the report? They're not asking for... Uh, an amendment right now as to changing our, or am I missing that? In terms of driver training. Nobody? I'll ask it. Is that a question for the limo industry, like for us? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. the training is unnecessary as well. Like, we're not sure what the purpose is. Like, you know, I'm good with any bylaws that have a purpose, but if it's a bylaw just to create, you know, more bureaucracy for us you know i'd like explanations why we need this and again you know back to another issue there was uh the um dispatch fee that we talked about last time and again you know the other cities aren't charging that so we would we're all looking to have that uh ended as well okay you know i'll address that quickly the training i mean that gives us a competitive edge on other people that's not something that has to be regulated by the vehicle for hire. We just want to excel above other companies. I mean, I'll, I'll throw out a, a, a red herring here. Is anyone training Uber drivers? I'm done. Okay. Always to the point. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, excuse me. Uh, Susan from Champaign. I just wanted to say, Mr. Nichols, that uh, this came about and apparently it's in the bylaw with the trip sheets and it's always held over our heads and with. Looks like we may have uh, lost our speaker. Uh, so we'll move on. Now to questions of administration, and I'm going to guess that Councilor Nickel has some questions. Okay, um, I think all of you remember last year, my memory, what it used to be. I was looking for a 100% waiver for everybody. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to really change my point of view on that. So Ms. McCabe, uh, I would just, what would be the consequence of extending that uh, limousine waiver uh, like we did last year? Uh, Councillor Neckler, we brought 50% forward because it aligns with the business license fee uh, waiver, but the consequence would be that there would still be adequate money within the reserve. It would still remain above the 30% minimum balance. So it's a, uh, we would, of course, welcome any direction from committee, but our, our best advice would be that there is adequate money to cover that. Uh, okay, Mr. Chairman, when, when that's ready, I'll bring that forward whenever, whenever you want. Uh, number two, um, quarterly inspections. 
is it really necessary anymore, given that the, uh, the, the you know, how many limousines do we have running? It's not the size of the taxi cab industry. Is this, uh, we're hearing from industry that it's an onerous uh, piece of paperwork that is not required. Uh, Ms. McCabe, do you have a comment on that? Understood, and uh, Ms. Petrin could uh, answer that question. Thanks, Councillor Nichol. Um, that was a requirement came, that came into place in 2017 to two reasons, better understand how people in Edmonton travel around the city. And the second purpose was to verify the per trip fees um, submitted by the transportation network uh, companies. Really appreciate the feedback and recognize that feels a bit like a red tape that we're happy to take that back and look at how, um, you know, whether it's an amendment or that sort of thing that we can work with industry on. Well, Ms. Petrin, I, I'm, I'm saying I want to cut this red tape. So do you need direction to do so? Councillor Nickel, go ahead, Ms. Petrin. Uh, through, through a motion, um, you can provide that would the, through committee to provide that direction. Okay, I'll, be, uh, I'll do that as well. And this question with regards to training. Um, I, the way I read the report, this is not really on the table did i misread the report or is this is this something that you look at that is mandatory at present maybe i'm just a little tired here at the end of the day what what, what is it yeah councillor nickel it, it wasn't intended to be mandatory it was related to supporting our our clients that need accessible support in terms of using the different vehicles um, so it was just an option that we were talking to She's industry so about in terms of providing the education but at no cost Okay, so it is not mandatory. Correct. Okay, so I'm letting industry, you're hearing that loud and clear. Uh, so, okay, okay, <laughs> no problem. I'm ready to make those two amendments when uh, when needed, uh, Councillor Paquette. Okay, um, this would be an ideal time. Uh, if I could, you know, the clerk's so much faster on the keyboard than, than my fingers. It's, do they have something uh, written up to that effect? Or can we get uh, get that in a minute here? Uh, I believe we have something yeah. ready. I'm just looking for some confirmation. You were looking to do 100% fee waiver? For the limousines, 50% okay. for the taxis. That's what we did last year. So that doesn't change, right? So we're just moving that forward. And the second part is is the removal for the quarterly reporting by uh, uh, by for the limousines only. I don't want to venture too far into the weeds here because uh, it is a bit of a network. We'll have that up momentarily. Please and thank you. Okay. So uh, in the meantime, uh, if you've got some personal head earbuds, go ahead and listen to some waiting music. Oh, Andrew's up. There we go. Okay, Councillor Nack, go ahead. Sure. I, I was just going to ask a few questions while we were waiting. Um, and definitely makes perfect sense around the limousines and going 100% fully supported that. Um, just wanted to ask a little more about the um, the removal of the requirement for trip logs. So the idea behind the trip logs was to be able to capture that data, but that, so I guess my thinking was uh, it was more, we, we designed that to be more to capture data related to taxi movements because there were so many movements and that that would help it would feel to me that limousines are, you know, that they're not, you're not just jumping in a limousine to go, you know, get your groceries. As we've already heard today, you're not jumping in a limousine for your regular trips. So that data is probably a little less relevant to why we were capturing that. Is, is that fair? Do you feel that's a fair comment? That's a if fair I comment. Uh, that's a fair sorry, comment. I have to, I just have to ask administration at this point, but thank you. I, sorry. That's a fair comment, and I think we have the data. We've had the data since 2017, so it's informed what we've needed it to. This was something that we were looking at in our work plan anyway, so we, we support uh, this being brought forward uh, quicker than we were uh, than it was on the path. That's wonderful, then. Well, that sounds great. Well, thanks for that, that motion, Councillor Nickel. I'll support those motions. Thank you. All right, excellent. So, Councillor Nickel, do you mind reading that in? And uh, 
Yes, that the Community and Public Service Committee recommend to City Council that one, that the 2021 fees for the vehicle for hire bylaw 17400 for dispatch vehicle licenses be waived by 50%. Number two, that the 2021 fees with the vehicle for hire bylaw 17400 for dispatch and vehicle licenses for limousines be waived by 100%. And number three, the administration provide amendments to vehicle for hire bylaw 17400 to remove the requirements to provide trip logs. Mr. Okay. Chair, if I might just confirm a few details. Is the removal of the requirement for trip logs for limousines only? Yes. We'll make that change. And the standard 13-week due date? Sure. Thank you. I think... What does that mean, due date? This is, uh, we're just setting it up to council. I don't understand why there needs to be a due date. Uh, sorry, Councillor Nicole, I'm not sure if that's to me or to clerks, but uh, it's because we're going to amend the bylaw. Okay, okay. Paperwork takes time. Fine. Fine. Good. Uh, I'll just speak to it real quick when you're ready. As we have heard abundantly today, paperwork definitely takes time. <laughs> Okay, uh, I don't see anyone else on the board. I'll just uh, quickly um, offer my support for this. It's a great motion. I'm glad I thought of it. <laughs> just kidding. Um, and uh, I think uh, it makes a lot of sense right now. No one's uh, renting a limousine and going out for a party, hopefully. Fingers crossed. All right. So, uh, yeah, this definitely has my support. Uh I see Councillor Knack on the board, but I think that's a legacy uh, little bit. So that is correct. Thank you. Yeah, Councillor Nickel to close. Well, I wish you would. I wish I could convince Council of a hundred percent, but I, I think we tried that the last time and it didn't fly. So we'll take fifty percent. Uh, the the um, the program is in surplus. So given the pandemic, I and uh, I I don't see why we should hold on to their money to be quite honest. And so let the limousine service go and we can cut a little red tape because uh, yeah, I can see these logs being a bit of an issue for just for people who are just hanging on. And uh, as for, uh, I'll remind everyone that the uh, question with regards to uh, training, that is uh, not mandatory. At least that's what I heard today. So those are the three things. Uh, thank you, hope you can vote for it. Okay, please vote. I think yes. We have all the votes. Okay, let's play the vote, please. And that is carried. Who says you can't fight City Hall? All right, uh, so I think that leads us to the end. I will just ask really quickly if there are any uh, uh, motions pending. I didn't get any for that, so uh, any Chair, notices of motion without, or motions on notice. Go ahead, sorry. Apologies for the uh, continuous interruptions. I'm just noticing that we did not receive item 6.3 for information, if we might just clean that up. We did have motions that dealt with 6, 1, and 2. Okay, we did not. All right, that's a good catch. So right. moved. Yeah, Please John vote. Moved. Yeah, John moved it. All right. Please vote. Comes. We have the votes. Apologies, Councillor Zadek. Yeah, yeah, that's a yes. And Councillor Paquette. Um, it says it went through. If it didn't, time a yes. Thank you. That's all the votes. All right. Display the vote, please. And that is carried. Okay. Any notice of motion or motion without customary notice? Not hearing any. Good job, everyone. Have a good day.